the wolves. Each furry lump looked innocent enough. All together, Joanna froze for an instant, watching them tear out the throat of a trooper's member. Joanna was the only sane person left, and all it would mean is she would know she was dying. Kill the nest. On the gun cart beside her, only one of Scrupula was left, Old Whitehead. Daffy as ever, it had pulled down its gunner, gunner's muffs and was nosing around under the gun tube. Kill the nest. Maybe not so Daffy after all. Joanna jumped on the wagon. It rolled backward toward the drop-off, banging against a tree. She scarcely noticed. She pulled up the gun barrel, just as she had seen in all the drills. The white-headed one pulled at the powder bag, but with just his one pair of jaws, he couldn't handle it. Without the rest of its pack, it had neither hands nor brains. It looked up at her, its eyes wide and desperate. She grabbed the other end of the bag, and the two of them got the powder into the barrel. Whitehead dived back into the equipment, nosing around for a cannonball. Smarter than a dog, and trained. Between them, maybe they had a chance. Just a half meter beneath her feet, the wolves were running by. One or two she could have fought off herself, but there were dozens down there, worrying and tearing, tearing at random members. Three of Pilgrim were standing around Scarbutt and the pups, but their defense was unthinking slashing. The pack had dropped its mouth knives and tines. She and Whitehead got the round down the barrel. Whitehead whipped back to the rear, playing, began playing with the little wick lighter the gunners used. It was something that could be held in a single mouth, since only one member actually fired the weapon. Wait, you idiot, Joanna kicked him back. We gotta aim this thing. Whitehead looked hurt for an instant. The complaint wasn't completely clear to him. He had dropped the standoff wand, but still held the lighter. He flicked on the flame and circled determinedly back, tried to worm past Joanna's legs. She pushed, him, she pushed him back again and looked uphill. The dark thing. That must be the nest. She tilted the gun tube on its mounting and sighted down the top. Her face ended up just centimeters from the persistent whitehead and his flame. His muffled head darted forward, and the flame touched the fire hole. The blast almost knocked Joanna off the cart. For a moment, she could think of nothing but the pain that stabbed into her ears. She rolled to a sitting position, coughing in the smoke. She couldn't hear anything beyond a high-pitched ringing that went on and on. Their little wagon was teetering, one wheel hanging over the drop-off. Whitehead was flopping around under the butt of the cannon. She pushed it off him and patted the muffed head. He was bleeding, or she was. She just sat dazed for a few seconds, mystified by the blood, trying to imagine how she had ever ended up here. A voice somewhere in the back of her head was screaming, No time, no time. She forced herself to her knees and looked around, memories coming back painfully slow. There were splintered trees uphill of them, the blonde wood glinted among the leaves. Beyond them, where the nest had been, she saw a flash of fresh, splash of fresh turned earth. They had killed it, but the fighting continued. There were still wolves on the path, but now they were, one, they were the ones running in all directions. As she watched, dozens of them catapulted off the edge of trail into the trees and rocks below, and the tines were actually fighting now. Pilgrim had picked up his knives. The blades and his muzzles dripped red as he slashed. Something gray and bleeding flew over the edge of the cart and landed by Joanna's leg. The wolf couldn't have been more than twenty centimeters long, its hair dirty gray-brown. It really did look like a pet, but the tiny jaws clicked with murderous intent at her ankles. Joanna dropped the cannonball on it. During the next three days, while Woodcarver's people struggled to bring their equipment and themselves back together, Joanna learned quite a bit about the wolves. What she and Scrupilo's whitehead did with the cannon had stopped the attack cold. Without doubt, knocking out the nest had saved a lot of lives and the expedition itself. The wolves were a type of hive creature, only a little like the packs. The Tynes race used group thought to reach high intelligence. Joanna had never seen a rational pack of more than six members. The wolf nests didn't care about high intelligence. Woodcarver claimed that a nest might have thousands of members. Certainly the one they'd tripped over was huge. Such a mob couldn't be as smart as a human. In terms of raw reasoning power, it probably wasn't much brighter than a single pack member. On the other hand, it could be a lot more flexible. Wolves could operate alone at great distances, when within a hundred meters of home, nest, they were appendages of the queen members of the nest, and no one doubted their canniness then. Pilgrim had legends of nests with almost packish intelligence, of foresters who made treaties with nearby nests for protection and return for food. As long as the high-powered noises in the nest lived, the worker wolves would, would coordinate almost like Tyne members, but killed the nest and the creature fell apart like some cheap star topology network. Certainly this nest had done a number on Woodcarver's army. It had waited quietly until the troopers were within its inner loudness. 
then outlying wolves had used synchronized mimicry to create sonic ghosts, tricking the packs into turning from the nest and shooting uselessly into the trees. And when the ambush actually began, the nest had screamed concentrated confusion down on the tines. That attack had been a far more powerful thing than the stink noise they'd encountered in other parts of the forest. To the tines, the stinkers had been painfully loud and sometimes even frightening, but not the mind-destroying chaos of the wolf nest attack. More than 100 packs had been knocked out in the ambush. Some, mostly packs with pups, had huddled. Others, like Scrupilo, had been blasted apart. In the hours following the attack, many of these fragments straggled back and reassembled. The resulting tines were shaken but unharmed. Intact troops hunted up and down the forested cliffs, cliffs for injured members of their comrades. There were places along the drop-off that were more than 20 meters deep. Where their fall wasn't cushioned by tree bows, members landed on naked rock. Five dead ones were eventually found, and another 20 seriously injured. Two carts had fallen. They were kindling, and their care hogs were too badly injured to survive. By great good luck, the gunshot had not started a forest fire. Three times the sun made its vast, tilted course around the sky. Woodcarver's army recovered in a camp in the depths of the valley forest by the river. Vendacious had posted lookouts with signaling mirrors on the northern valley wall. This place was about as safe as any they knew they could find so far north. It was certainly one of the most beautiful. It didn't have the view of the high forest, but there was the sound of the river nearby, so loud it drowned the sighing of the dry wind. The lowland trees didn't have root flowers, but they were still different from what Joanna had known. There was no underbrush, just a soft bluish moss that Pilgrim claimed was actually part of the trees. It stretched like Moan Parkland to the edge of the river. On the last day of their rest, the Queen called a meeting of all the packs not at guard or lookout. It was the largest collection of tines Joanna had seen in one place since her family was killed. Only these ones weren't fighting. As far as Joanna could see across the bluish moss, these were packs, each at least eight meters from its nearest neighbor. For an absurd instant, she was reminded of settlers' pack at Overby, families picnicking on the grass, each with its own traditional blanket and food lockers. But these families were each a pack, and this was a military formation. The rows were gently curving arcs, all facing toward the queen. Peregrine Wickraxgar was ten meters behind her, in shadow. Being queen's consort didn't count for anything official. On Woodcarver's left lay the living casualties of the ambush, members with bandages and splints. In some ways, such visible damage wasn't the most horrifying. There were also what Pilgrim called the walking wounded. These were singletons and duos and trios that were all that was left of the whole packs. Some of these tried to maintain a posture of attention, but others mooned about, occasionally breaking into the Queen's speech with aimless words. It was like Scriber Jacaramuffin all over again, but most of these would live. Some were already melding, trying to make new individuals. Some of these might even work out, as Peregrine Wickrack Scar had done. For most, it would be a long time before they were fully people again. Joanna sat with Scrupilo in the first rank of troopers before the Queen. The commander of cannoneers stood at Tynish parade rest, rumps on the ground, chest high, most heads facing front. Scrup had come through it without serious damage. His white head had more than a few scorch marks. Uh, and one of the other members had sprained a shoulder falling off the path. He wore his flying cannoneer muffs as flamboyantly as always, but there was always something subdued about him. Maybe it was just the military formation and getting a medal for heroism. The queen was wearing her special jackets. Each head looked out at a different section of her audience. Joanna still couldn't understand Tynish, and almost would certainly never speak it without mechanical assistance. But the sounds were mostly within her range of hearing. The low frequencies carried a lot better than the higher ones. Even without memory aids and grammar generators, she was learning a little. She could recognize emotional tone easily, and things like the raucous arc arc that passed uh, for applause around here. As for individual words, well, they were more like chords, single syllables that had meaning. Nowadays, if she listened really carefully, and Pilgrim weren't nearby to give a running translation, she could even recognize some of those. Just now, for instance, Woodcarver was saying good things about her audience. Approving arc arcs came from all directions. They sounded like a bunch of sea malls. One of que the queen's heads deep dipped into a bowl, came up with a small carven doodad in its mouth. She spoke a pack's name, a multicord trumpet trumptitium. Trumptitum. Uh, that if Joanna heard often enough, 
she might be able to repeat as Jacaramuffin, or even see meaning in as Wickrack Scar. From the front rank of the audience, a single member trotted toward the Queen. It stopped practically nose to nose with the Queen's nearest member. Woodcarver said something about bravery, and then the two fastened the wooden brooch to the member's jacket. It turned smartly and returned to its pack. Woodcarver picked out another decoration and called in another pack. Joanna leaned over towards Scrupillo. What's going on? She said wonderingly. Why are single members getting medals? And how can they stand to get so near another pack? Scrupiro, Scrupillo had been standing more stiffly at attention than most packs, and was pretty much ignoring her. Now he turned one head in her direction. Shh! He started to turn back, but she grabbed him by one of his jackets. Foolish one, he finally replied. The award is for the whole pack. One member is extended to accept. More would be madness. Hmm. One after another, three more packs extended a member to take their decorations. Some were full of precision, like human soldiers in stories. Others started out smartly, then became timid and confused as they approached Woodcarver. Finally, jo Johanna said, St. Scrupillo, when do we get ours? This time he didn't even look at her. All his fa heads faced rigidly toward the queen. Last, of course, you and I killed the nest and saved Woodcarver herself. His bodies were almost shaking with the intensity of their brace. He scared witless, and suddenly Joanna guessed why. Apparently, Woodcarver had no problem maintaining her mind with one outside member nearby, but the reverse would not be true. Sending one of yourself into another pack meant losing some consciousness and placing trust in that other pack. Looking at it that way, well, it reminded Joanna of the historical novels she used to play. On Neorgia, during the Dark Age, ladies traditionally gave their sword to their queen when granted audience, and then knelt. It was a way to swear loyalty. Same thing here, except that looking at Scrupillo, Joanna realized that even as a matter of form, the ceremony might be damn frightening. Three more medals bestowed, and then Woodcarver gobbled the cords that were Scrupillo's name. The commander of cannoneers went absolutely rigid, made faint whistling noises through his mouths. Joanna Olsen dot, said Woodcarver, then more tinish. Something about coming forward. Joanna stood up, but not one of Scrupillo moved. The queen made a human laugh. She was holding two polished brooches. I'll explain all in Sam Norsk later, Joanna. Just come forward with one of Scrupillo. Scrupillo? Suddenly they were the center of attention, with thousands of eyes watching. There was no more arcing or background chatter. Joanna hadn't felt so exposed since she played first colonist in her school's landing play. She leaned down so that her head was close to one of Scrupillo's. Come on, guy. We're the big heroes. The eyes that looked back at her were wide. I can't. The words were almost inaudible. For all his jaunty cannoneer muffs <clears throat> and standoffish manner, Scrupillo was terrified. <clears throat> but for him, it wasn't stage fright. I, can, it, I can't tear me apart so soon. I can't. There was murmured gobbling in the ranks behind him, them, Scrupillo's own cannoneers. By all the powers, would they hold this against him? Welcome to the Middle Ages. Stupid people. Even cut to pieces. Scrupillo had saved their behinds, and now... She put her hands on two of his shoulders. We did it before, you and I. Remember? The heads nodded. Some, that one part of me alone, could never have done it. Right, and neither could I, but together we killed the wolf nest. Scrupillo stared at her a second, eyes wavering. Yes, we really did. He came to his feet, frisked his head so the cannoneer muffs flapped. Yes, and he moved his white-headed one closer to her. Joanna straightened. She and Whitehead walked out into the open space. Four meters. Six. She kept the fingertips of one hand lightly on its neck. When they were about twelve meters from the rest of Scrupillo, Whitehead's pace faltered. He looked sideways, up at Joanna, then continued more slowly. Joanna didn't remember much of the ceremony, so much of her attention was on Whitehead. Dwood Carver said something long and unintelligible. Somehow, they both ended up with intricately carven decorations on their collars, and were headed back toward the rest of Scrupillo. Then she was aware of the crowd once more. They stretched as far as she could see under the forest canopy, and every one of them seemed to be cheering, Scrup's cannoneers loudest of all. Midnight. Here at the bottom of the valley, there were three or four hours of the day round when the sun dipped behind the high north wall. It didn't much feel like night, or even twilight. The smoke from the fires to the north seemed to be getting worse. She could smell it now. Joanna walked back from the cannoneer's section toward the center of camp and Woodcarver's tent. It was quiet. She could hear little creatures scritching in the root bushes. The celebrating might have gone on for longer 
except that everyone knew that in another few hours they would be preparing for the climb up the valley's north wall. So now there was only occasional laughter, an occasional pack walking about. Joanna walked barefoot, her shoes slung over her shoulders. Even in the dry weather, the moss was wonderfully soft between her toes. Above her, the forest canopy was shifting green and patches of hazy sky. She could almost forget what had gone before and what lay ahead. The guards around Woodcarver's tent didn't challenge her. It just called softly ahead. After all, there weren't that many humans running around. The queen stuck out ahead. Come inside, Joanna. Inside, she was sitting in her usual circle, the puppies protected in the middle. It was quite dark, the only light being what came through the entrance. Joanna flopped down on the pillows where she usually slept. Ever since this afternoon, the big award thing, she had been planning to give Woodcarver a piece of her mind. Now, well, the party at the Cannoneers had been a happy thing. It seemed kind of a shame to break the mood. Woodcarver cocked a head at her. Simultaneously, the two puppies duplicated the gesture. I saw you at the party. You are a sober one. You eat most of our foods now, but none of the beer. Joanna shrugged. Yes, why? Kids aren't supposed to drink before they're 18 years old. That was the custom, and her parents had agreed with it. Joanna had turned 14 a couple months ago. Dataset had reminded her of her, the exact hour. She wondered, if none of this had happened, if she were still back at the High Lab or Stromley Realm, would she be sneaking out with friends to try such forbidden things? Probably. Yet here, when she was entirely on her own, where she was currently a big hero, she hadn't tried a drop. Maybe it was because Mom and Dad weren't here, and following her, their wishes seemed to keep her, them closer. She felt tears coming to her eyes. Hmm. Woodcarver didn't seem to notice. That's what Pilgrim said was the reason. She tapped at her puppies and smiled. I guess it makes sense. These two don't get beer till they're older, though I know they got some secondhand partying from me last night. It was a hint of beer breath in the tent. Joanna wiped roughly, roughly at her face. She really did not want to talk about being a teenager just now. You know, that was kind of a mean trick you pulled on Scrupilo this afternoon. I, yes. I talked to him about it beforehand. He didn't want it, but I thought he was just being, is stiff-necked the word? If I had known how upset he was, well. He practically fell apart out there in front of everybody. If I understood how things work, that would have been his disgrace, right? Yes. Exchanging honor for loyalty in front of peers, it's an important thing. At least the way I run things. I'm sure Pilgrim or Dataset can say a dozen other ways to lead. Look, Joanna, I need that exchange. I needed you and Scrupilo to be there. Yeah, I know. We two saved the day. Silence. Her voice was suddenly edged, and Joanna remembered that this was a medieval queen. We are two hundred miles north of my borders, almost to the heart of the Flenser domain. In a few days we will meet the enemy, and more of us will die for... We, not, we know not quite what. The bottom dropped out of Joanna's stomach. If she couldn't get back to the ship, she couldn't finish what Mom and Dad had started. Please, Woodcarver, it is worth it. I know that. Pilgrim knows it. The majority of my council agrees, though grudgingly. But we of the council have talked with Dataset. We've seen your worlds and what your science can do. On the other hand, most of my people here, she waved ahead at the camp beyond the tent, are here on faith, and out of loyalty to me. For them, the situation is deadly, and the goal is vague. She paused, though two of her pups continued gesturing forcefully for a second. Now I don't know how you would persuade your kind to take such risks. Dataset talks of military conscription. That was Neorja, long ago. Never mind. The point is, my troops are here out of loyalty, mostly to me personally. For six hundred years, I have protected my people well. Their memories and legends are clear on it. More than once, I was the only one who saw a peril, and it was my advice that saved all those who heeded it. That is what keeps most of the soldiers, most of the cannoneers, going. Each of them is free to turn back. So, what should they think when our first combat is to fall like ignorant tourists onto a nest of wolves? Without the great good luck of you and part of Scrupilo being at the right place and alert, I would have been killed. Pilgrim would have been killed. Perhaps a third of the soldiers would have died. If not us, perhaps someone else, Joanna said in a small voice. Perhaps. I don't think anyone else came close to firing on the nest. You see the effect of my people? If bad luck in the forest can kill our queen and destroy our marvelous weapons, what will it be like when we face a thinking enemy? That was the question in many minds. Unless I could answer it, we'd never make it out of this valley, at least not going northward. So you gave the medals, loyalty for honor. Yes, you missed the sense of it, not understanding Tynish. I made a big thing of how well they had done. 
I gave silverwood accolades to packs who showed any competence during the ambush. That helped some. I repeated my reasons for this expedition, the wonders that Dataset describes and how much we lose if steel gets his way. But they've heard all that before, and it points to faraway things that they can scarcely imagine. The new thing I showed them today was you and Scrupilo. Us? I praise you beyond the skies. Singletons often do brave things. Sometimes they're halfway clever, or talk as though they are. But alone, Scrupilo's fragment wouldn't be much more than a good knife fighter. He knew about using the cannon, but he didn't have the paws or mouths to do anything with it. And by himself, he would never have figured out where to shoot it. You, on the other hand, are a two legs. In many ways, you are helpless. The only way you can think is by yourself, but you can do it without interfering with those around you. Together, you did what no pack could do in the middle of a wolf nest attack. So I told my army what a team of two races could become, how, how each makes up for the age-long failings of the other. Together, we are one step closer to being a pack of packs. How is Scrupilo? Joanna smiled faintly. Things turned out okay, once he was able to get out there and accept his medal. She fingered the brooch that was pinned to onto her own collar. <clears throat> it was a beautiful thing, a landscape of Woodcarver's city. Once he'd done that, he was totally changed. You should have seen him with the cannoneers afterwards. They did their own loyalty-slash-honor thing, and then they drank a lot of beer. Scrupilo was telling them all about what we were doing. He even had me help demonstrate. You really think the army bought what you said about the humans and tines? I think so. In my own language, I can be very eloquent. I've bred myself to be. Woodcarver was silent for a moment. Her puppies scrambled across the carpet and patted their muzzles at Joanna's hands. Besides, it may even be true. Pilgrim is sure of it. You can sleep in the same tent with me and still think. That's something that he and I can't do. In our own ways, we've each lived a long time, and I think we are each at least as smart as the humans and other creatures that Dataset talks about in the beyond. But you singleton creatures can stand next to each other, and think and build. Compared to us, I'll bet singleton races developed the sciences very fast. But now, with your help, maybe things will change fast for us, too. The, puppies re the two puppies retreated, and Woodcarver lowered heads to pause. That's what I told my people, anyway. You should try to get some sleep now. On the ground beyond the tent's entrance, there were some already there were already splashes of sunlight. Okay. Joanna slipped off her outer clothes. She lay down and dragged a light quilt across herself. Most of Woodcarver already looked asleep. As usual, one or two pairs of eyes were were open, but their intelligence would be limited. And just now, even they looked tired. Funny, Woodcarver had worked with the data set so much. Her human voice had come to capture emotion as well as pronunciation. Just now she had sounded so tired, so sad. Joanna reached out from under her quilt to brush the neck of Woodcarver's nearest, the blind one. Do you believe what you told everyone? She said softly. One of the sentry heads looked at her, and a very human sigh seemed to come from all directions. Woodcarver's voice was very faint. Yes, but I am very afraid that it doesn't matter anymore. For six hundred years, I have had proper confidence in myself. But what happened on the south wall should not have happened. It would not if I had followed Vendatius's advice and come down the new road. But we might have been seen. Yes, a either, failure either way, don't you see? Vendatius has precise information from the highest councils of the Flinzer, but he's something of a careless fool in everyday matters. I knew that, and I thought I could compensate. But the old road was in far worse condition than I remembered. The wolf nest could never have settled by it if there had been any traffic during the last few years. If Vendatius had managed his patrols properly, or if I had been managing him properly, we would never have been surprised. Instead, we were nearly overrun, and my only remaining talent appears to be in fooling those who trust me into thinking I still know what I'm doing. She opened another pair of eyes and made the smile gesture. Strange, I haven't said these things even to Pilgrim. Is this another advantage of human relations? Joanna patted the blind one's neck. Maybe. Anyway, I believe what I said about things about things that could be, but I fear that my soul may not be strong enough to make them so. Perhaps I should turn things over to Pilgrim or Vendatius. That's something I must think on. Woodcarver shh Joanna's surprised protests. Now sleep, please. Chapter 32 <clears throat> There was a time when Ravna thought that her, thought their tiny ship might fly all the way to the bottom unnoticed. Along with everyone else, that had changed. Everything else, that had changed. At the moment, Out of Band 2 might be the most famous sh starship known to the net. A million races watched the chase. In the middle beyond, there were vast antenna swarms beaming in their direction and listening to the news, mostly lies. 
sent from ships that pursued the OOB. She couldn't hear those lies directly, of course, but the transmissions from beyond were as clear as they were on the main trunk. Ravna spent part of each day reading the news, trying to find hope, trying to prove to herself that she was doing the right thing. By now, she was pretty sure that what was chasing them. No doubt even Fam and Blue Shell would have agreed on that. Why they were being chased, and what they might find at the end, was now the subject of endless speculation on the net. As usual, whatever the truth might be, was well hidden among the lies. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc, Language Path, Trisquiline, SJK Units, from Hands. No references prior to the fall of Relay. No probable source. This is someone being very cautious. Subject, Alliance for the Defense Fraudulent? Distribution, Threat of the Blight, War Trackers Interest Group, Homo Sapiens Interest Group. Date, 5.80 days since the fall of Sandra Kai. Key Phrases, Fool's Errand, Unnecessary Genocide. Text of Message. Earlier I speculated that there had been no destruction at Sandra Kai. Apologies. That was based on a catalog identification error. I agree with the messages, 13123, as of a few seconds ago, assuring me that the habitations of Sandra Kai suffered collisional damage within the last six days. So apparently the Alliance for the Defense has taken the military action they claimed earlier, and apparently they are powerful enough to destroy small civilizations in the middle beyond. The question still remains, why? I have, already I have already posted arguments showing it unlikely that Homo sapiens is especially controllable by the Blight, although they were stupid enough to create that entity. Even the Alliance's own reports admit that less than half of Sandra Kai's savants were of that race. Now a large part of the Alliance fleet is chasing into the bottom of the beyond after a single ship. What conceivable damage can the Alliance do to the Blight down there? The Blight is the great threat, perhaps the most novel and threatening in well-recorded history. Nevertheless, Alliance behavior appears destructive and pointless. Now that the Alliance has revealed some of its sponsoring organizations, see messages, ID numbers, I think we know its real motives. I see connections between the Alliance and old uh, Aprahant hegemony. A thousand years ago, that group had a similar jihad, grabbing a real estate left vacant by the recent transcendences. Stopping the hege hegemony was an exciting bit of action in that part of the galaxy. I think these people are back, taking advantage of the general panic attending the Blight, which is admittedly a much greater threat. My advice, beware of the Alliance and its claims of heroic efforts. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path. Um, Shira Sheen, uh, Rondralip, Triskoline, SJK Units. From Harmonious Repose Communication Synod, Subject, Encounter with Agents of the Perversion, Distribution, Threat of the Blight, Date, 6.37 Days Since Fall of Sandra Kai, Key Phrases, Hand Fraudulent, Text of Message, We have no special inclination toward any of the posters on this thread. Nevertheless, it's remarkable that an entity that has not revealed its location or special interests, namely Hands, should be smearing the efforts of the Alliance for the Defense. The Alliance kept its constituents, constituents secret only during that period when its forces were being gathered, when a single stroke of the perversion's power might destroy it entirely. Since that time, it has been quite open if it, in its efforts. Hans wonders how a single starship could be worth the Alliance's attention. As harmonious repose was the site of the latest turn of events, we are in a position to give some explanation. The ship in question, the Out of Band 2, is clearly designed for operations at the bottom of the beyond, and is even capable of limited operations within the slow zone. The ship presented itself as a special zonographic flight commissioned to study the recent turbulence at the bottom. In fact, this ship's mission is a very different one. In the aftermath of its violent departure, we have pieced together some extraordinary facts. At least one of the ship's crew was human. Though they made great efforts to stay out of view and use Scrodrider traders as intermediaries, we have recordings. A bio-sequence of one individual was obtained, and it matches the patterns maintained by two out of three of the Homo sapiens archives. It's well known that the third archive, on Sneerot Down, is in control of human sympathizers. Some might say that this deception was founded in fear. After all, these events happened after the destruction of Sandra Kai. We think otherwise. The ship's initial contact with us occurred before the Sandra Kai incident. 
We have since made a careful analysis of the repair work our yards performed on this vessel. Ultra drive automation is a deep and complex thing. Even the cleverest of cloaking cannot mask all the memories in it. We now know that the out of band 2 was from the relay system and that it left there after the perversion's attack. Think what this means. The crew of the out of band 2 brought weapons into a habitat, killed several local savants, and escaped before our musicians, harmonizers, police, were properly notified. We have good reason to wish them ill. Yet our misfortune is a small thing compared to the unmasking of this secret mission. We are very grateful that the Alliance is willing to risk so much in following this lead. There's more than the usual number of unsubstantiated assertions floating around on this news thread. We hope our facts will wake some people up. In particular, consider what hands may really be. The perversion is very visible in the high beyond, where it has great power and can speak with its own voice. Down here, it is more likely that deception and covert propaganda will be its tools. Think on this when you read postings from unidentified entities such as hands. Ravna gritted her teeth. The hell of it was. The facts in the posting were correct. It was the inferences that were vicious and false. And she couldn't guess if this were some shade of black propaganda, or simply St. Rindell expressing honest conclusions, though Rindell had never seemed so trusting of the butterflies. One thing all the news seemed to agree on, much more than the Alliance fleet was chasing the OOB. The swarm of ultra-drive traces could be seen by anyone within a thousand light years. The best guess was that three fleets pursued the OOB. Three. The Alliance for the Defense, still loud and boastful, even though suspected, by some, of being opportunistic genocides. Beside them, Sandra Kai, or behind them, Sandra Kai, and what was left of Ravna's motherland. In all the universe, perhaps, the only folk she could trust and just behind them, the silent fleet. Diverse news posters claimed it was from the high beyond. That fleet might have problems at the bottom, but for now it was gaining. Few doubted that it was the perversion's child. More than anything, it convinced the universe that the OOB, or its destination, was cosmically important. Just why it was important was the big question. Speculation was drifting in at the rate of 5,000 messages per hour. A million different viewpoints were considering the mystery. Some of those viewpoints were so alien that they made the Scrode Riders and humans look like the same species. At least five participants on this news thread were gaseous inhabitants of stellar coronas. There were one or two others that Ravna suspected were uncatalogued races, being so shy that this might be their first active use of the net ever. The OOB's computer was a lot dumber than it had been in the middle beyond. She couldn't ask it to sift through messages looking for nuance and insight. In fact, if an incoming message didn't have a Trisquillan text, it was often unreadable. The ship's translator program still worked fairly well with the major trade languages, but even there the translation was slow and full of alternative meanings in Jabberwocky. It was just another sign that they were approaching the bottom of the beyond. Effective translation of natural lang languages comes awfully close to requiring a sentient translator program. Nevertheless, with proper design, things might have been better. The automation might have degraded gracefully under the restrictions imposed by their depth. Instead, gear just stopped working. What remained was slow and error-prone. If only the refitting had been completed before the fall of Relay. And just how many times have I wished for that? She hoped things were as bad aboard the pursuing ships. So Ravni used the ship to do light culling on the Threats news group. Much of what was left was inane, as from people who see uh, portents in the weather. Crypto, zero. Syntax, 43. As received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path. Arbwith. Trade. Chergulin. Trisquiline. SJK Units. From. Twirlip of the Mists. Perhaps an organization of cloud flyers in a single Jovian system. Very sparse priors before this thread began. Appears to be seriously out of touch. Program recommendation. Delete this poster from presentation. Subject. The Blight's goal at the bottom. Distribution. Threat of the Blight. Great secrets of creation. Date. 4.54 days since fall of Sandra Kai. Key phrases. Zone instability and the Blight. Hexapodia as the key insight. Text of message. Apologies first if I am repeating obvious conclusions. My only gateway onto the net is very expensive, and I miss many important postings. I think that anyone following both Great Secrets of Creation and Threat of the Blight would see an important pattern. Since the events reported by Harmonious Repose Information Service, most agree that something important to the perversion exists at the bottom of the beyond in region. 
I see a possible connection here with the great secrets. During the last 220 days, there have been increasing reports of zone interface instability in the region below harmonious repose. As the blight threat has grown and its attacks uh, against advanced races and other powers continued, this instability has increased. Could there not be some connection? I urge all to consult their information on the Great Secrets, or the nearest archive maintained by that group. Events such as this prove once again that the universe is all Ronzel between. Some of the postings were tantalizing, like gloss. Crypto, zero. Syntax, 43. As received by OOB Shipboard Ad, ad Hoc. Language Path, Wobblings, Baylor-esque, Trisquiline, SJK Units. From Cricket Song, Under the High Willow. Cricket Song is a synthetic race created as a jape slash experiment slash instrument by the High Willow upon its transcendence. Cricket Song has been on the net for more than 10,000 years. Apparently, it is a financial, uh, fanatical studier of paths to transcendence. For 8,000 years, it has been the heaviest poster on the Where Are We Now and related groups. There is no evidence that any Cricket Song settlement has itself transcended. Cricket Song is sufficiently peculiar that there uh, is a large news group for speculation concerning the race itself. Consensus is that Cricket Song was designed by High Willow as a probe back into the beyond, that the race is somehow incapable of attempting its own transcendence. Subject, the Blight's goal at the bottom. Distribution, threat of the Blight, War Tracker's special interest group. Where are they now, special interest group? Date, 5.12 days since fall of Sandra Kai. Key phrases, unbecoming transcendent. Text of message. Contrary to other postings, there are a number of reasons why a power might install artifacts at the bottom of the beyond. The Abseller's message on this thread cites some. Some powers have documented curiosity about the slow zone and, even more, about the unthinking depths. In rare cases, expeditions have been dispatched, though, uh, though any return from the depths would occur long before or long after the dispatching power lost interest in all local questions. However, none of these motives are likely here. To those who are familiar with uh, fast burn transcendence, it is clear that the blight is a creature seeking stasis. Its interest in the bottom is very sudden, provoked, we think, by the revelations at harmonious repose. There is something at the bottom that is critical to the perversion's welfare. Consider the notion of ablative dissonance. See the Where Are They Now group archive. No one knows what set-up procedures the humans of Stromley Realm were using. The fast burn may itself have transcendent intelligence. What if it became dissatisfied with the direction of the Chen Chenindring? In that case, it might try to hide the jump-off birthing hell. The bottom would not be a place where the algorithm itself could normally execute, but avatars might still be created from it and briefly run. Up to a point, Ravna could almost make sense of it. Ablative dissonance was a common place of applied theology. But then, like one of those dreams where the secret of life is about to be revealed, the posting just drifted into nonsense. There were postings that were neither asinine nor obscure. As usual, Sandor at the zoo had a lot of things dead right. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path, Trisquilin, SJK Units. From Sandor Arbitration Intelligence at the Zoo a known military corporation of the high beyond. If this is a masquerade, somebody is living dangerously. The subject, the Blight's goal at the bottom. Key phrases, sudden change in Blight's tactics. Distribution, threat of the Blight, war trackers interest group, homo sapiens interest group. Date, 8.15 days since fall of Sandra Kai. Text of message. In case you don't know, Sandor Intelligence has a number of different net feeds. We can collect messages on paths that have no intermediate nodes in common. Thus, we can be fairly confident that the news we receive has not been tampered with en route. There, there remain the lies and misunderstandings that were present to begin with, but that's something that makes the intelligence business interesting. The Blight has been our top priority since its instantiation a year ago. This is not just because of the Blight's obvious strength, the destruction, and the decides it has committed. We fear that all this is the lesser part of the threat. There have been perversions almost as powerful in the recorded past. What truly distinguishes this one is its stability. We see no evidence of internal evolution. In some ways, it is less than a power. It may never lose interest in controlling the high beyond. 
We may be witnessing a massive and permanent change in the nature of things. Imagine a stable necrosis, where the only sentience in the high beyond is the blight. Thus, studying the blight has been a matter of life and death for us, even though we are powerful and widely distributed. We've reached a number of conclusions. Some of these may be obvious to you, others may sound like flagrant speculation. All take on a new coloring with the events reported from harmonious repose. Almost from the beginning, the blight has been searching for something. This search has extended far beyond its aggressive physical expansion. Its automatic agents have tried to penetrate virtually every node in the top of the beyond. The high network is in shambles, reduced to protocols scarcely more efficient than those known below. At the same time, the Blight has physically stolen several archives. We have evidence of very large fleets searching for off-net archives at the top end in the low transcend. At least three pow powers have been murdered in this rampage. And now, suddenly, this assault has ended. The Blight's physical expansion continues, with no end in sight, but it no longer searches the high beyond. As near as we can tell, the change occurred about 2,000 seconds before the escape of the human vessel from harmonious repose. Less than six hours later, we saw the beginnings of the silent fleet that so many are now speculating about. That fleet is indeed the creature of the Blight. In other times, the destruction of Sandrakai and the motives of, this, of the Alliance for the Defense would all be important issues, and our organization might have interest in doing business with those affected. But all that is dwarfed by the fact that of this fleet and the ship it pursues, and we disagree with the analysis, implication, from a harmonious repose. It is obvious to us that the Blight did not know of the Out of Band 2 until its discovery at, at Harmonious Repose. That ship is not a tool of the Blight, but it contains or is bound for something of enormous important to, importance to the Blight. And what might that be? Here we begin frank speculation. And since we are speculating, we'll use those powerful pseudo-laws, the principles of mediocrity and minimal, minimal assumption. If the Blight has the potential for taking it over all the top in a permanent stability, then why has this not happened before? Our guess is that the Blight has been instantiated before, with such dire consequence that the event marks the beginning of recorded time, but it has its own peculiar natural enemy. The order of events even suggests a particular scenario, one, part one familiar from network security. Once upon a time, very long ago, there was another instance of the Blight, a successful defense was mounted, and all known copies of the Blight's recipe were destroyed. Of course, on a wide net, no one can ever be sure that all copies of a badness are gone. No doubt, the defense was distributed in enormous numbers. But even if a harboring archive were reached by such a distribution, there might also there might be no effect if the Blight were not currently active there. The luckless humans of Stromley Realm chanced on such an archive, no doubt a ruin long off the net. They instantiated it, the Blight, and incidentally, perhaps a little later, the defense program. Somehow that Blight's enemy escaped destruction, and the Blight has been searching for it ever since, in all the wrong places. In its weakness, the new instance of the, of the defense retreated to the depths, no power would think of penetrating. Whence it could never return without outside help. Speculation on top of speculation. We can't guess the nature of this defense, except that its retreat is a discouraging sign. And now even that sacrifice has gone for naught, since the Blight has seen through the deception. The Blight's fleet is clearly an ad hoc thing, hastily thrown together from forces that happened to be closest to the discovery. Without such haste, the quarry might have been lost to it. Thus, the chase equipment is probably ill-suited to the depths, and its performance will be degrade as the descent progresses. However, we estimate that it will remain stronger than any force that can reach the scene in the near future. We may m learn more of after the Blight reaches the Out of Bands 2's destination. If it destroys that destination immediately, we'll know that something truly dangerous to the Br Blight existed there, and may exist elsewhere, at least in recipe form. If it does not, then perhaps the Blight was looking for something that will make it even more dangerous than before. Ravna sat back, stared at the, the display for some time. Sandor Arbitration Intelligence was one of the sharpest posters in this news group, but now even their predictions were just different flavors of doom. And also damn cool they were. So analytical. She knew that Sandor was polyspecific, with branch offices scattered through the high beyond, but they were no power. If the perversion could knock over Relay and kill Old One, then all of Sandor's resources wouldn't help it if the enemy decided to gobble them up. Their analysis had the tone of the pilot of a crashing ship, intent on understanding the danger, 
not taking time out for terror. Oh, fam, how I wish I could talk to you like before. She curled gently in on herself, the way you can in zero G. The sobs came softly, but without hope. They had not exchanged a hundred words in the last five days. They lived as if with guns at each other's heads, and that was the literal truth. She had made it so. When she and he had the Scrode Riders, uh, and the Scrode Riders had been together, at least the danger had been a shared burden. Now they were split apart, and their enemies were slowly gaining on them. What good could Fam's god chatter be against a thousand enemy ships and the blight behind them? She floated for a timeless while, the sobs fading into despairing silence. And again she wondered if what she'd done could possibly be right. She had threatened Fam's life to protect Blue Shell and Greenstock and their kind. In doing so, she had kept secret what might be the greatest treachery in the history of the known net. Can one person make such a decision? Fam had asked her that, and she had answered yes, but... The question toyed with her every day, and every day she tried to see some way out. She wiped her face silently. She didn't doubt what Fam had discovered. There were some smug posters on the net who argued that something as vast as the Blight was simply a tragic disaster and not an evil. Evil, they argued, could only have meaning on smaller scales, in the hurt that one Safant does to another. Before R.I.P., the argument had seemed a frivolous playing with words. Now she saw that it was meaningful, and dead wrong. The Blight had created the Riders, a marvelous and peaceful race. Their presence on a billion worlds had been a good, and behind it all was the potential for converting the sovereign minds of friends into monsters. When she thought of Blue Shell and Greenstock, and the fear welled up and she knew the poison that was there, even though they were good people, then she knew she'd glimpsed evil on a transcendent scale. She had gotten Blue Shell and Greenstock into this mission. They had not asked for it. They were friends and allies, and she would not harm them because of what they had they could become. Maybe it was the latest news items. Maybe it was confronting the same impossibilities for the nth time. Ravna gradually straightened, looking at those last messages. So, she believed Fam about the Scrode Rider threat. She also believed that these two were only enemies in potential. She had thrown away everything to save them and their kind. Maybe it was a mistake, but take what advantage there is in it. If they are to be saved because you think they are allies, then treat them as allies. Treat them as the friends they are. We are all pawns together. Ravna pushed gently towards her cabin's doorway. The Scrode Rider's cabin was just behind the command deck. Since the debacle at R.I.P., the two had not left it. As she drifted down the passage toward their door, Ravna half expected to see Fam's handiwork lurking in the shadows. She knew he was doing his best to protect himself, yet there was nothing unusual. What will he think of my visiting them? She announced herself. After a moment, Blue Shell appeared. His scrode was wiped clean of cosmetic stripes, and the room behind him was a jumble. He waved her in with a quick jerks of his fronds. My lady. Blue Shell, she nodded at him. Half the time she cursed herself for trusting the riders. The other half, she was mortally embarrassed for having left them alone. H how was Greenstock? Surprisingly, Blue Shell's fronds snapped together in a smile. You guessed? This is the first day with her new scrode. I will show you if you'd like. He threaded around equipment that was scattered in a lattice across the room. It was similar to the shop equipment Fam had used to build his powered armor. And if Fam had seen it, he might have lost all self-control. I've worked on it every minute since. Fam locked us in here. Greenstock was in the other room. Her stock and fronds rose from a single silver pot. There were no wheels. It looked nothing like a traditional scrode. Blue Shell rolled across the ceiling and extended a frond down to his mate. He rustled something at her, and after a moment, she replied. The scrodling is very limited. No mobility. No redundant power supplies. I copied it off a lefer, lesser scrode rider design. A simple thing designed by Dirokimes. It's not meant for more than sitting in one place, facing in one direction, but it provides her with short-term memory support and attention focusers. She is back with me. He fussed around her, some fronds caressing hers, others pointing to the gadget he had built for her. She herself was not badly injured. Sometimes I wonder, whatever fame says, maybe at the last second he could not kill her. He spoke nervously, as though afraid of what Ravna might say. The first few days I was very worried, but the surgeon is good. It gave her plenty of time to sand, stand in strong surf, to think slowly. Since I've added on this scrodling, she has practiced the calisthenics of memory, repeating what the surgeon or I say to her. With the scrodling, she can hold on to a new memory for almost 500 seconds. That's usually long enough for her natural mind to commit a thought to long-term memory. 
Ravna drifted close. There were some new creases in Greenstalk's fronds. Those would be scars healing. Her visual surfaces followed Ravna's approach. The writer knew she was here. Her whole posture was friendly. Can she talk Trisk, Blue Shell? Do you have a voter hooked up? What? Buzz. He was forgetful or nervous. Ravna couldn't tell which. Yes, yes, just give me a minute. There was no need before. No one wanted to talk to us. He fiddled with something on his homemade scrod. After a moment, Hello, Ravna. I recognize you. Her fronds rustled in time with the words. I know you too. We, I am glad you are there, yet you are back. The voter voice was faint, wistful. Yes, it's hard for me to tell. I do want to talk, but I'm not sure. Am I making sense? Out of Greenstalk's sight, Blue Shell flicked a long tendril, a, gest a gesture. Stay, say yes. Yes, I understand you, Greenstalk. And Ravna resolved never again to get angry with Greenstalk about not remembering. Good. Her fronds straightened and she didn't say anything more. See? Came Blue Shell's voter voice. I am brightly cheerful. Even now, Greenstalk is committing this conversation to long-term memory. It goes slowly for now, but I am improving the scrodling. I'm sure her slowness is mainly emotional shock. He continued to brush at Greenstalk's fronds, but she didn't say anything more. Ravna wondered just how brightly cheerful he could be. Behind the riders were a set of display windows, customized now for the rider outlook. You've been following the news? Ravna asked. Yes, indeed. I feel so helpless. I feel so foolish saying that to you. But Blue Shell didn't take offense. He seemed grateful for the change of topic, preferring the gloom at a distance. Yes, we are certainly are famous now. Three fleets chasing us down, my lady. Ha ha. They don't seem to be gaining very fast. Frond shrugged. Sir Fam has turned out to be a competent ship's master. I'm afraid things will change as we descend. The ship's higher automation will gradually fail. What you call manual control will become very important. OOB was designed for my race, my lady. No matter what Sir Fam thinks of us, at bottom we can fly it better than any. So bit by bit the others will gain, at least those who truly understand their own ships. It was something she hadn't guessed, certainly something she would never have found reading in the net. Too bad it's also bad news. Surely Fam must know this. I think he must, but he is trapped in his own fears. What can he do? If not for you, my lady Ravna, he might have killed us already. Maybe when the choice comes down to dying in the next hour against trusting us, maybe then we'll, there will be a chance. By then it will be too late. Look, even if he doesn't trust, even though he believes the worst of writers, there must still be a way. And it came to her that sometimes you don't have to change the way people think, or even whom they may hate. Fam wants to get to the bottom, to recover his countermeasure. He thinks that you may be from the blight, and after the same thing, but up to a point. Up to a point he can cooperate, postpone the showdown he imagines till perhaps it won't matter. Even as she started to say it, Blue Shell was already shouting back at her. I am not at the bl of the blight. Greenstalk is not. The rider race is not. He swept around his mate, rolled across the ceiling till his fronds rattled right before Ravna's face. I'm sorry, it's just the potential... Nonsense, his voter buzzed off scale. We ran into an evil few. Every race has such. People who will kill for trade. They forced Greenstock, substituted data at her voter. Fam Nguyen would kill our billions for the sake of this fantasy. He waved, inarticulate. Something she had never seen in a scroll writer. His fronds actually changed tone, darkened. The motion ceased, yet he said nothing more. And then Ravna heard it, a keening that might have come from a voter. The sound was steadily growing, a howl that made all Blue Shell's sound effects friendly nonsense. It was Greenstalk. The scream reached a tr threshold just below pain, then broke into tro choppy Trisquillen. It's true. Oh, by all our trading, Blue Shell, it's true. And statically, staticky noise came from her voter. Her fronds started shaking, random turning that must be like a human's eyes wildly staring, like a human's mouth mumbling hysteria. Blue Shell was already back by the wall, reaching to adjust her new scrode. Greenstock's fronds brushed him away, and her voter voice continued. I was horror-struck, Blue Shell. I was horror-struck, struck by horror, and it would not stop. The voice rattled quiet for just an instant, and this time Blue Shell made no move. I remember everything up to the last five minutes, and everything Fam says is true, dear love. Loyal as you are, and I have seen that loyalty now for two hundred years, you would be turned in an instant, just as I was. Now that the dam broke, her words came quickly, mostly making sense. The horrors she could remember were grave and deep, and she was finally coming out of ghastly shock. I was right behind you, remember, Blue Shell? 
You were deep in your trading with the tusk legs, so deep you did not really see. I noticed the other riders coming toward us. Not, no matter, a friendly meeting so far from home. Then one touched my scrode. I. Greenstock hesitated. Her fronds rattled and she began again. Horror struck. Horror struck. After a moment. It was like suddenly new memories in the scrode, Blue Shell. New memories, new attitudes, but thousands of years deep, and not mine. Instantly, instantly, I never even lost consciousness. I just thought, I thought just as clearly, I remembered all I had before. And when you resisted, Ravna said softly. Resisted? My Lady Ravna, I did not resist. I was theirs. No, not theirs, for they were owned too. We were things, our intelligence in service to another's goal, dead and alive to see our death. I would kill you. I would kill Fam. I would kill Blue Shell. You know I tried, and when I did, I wanted to succeed. You could not imagine, Ravna. You humans speak of violation. You could never know. Long pause. That's not quite right. At the top of the beyond, within the blight itself, perhaps there, everyone lives as I did. The shuddering did not subside, but her gestures were no longer aimless. The fronds were saying something in her own language and brushing gently against Blue Shell. Our whole race, dear love, just as Fan says it. Blue Shell wilted, and Ravna felt the sort of gut tearing she had she had when they learned of Sandra Kai. That had been her worlds, her family, her life. Blue Shell was hearing worse. Ravna pushed a little closer, near enough to run her hand up the side of Greenstock's fronds. Fan says it's the greater scrodes that are the cause. Sabotage hidden billions of years deep. Yes, it is mainly the Scrodes, the great gift we writers love so. It is a design for control, but I fear we were remade for it, too. When they touched my Scrode, I was converted instantly. Instantly, everything I cared for was meaningless. We are like smart bombs, scattered by the trillions through space that everyone thinks is safe. We will be used sparingly. We are the Blight's hidden weapon, especially in the low beyond. Blue Shell twitched, and his voice came out jerkily. And everything Fam claims is correct. No, Blue Shell, not everything, Ravner remembered the last chilling standoff with Fam Nguyen. He has the facts, but he weighs them wrong. As long as your scrodes are not perverted, you are the same folk that I trusted to fly me to the bottom. Blue Shell angled his look away from her, an angry shrug. Greenstock's voice came instead. As long as the scrode has not been perverted, but look how easy it was done, how sudden I became the blights. Yes, but could it happen except by direct touch? Could you be changed by reading the net news? She meant the question as ghastly sarcasm, but poor Greenstock took it seriously. Not by a news item, nor by standard protocol messages, but accepting a transmission targeted on scrode utilities might do it. Then we are safe here, you, because you no longer ride a greater scrode, blue shell, because... because I was never touched, but how can you know that? His answer was still there deep within shame, but now it was a hopeless anger directed at something very far away. No, dear love, you have not been touched. I would know. Yes, but why should Ravna believe you? Everything could be a lie, thought Ravna, but I believe Greenstock. I believe we four are the only ones in all the beyond who can hurt the blight. If only Fam could see it. And that brought her back, too. You say we will start losing our lead? Blue Shell waved an affirmative. As soon as we are a little lower, they should have us in a matter of weeks. And then it won't matter who was perverted and who was not. I think we should have a little chat with Fam Nguyen. God shatter and all. Beforehand, Ravna couldn't imagine how the confrontation would turn out. Just possibly, if he'd lost all touch with reality, Fam might try to kill them when they appeared on the command deck. More likely there would be rage and argument and threats, and they would be back to square one. Instead, it was almost like the old Fam, from before Harmonious Repose. He let them enter the command deck. He made no comment when Ravna set herself carefully between himself and the riders. He listened without interruption, while Ravna explained what Greenstock had said. These two are safe, Fan, and without their help, will not make it to the bottom. He nodded, looked away at the windows. Some showed natural starscape. Most were ultra-trace displays, the closest thing to a picture of the enemies that were closing on the OOB. His calm expression broke for just an instant, and the fan that loved her sim seemed to stare out, desperate. And you really believe all this, Rave? Rav? How? Then the lid was back on, his expression distant and neutral. Never mind, certainly it's true. Without all of us working together, we'll make it, men never make it to the Tyne's world. Blue Shell, I accept your offer. Subject to cautious safeguards, we work together. Till I can safely dispose of you, Ravna could feel the unsaid words behind his blandness. Showdown deferred. Chapter 33 
They were less than eight weeks from Tyne's world, both Fam and Blue Shell said, if the zone conditions remained stable, if they were not overtaken in the meantime. Less than two months after the six already voyaged, but the days were not like before. Every one was a challenge, a standoff sometimes cloaked in civility, sometimes flaring into set threats of sudden death, as when Fam retrieved Blue Shell's shop equipment. Fam was living on the command deck now. When he left it, the hatch was locked on his ID. He had destroyed, or thought he had destroyed, all other privileged links to the ship's automation. He and Blue Shell were in almost constant collaboration, but not like before. Every step was slow, Blue Shell examining everything, allowed to demonstrate nothing. That's where the arguments came closest to deadly force, when Fam must give in to one peril or the other. For every day the pursuing fleets were a little bit closer, two bands of killers, and what was left of Sandra Kai. Eventually some of the SJK commercial security fleet could still fight. Wanted revenge on the Alliance. Once Ravna suggested to Fam that they contact commercial security, try to persuade, persuade them to attack the Blighter fleet. Fam had given her a blank look. Not yet. Maybe not ever, he said, and turned away. In a way, his answer was a relief. Such a battle would be a suicidal long shot. Ravna didn't want the last of her kinsfolk dying for her. So the OOB might arrive at Tyne's world before the enemy, but with what little time to spare. Some days Ravna withdrew in tears and despair. What brought, back, brought her back was Geoffrey and Greenstock. They both needed her, and for a few weeks more she could still help. Mr. Steele's defense plans were proceeding. The Tynes were even having, a ha having some success with their wideband radio. Steele reported that Woodcarver's main force was on its way north. There was one, more than one race uh, against time. She spent many hours with the OOB's library, devising more gifts for Jeffrey's friends. Some things, like telescopes, were easy, but others, it wasn't wasted effort. Even if the Blight won, its fleet might ignore the natives, might settle for killing the OOB and winning back the countermeasure. Greenstock was slowly improving. At first Ravna was afraid the improvement might be in her own imagination. Ravna was spending a good part of each day sitting with the rider, trying to see progress in her responses. Greenstock was very far away, almost like a human with stroke damage and prosthesis. In fact, she seemed regressed from the articulate horror of her first conversations. Maybe her recent progress was just a mirror to Ravna's sensitivity to the fact that Ravna was with her so much. Blue Shell insisted that there was progress, but with that stutter, stubborn inflexibility of his. Two weeks, three, and there was no doubt. Something was healing at the boundary between Ryder and Scrodling. Greenstock consistently made sense, consistently committed important rememberings. Now as often as not, it was helping, it was she helping Ravna. Greenstock saw things that Ravna had missed. Sir Fam isn't the only one who is afraid of us Scrod Riders. Blue Shell is frightened too, and it's tearing him apart. He can't admit it, even to me, but he thinks it's possible that we've infected independently of our Scrodes. He desperately wants to convince Fam that this is not true, and so to convince himself. She was silent for a long moment, one frond brushing against Ravna's arm. Sea sounds surrounded them in the cabin, but ship's automation could no longer produce surging water. Sigh. We must pretend the surf, dear Ravna. Somewhere it will always be, no matter what happened at Sandra Kai, no matter what happens here. Blue Shell was hearty gentleness around his mate, but alone with Ravna his rage showed through. No, no, I don't object to Sir Fam's navigation, at least not now. Perhaps we could be a little further ahead with me directly at the helm, but the fastest ships behind us would still be closing. It's the other things, my lady. You know how untrustworthy our automation is down here. Fam is hurting it further. He's written his own security overrides. He's turning the ship's environment automation into a system of booby traps. Ravna had seen evidence of this. The areas around OOB's command deck and ship's workshop looked like military checkpoints. You know his fears, if this makes him feel safer. That's not the point, my lady. I would do anything pers to persuade him to accept my help. But what he's doing is deadly dangerous. Our bottom automation is not reliable, and he's making it actively worse. If we get some sudden stress, the environment programs will likely have a bizarre crash. Atmosphere dump, thermal, thermal runaway, anything. I, Doesn't he understand? Fam controls nothing. His voter broke into a non-linear squawk. He has the ability to destroy, but that is all. He needs my help. He was my friend. Doesn't he understand? Fam understood. Oh, Fam understood. 
He and Ravna still talked. Their arguments were the hardest thing in her life, and sometimes they didn't exactly argue. Sometimes it was almost like a rational discussion. I haven't been taken over, Ravna, not like the Blight takes over writers, anyway. I still have charge of my soul. He turned away from the console and flashed a wan smile in her direction, acknowledging the flaw in such self-conviction. And from things like that smile, Ravna was convinced that Pham Nguyen still lived and sometimes spoke. What about the God Shatter state? I see you for hours just staring at the tracking display or mucking around in the library and the news, scanning faster than any human could cons consciously read. Pham shrugged. It's studying the ships that are chasing us, trying to figure out just what belongs to whom, just what capabilities each might have. I don't know the details. Self-awareness is on vacation, then. When all of Pham's mind was turned into a processor for whatever program's old one had downloaded. A few hours of fuge state might yield an instant of power-grade thought, and even that he didn't consciously remember. But I know this. Whatever the God Shatter is, it's a very narrow thing. It's not alive. In some ways it may not even be very smart. For everyday matters like ship piloting, there's just good old Pham Nguyen. There's the rest of us, Pham. Blue Shell would like to help. Ravna spoke, spoke softly. This was the place where Pham would close into icy silence or blow up in rage. This day, he just cocked his head. Ravna, Ravna, I know I need him, and, and I'm glad I need him, that I don't have to kill him. Yet. Pham's lips quizzered, quivered for a second, and she thought she, he might start crying. The God Shatter can't know Blue Shell. Not the God Shatter. It's not making me act this way. I'm doing what any person should do when the stakes are this high. The words were spoken without anger. Maybe there was a chance. Maybe she could reason. Blue Shell and Greenstock are loyal, Fam. Except at harmonious repose. Fam sighed. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. They came to Relay from Stromley Realm. They got Vermini looking for the refugee ship. That smells of setup, but probably unknowing. Maybe even a setup by something opposing the Blight. In any case, they were innocent then, else the Blight would have known about Tyne's world right from the beginning. The Blight knew nothing till R.I.P., till Greenstock was converted. And I know Blue Shell was loyal even then. He knew things about my armor, the remotes, for instance, that he could have warned the others about. Hope came as a surprise to Ravna. He really had thought things out, and... It's just the Scrodes, fam. They're traps waiting to be sprung. But we're isolated here, and you destroyed the one that Greenstock... Fam was shaking his head. It's more than the Scrodes. The Blights had its hand in the rider design, too, at least to some degree. I can't imagine the takeover of Greenstock's being so smooth others otherwise. Yes, a risk. A very small risk compared to... Fam didn't move, but something in him seemed to draw away from her, denying the support she could offer. A small risk? We don't know. The stakes are so high. I'm walking a tightrope. If I don't use Blue Shell now, we'll be shot out of space by the Blighter fleet. If I let him do too much, if I trust him, then he or some part of him could betray us. All I have is the God Shatter, and a bunch of memories that... that may be the biggest fakes of all. These last words were nearly inaudible. He looked up at her, a look that was both cold and terribly lost. But I'm going to use what I have, Rav, and whatever it is I am. Somehow, I'm going to get us to the Tyne's world. Somehow, I'm going to get the Old One's God Shatter to whatever is there. It was another three weeks before Blue Shell's predictions came true. The OOB had seemed a sturdy beast up in the middle beyond. Even its damaged ultra drive had failed gracefully. Now the ship was leaking bugs in all directions. Much of it had nothing to do with Pham's meddling. Without those final consistency checks, none of the OOB's bottom automation was really trustworthy, but its failures were compounded by Pham's desperate security hacks. The ship's library had source code for generic bottom automation. Pham spent several days revising it for the OOB. All four of them were on the command deck during the installation. Blue Shell trying to help, Pham suspiciously examining every suggestion. Thirty minutes into the installation, they were, there were muffled banging noises down the main corridor. Ravna might have ignored them, except that she'd never heard the like aboard the OOB. Pham and the riders reacted with near panic. Spacers don't like unexplained bumps in the night. Blue Shell raced to the hatch, floated Franz first through the hole. I see nothing, Sir Pham. Pham was paging quickly through the diagnostic displays, mixed format things partly from the new setup. I've got some warning lights here, but... Greenstock started to say something, but Blue Shell was back and talking fast. I don't believe it. Anything like this should make pictures, a detailed report. Something is terribly wrong. Pham stared at him a second, then returned to his diagnostics. Five seconds passed. You're right. Status is just looping through stale reports. He began grabbing views from cameras all over the OOB's interior. Barely half of them reported, but what they showed... 
The ship's water reservoir is a foggy, icy cavern. There was a banging sound. Tons of water, spaced. A dozen other support services had gone bizarre, and... The armed checkpoint outside the workshop had slagged down. The beamers were firing continuously on low power. And for all the destruction, the diagnostics still showed green or amber, or no report. Fam got a camera in the workshop itself. The place was on fire. Fam jumped up from his saddle and bounced off the ceiling. For an instant, she thought he might go racing off the bridge. Then he tied himself down and grimly began trying to put out the fire. For the next few minutes, the bridge was almost quiet, just Fam quietly swearing as none of the obvious things worked. Interlocking failures, he mumbled the phrase a couple of times. The fire snuff automa automation is down. I can't dump atmosphere from the shop. My beamers have melted everything shut. Ship fire. Ravna had seen pictures of such disasters, but they had always seemed an improbable thing. In the midst of universal vacuum, how could a fire survive? And in zero-g, surely a fire would choke itself even if the crew couldn't dump atmosphere. The workshop camera had a hazy view on the real thing. True, the flames ate the oxygen around them. There were sheets of construction foam that were only lightly scorched, protected for the moment by dead air. But the fire spread out, moving steadily into still fresh air. In places, heat-driven turbulence enriched the mix, and previously burned areas blazed up. It still got ventilation for Sir Fan. I know, I can't shut it. The vents must be melted open. It says likely software. Blue Shell was silent for a second. Try this. The directions were meaningless to Ravna, some low-level workaround. But Fam nodded, and his fingers danced across the console. In the workshop, the surface-hugging flames crept farther across the construction foam. Now they licked at the innards of the armor Fam had spent so much time on. This latest revision was only half finished. Ravna remembered he was working on reactive armor now. There would be oxidizers there. Fam, is the armor sealed? The fire was sixty meters aft and behind a dozen bulkheads. The explosion came as a distant thump, almost innocent. But in the camera view, the armor dismembered itself, and the fire blazed triumphant. Seconds later, Fam got Blue Shell's suggestion working, and the workshop's vents closed. The fire in the wrecked armor continued for another half hour, but did not spread beyond the shop. It took two days to clean up, to estimate the damage, and to have some confidence that no new disaster was on the way. Most of the workshop was destroyed. They would have no armor on Tyne's world. Fam salvaged one of the beamers that had been guarding the entrance to the shop. Disaster was scattered all across the ship, the classic random ruin of interlocking failures. They had lost 50% of their water. The ship's landing boat had lost its higher automation. OOB's rocket drive was massively degraded. That was unimportant here in interstellar space, but their final velocity matching would, would be done at only 0.4 Gs. Thank goodness the A-grav worked. They would have no trouble maneuvering in steep gravitational wells, that is, landing on the time's world. Ravna knew how close they were to losing the ship, but she watched Fam with even greater dread. She was so afraid that he would take this as a final evidence of writer treachery that this would drive him over the edge. Strangely, almost the opposite happened. His pain and devastation were obvious, but he didn't lash out, just doggedly went about gathering up the pieces. He was talking to Blue Shell more now, not letting him modify the automation, but cautiously accepting more of his advice. Together they restored the ship to something like its pre-fire state. She asked Fam about it. No change of heart, he finally said. I had to balance the risk, and I messed up. And maybe there is no balance. Maybe the Blight will win. The God Shatter had bet too much on Fam's doing it all himself. Now it was turning down the paranoia a little. Seven weeks out from harmonious repose, less than one week from whatever waited at Tyne's world, Fam went into a multi-day fuge. Before he had been busy, a futile attempt to run handmade checks on all the automation they might need at Tyne's world. Now, Ravna couldn't even get him to eat. The nav display showed the three fleets as identified by news and Fam's intuition. The Blight's agents, the Ag Alliance for the Defense, and what was left of Sandra Kai commercial security. Deadly monsters and the remains of a victim. The Alliance still proclaimed itself with regular bulletins on the news. SJK commercial security had post posted a few terse refutations, but was mostly silent. They were unused to propaganda, or, as likely, uninterested in it. A private revenge was all that remained to commercial security. And the Blighter fleet? The news hadn't heard anything from them. Piecing together departures and lost ships, War Tracker's news group concluded that they were a wildly ad hoc assembly, whatever the Blight had controlled down here at the time of the RIP debacle. Ravden knew that the War Tracker's analysis was wrong about one thing. The Blighter fleet was not silent. Thirty times over the last weeks they had sent messages at the OOB, in scrowed maintenance format. Fam had had the ship reject the messages unread, and then worried about whether the order was really followed. 
After all, the OOB was of writer design. But now the torment in him was submerged. Pham sat for hours, staring at the display. Soon, Sandra Kai would close with the Alliance fleet. At least one of one set of villains would pay. But the Blighter fleet, and at least part of the Alliance, would survive. Maybe this fuge was just a god shatter getting desperate. Three days passed. Pham snapped out of it. Except for the new thinness in his face, he seemed more normal than he had in weeks. He asked Ravna to bring the riders up to the bridge. Pham waved at the ultra-drive traces that floated in the window. The three fleets were spread th through a rough cylinder, five light-years deep and three across. The display captured only the heart of that volume, where the fastest of the pursuers had clustered. The current position of each ship was a fleck of light trailing an unending stream of fainter lights, the ultra-drive trace left by that of the vehicle's drive. I've used red, blue, and green to mark my best guess as to the fleet affiliation of each trace. The fastest ships were collected in a blob so dense that it looked white at this scale, but with colored streamers diverging behind. There were other tags, annotations he had set, but which he admitted once to Ravna he didn't understand. The front edge of that mob, the fastest of the fast, is still gaining. Blue Shell said hesitantly, We might get a little more speed if you would grant me direct control. Not much, but... Fan's response was civil, at least. No, I'm thinking of something else, something Ravna suggested a while back. It's always been a possibility, and uh, I think the time may have come for it. Ravna moved closer to the display, stared at the green traces. Their distribution was in near agreement with what the news claimed to be the remnants of Sandra Kai commercial security, all that's left of my people. They've been trying to engage with the Alliance for a hundred hours now. Pham's glance touched hers. Yeah, he said softly. Poor bastards, they're literally the fleet from port to spare. If I were them, I'd... His expression smoothed over again. Any idea how well-armed they are? That was surely a rhetorical question, but it put the topic on the table. War Trackers thinks that Sam Drakai had been expecting something unpleasant ever since the Alliance started talking death to vermin. Commercial security was providing deep space defense. Their fleet is con converted freighters armed with locally designed weapons. War Trackers claims they weren't really a match for what the other side could field if the Alliance was willing to take some heavy casualties. Trouble is, Sandra Kai never expected the Planet Smasher attack. So when the Alliance fleet showed up, ours moved to meet it. And meantime, the KE bombs were coming straight into the heart spaces of Chandra Kai. Into my heart spaces? Yes, the Alliance must have been running those bombs for weeks. Pham Nguyen laughed shortly. If I were shipping with the Alliance fleet, I'd be a bit nervous now. They're down in numbers, and those retread freighters seem about as fast as anything here. I'll bet every pilot out of Sandra Kai is dead set on revenge. The emotion faded. Hmm. There's no way they could kill all the Alliance ships or all the Blights, much less all of both. It would be pointless to... His gaze, ab gaze abruptly focused on her. So if we leave things as they are, the Sandra Kai fleet will eventually match position with the Alliance and try to blow them out of existence. Ravna just nodded. In twelve hours or so, they say. And then... All that will be left is the Blight's own fleet on our tail, but if we could talk your people into fighting the right enemies. It was Ravna's nightmare scheme. All that was left of Sandrakai dying to save the OOB, trying to save them. There was little chance the Sandrakai fleet could destroy all the Blighter ships, but they're here to fight. Why not a vengeance that means something? That was the nightmare's message. Not somehow, now somehow it fit God Shatter's plans. There are problems. They don't know what we're doing or the purpose of the Third Fleet. Anything we shout back to them will be overheard. Ultra Wave was directional, but most of the pursuers were closely mingled. Pham nodded. Somehow we have to talk to them, and them alone. Somehow we have to persuade them to fight. Faint smile. And I think we may have just the equipment to do all that. Blue Shell, remember the night on high docks? You told us about your rotted cargo from Sandra Kai. Indeed, Sir Pham. We carried one-third of a cipher generated by SJK Commercial Security for their long-range communications. It's still in the ship's safe, though worthless without the two, uh, other two-thirds. Gram for gram, crypto materials were about the most valuable thing shipped between the stars, and once compromised, about the most valueless. Somewhere in out-of-band's cargo files, there was an SJK one-time communications pad. Part of a pad. Worthless? Maybe not. Even one-third would provide us with secure communications. Blue Shell dithered. I must not mislead you. No competent customer would accept such. Certainly, it provides secure communication, but on the other side, has no verification that you are who you claim. Pham's glance slid sideways toward Ravna. There was that smile again. If they'll listen, I think we can convince them. The hard part is, I only want one of them to hear us. Pham explained what he had in mind. The writers rustled faintly behind Pham's words. 
After all their time together, Ravna could almost get some sense of their talk, or maybe she just understood their personalities. As usual, Blue Shell was worrying about how impossible the idea was, and Greenstock was urging him to listen. But when Fan finished, the large writer did not launch into objections. Across seventy light years, ultrawave comm between ships is practical, even without our antenna swarm. We could even have live video. But you are right, the beam spread across, or the beam spread would include all the ships in the central cluster of fleets. If we could reliably identify an outlying vessel as belonging to Sandra Kai, then what you are asking might be done. That ship could use internal fleet codes to relay to the others. But in honesty, I must warn you, continued Blue Shell, brushing back Greenstock's gentle rem remonstrance. Professional communications folk would not honor your request for talk, would probably not even recognize it as such. Silly, Greenstock finally spoke, her voter voice gentle but clear. You always say things like that, except when we are talking to paying customers. Brap. <laughs> yes. Desperate times, desperate measures. I want to try it, but I fear. I want there to be no accusations of right or treachery. Sir Fam, I want you to handle this. Fam Nguyen smiled back. My thought exactly. The Aniara fleet. That's what some of the crews of commercial security were calling themselves. Aniara was the ship of an old human myth, older than Niorja, perhaps going back to the Tuvo Norsk, cooperatives in the asteroids of Earth's solar system. In the story, Aniara was a large ship launched into interstellar depths just before the death of its parent civilization. The crew watched the death agonies of the home system, and then over the following years, as their ship fell out and out into the endless dark, died themselves, their life support system slowly failing. The image was a haunting one, which was probably the reason it was known across millennia. With the destruction of Sandra Kai and the escape of commercial security, the story seemed more to, to suddenly come true. But we will not play it to the end. Group's captain, group captain Kjet Svensdat stared into the tracking display. This time the death of civilization had been a murder, and the murderers were almost within vengeance's reach. For days, Fleet HQ had been maneuvering them closer to close with the Alliance. The display showed that success was very, very near. The majority of Alliance and Sandra Kai ships were bound in a glowing ball of drive traces, which also included the third, Silent Fleet. From that display, you might think that the battle was already possible. In fact, opposing ships were passing through almost the same space, sometimes less than a billion kilometers apart, but still separated by milliseconds of time. All the vessels were on ultra drive, jumping perhaps a dozen times a second. And even here at the bottom of the beyond, that came to a measurable fraction of a light year on each jump. To fight an uncooperative enemy meant matching their jumps perfectly and flooding the common space with weapon drones. Group Captain Sven Svensendot changed the display to show ships that had exactly matched their pace with the Alliance. Almost a third of the fleet was in sync now. Another few hours and... Damnation! He slammed his display board, spin sending it spinning across the deck. The first officer retrieved the display, sent it sailing back. Is this a new damnation or the usual? Tyrol asked. It was the usual. Sorry. And he really was. Tyrol and uh, Glimfrel had their own problems. No doubt there were still pockets of humanity in the beyond, hidden from the Alliance. But of the Dirokimes, there might be no more than what was on the commercial security fleet. Except for the adventurous souls like Tyrol and Grimfell, or Glimfrel, all that was left of their kind had been dream terrains, terrains at Sandra Kai. Kjet Svensendat had started with commercial security 25 years before, back when the company had just been a small fleet of rent cops He spent thousands of hours learning to be the very best combat pilot in the organization. Only twice had he ever been in a shootout. Some might have regretted that. Svensendat and his superiors took it as the reward for being the best. His competence had won him the best fighting equipment and commercial securities fleet, culminating with the ship he commanded now. The O slash Olvira. Olvira? I don't know. It's not encoded correctly. <laughs> the O slash Olvira was purchased with part of the enormous premium that Sandra Kai paid out when the Alliance first started making threatening noises. O slash Olvira was not a rebuilt fi freighter, but a fighting machine from the keel out. The ship was equipped with the smartest processors, the smartest ultra drive that could operate at Sandra Kai's altitude in the beyond. It needed only a three-person crew, and combat could be managed by the pilot alone with his AI associates. It hold, its holds contained more than 10,000 seeker bombs, each smarter than the average freighter's entire drive unit. Quite a reward for 25 years of solid performance. They even let Svensendot name his new ship. 
And now, well, the true O slash Elvira was surely dead, along with billions of others they had been hired to protect. She had been at Hurt, the inner system. Glow bombs leave no survivors. And his beautiful ship with the same name, it had been a half-light-year-out system, seeking enemies that weren't there. In any honest battle, Kajet Svensson's dot, uh, and this O slash Elvira could have done very well. Instead, they were chasing down into the bottom of the beyond. Every light year took them further from the regions O slash Elvira was built for. Every light year, the processors worked a bit more slowly, or not at all. Down here, the converted freighters were almost in optimum design. Clumsy and stupid, with crews of dozens, but they kept on working. Already, O slash Elvira was lagging five light years behind them. It was the freighters that would make the attack on the Alliance fleet. And once again, Kajet would stand powerless while his, one of his friends died. <clears throat> For the hundredth time, Svensson's dot glared at the trace display and contemplated mutiny. There were Alliance stragglers, too. High-performance vehicles left behind the central pack, but his orders were to maintain position, to be a tactical coordinator for the fleet's swifter combatants. Well, he would do as he was hired, this one last time. But when the battle was done, when the fleet was dead, with as many of the Alliance that they could take with them, then he would think of his own revenge. Some of that depended on Tyrol and Glimfrel. Could he persuade them to leave the remnants of the Alliance fleet and ascend to the middle beyond, up where the O slash Elvira was the best of her kind? There was good evidence now about which star systems were behind the Alliance for the defense. The murderers were boasting at the news. Apparently they thought that they would bring them new support. It might also bring them visitors like O slash Elvira. The bombs in her belly could destroy worlds, though not as swiftly sure as what had been used on Sandra Kai. And even now Svensson's dots, mind, shrank from that sort of revenge. No, they would choose their targets carefully, ships coming to form new alliance fleets under protected convoys. O slash Elvira might last a long time if he always struck from ambush and never left other survivors. He stared and stared at the display, and ignored the wetness that floated at the corners of his eyes. All his life he had lived by the law. Often his job had been to stop acts of revenge and now revenge was all that life had left for him. I'm getting something peculiar, Kishet. Glimfrel was monitoring signals this watch. It was the sort of thing that would have been totally automated, and had been in O slash El Elvira's natural environment, but which now was a boring and exhausting enterprise. What, more net lies? said Tyrol. No, this is on the bearing of that bottom lugger everyone is chasing. It can't be anyone else. Svensson Dot's eyebrows rose. He turned on the mystery with enormous, scarcely realized pleasure. Characteristics? Ship's signal processor says it's probably a narrow beam. We are its only likely target. The signal is strong and the bandwidth is at least enough to support flat video. If our snarfling DSP was working right, I'd know. Frel sang a little song that was impatient humming among his kind. Yai! It's encrypted, but at a high layer. This stuff is Syntax 45 video. In fact, it claims to be using one-third of a cipher that the company made a year back. For an instant, Svensson Dot thought Frell was claiming the message itself was smart. That should be absolutely impossible here at the bottom. The second officer must have caught his look. Just sloppy language, boss. I read this out of the frame format. Something flashed on his display. Okay, here's the story on the cipher. The company made it and its peers to cover shipping security. Back before the Alliance, that had been the highest crypto level in the organization. This is the third that never got delivered. The whole was assumed compromised, but miracle of miracles, we still have a copy. Both Frell and Roll were looking at Svensson Dot expectantly, their eyes large and dark. Standard policy, standard orders, were that transmissions on compromised keys were to be ignored. If the company's signals people had been doing a proper job, the rotted cipher wouldn't even have been aboard and the policy would have enforced itself. Decrypt the thing, Svensson Dot said shortly. The last weeks had demonstrated that his company was a dis dismal failure when it came to military intelligence and signals. They might as well get some benefit from that incompetence. Yes, sir. Glim Frell tapped a single key. Somewhere inside O slash Elvira's signals processor, a long segment of random noise was broken into frames and laid precisely down on the random noise in the data frames incoming. There was a perceptible pause, damn the bottom, when the comm window lit with a flat video picture. Fourth repetition of this message. The words were Sandnorsk, in a dialect of pure hurt e sandra The speaker was, for a heart-stopping instant, he was seeing O slash Elvira again, live. He exhaled slowly, trying to relax. 
black-haired, slim, violet-eyed, just like O slash Elvira, and just like a million other women of Sandra Kai. The resemblance was there, but so vague, he, could never, he would never have been taken by it before. For an instant, he imagined a universe beyond their lost fleet, and goals beyond vengeance. Then he forced his attention back to business, to seeing everything he could in the images in the window. The woman was saying, We'll repeat three more times. If by then you have still not responded, we will attempt a different target. She pushed back from the camera pickup, giving them a view of the room behind her. It was low ceiling, deep. An ultra-drive trace display dominated the background, but Svensson Dot paid it little attention. There were two scrode riders in the background. One wore stripes on its scrode that was meant that meant a trade history with Sandra Kai. The others must be a lesser rider. Its scrode was small and wheelless. The pickup turned, centered on the fourth figure. Human? Probably, but of no Nyoran heritage. In another time, his appearance would have been the big news across all human civilizations in the beyond. Now the point only registered on Sven's and Dot's mind is another cause for suspicion. The woman continued, You can see that we are human and rider. We are the entire crew of the Out of Band 2. We are not part of the Alliance for the Defense nor Agents of the Blight, but we are here. We are the reason their fleets are down here. If you can read this, we're betting that you are of Sandra Kai. We must talk. Please reply using the tale of the pad that is decrypting this message. The picture jigged and the woman's face was back in the foreground. This is the fifth repetition of this message. She said, we'll repeat two more. Glimfrell cut the audio. If she means it, we have about 100 seconds. What next, Captain? Suddenly the O slash Elvira was not an irre irrelevant straggler. We talk, said Svensson Dot. Response and counter response took a matter of seconds. After that, five minutes of conversation with Rav Ravna Bergensdott was enough to convince Kshet that what she had to say must be heard by Fleet Central. His ship would be a mere relay, but at least he had something very important to pass on. Fleet Central refused the full video link coming from the out-of-band. Someone on the flagship was dead set on following standard procedures and using compromised cipher keys stuck in their craw. Even Kjet had to settle for a combat link. The screen showed a color image with high resolution. Looking at it carefully, one realized the thing was a poor evocation. Kajet recognized Omer, owner Lemend and Jan Skritz, her chief of staff, but they looked several years out of style. O slash Elvira was a matching old video with the transmitted animation cues. The actual communication channel was less than 4,000 bits per second. Central was taking no chances. God only knew what they were seeing as the evocation of Pham Nguyen. The smoky-skinned human had already explained his point several times. He was having as little success as Ravna Bergeston Dot before him. His cool manner had gradually deserted him. Desperation was beginning to show on his face. And I'm telling you, they are both your enemies. Sure, Alliance for the Defense destroyed Sandra Kai, but the Blight is responsible for the situation that made that possible. The half-cartoonish figure of Jan Skritz glanced over at Owner Lemend. Lord, evocations are crappy at the bottom. Svenzendot thought to himself. When Skritz spoke, his voice didn't even match his lip movements. We do read threats, Mr. Nguyen. The threat of the blight was used as an excuse to destroy our worlds. We will not go on random killing sprees, especially against an organization that is clearly the enemy of our enemy. Or are you claiming the blight is secretly in league with the Alliance for the Defense? Pham gave an angry shrug. No, I have no idea how the Blight regards the Alliance, but you should know the evil the Blight has been up to, things on a scale far grander than this Alliance. Ah, yes, that's what it says on the net, Mr. Nguyen, but those events are thousands of light years away. They've been through multiple hops and unknown interpretations before they ever arrive in the middle beyond, even if the stories were true to begin with. It is not called the net of a million lies for nothing. The stranger's face darkened. He said something loud and angry in a language that was totally unlike anything from Neorgia. The tones jumped up and down, almost like dirochime twittering. He calmed himself with visible effort, but when he continued, his sand norsk was even more heavily accented than before. Yes, but I'm telling you, I was at the fall of Relay. The blight is more than the worst horrors you've heard. The murder of Sandra Kai was its smallest side effect. Will you help us against the blighter fleet? Owner Lamend pushed her massive form against it, uh, back into her chair webbing. She looked at her chief of staff, and the two talked inaudibly. Kajet's gaze drift, drifted beyond them. The flagship's command deck extended a dozen meters behind Lamend. Under officers moved quietly about, some watching the conversation. The picture was crisp and clear, but when the figures moved, it was with cartoon-like awkwardness. And some of the faces belonged to people Kajet knew had been transferred before the fall of Sandra Kai. 
the processors here on the O slash Elvira were taking the narrowband signal from Fleet Central, flushing it out with detailed and out-of-date background, and evoking the image shown. No more evocations after this, Svensson Dot promised himself, at least while we're down here. Honor Lamend looked back at the camera. Forgive a paranoid old cop, but I think it's possible that you might be of the blight. Lamend raised her hand as if to ward off interruptions, but the redhead just gaped in surprise. If we believe you, then we must accept that there is something useful and dangerous on the star system we're all heading towards. Furthermore, we must accept that both you and the Blighter fleet are peculiarly, peculiarly qualified to take advantage of this prize. If we fight them as you ask, there will likely be few of us alive afterwards. You alone will have the prize. We fear what you might turn out to be. For a long moment, Fam Nuance was silent. The wildness slowly left his face. You have a point, Owner Lament, and a dilemma. Is there any way out? Skirt, Skritz and I have been discussing it. No matter what we do, both we and you must take big chances. It's only the alternatives that are more terrible. We are willing to accept your guidance in battle if you will first maneuver your ship back toward us and allow us to board. Give up the lead in this chase, you mean? Lamend nodded. Fam's mouth, mouth opened and closed, but no words emerged. He seemed to be having trouble breathing. Ravna said, Then if you don't succeed, everything is lost. At least now we have a sixty-hour lead. That might be enough to get the word out about this artifact, even if the Blighter fleet survives. Skrit's face twisted, a cartoonish smile. You can't have it both ways. You want us to risk everything on your assurance of competence. We are willing to die for this, but not to be pawns in a game of monsters. The last words had a strange tone, the angry delivery shading away. There had been no motion in the picture from Fleet Central except for ill-synced lip movement. Glimfrell caught Svenzendot's eye and pointed at the failure lights on his comm panel. Skrit's voice continued, and Group Captain Svenzendot, it's imperative that all further communications with this unknown vessel be channeled. The image froze, and there were no more words. Ravna, what happened? Glimfrell gave a, made a Twitter snort. We're losing the link with Fleet Central. Our effective bandwidth is down to 20 bits per second and dropping. Skrit's last transmission was scarcely a hundred bits, padded out to apparent legibility by the O-slash Elvira software. Kjet waved angrily at the screen. Cut the damn thing off. At least he wouldn't have to put up with the evocation any further. He didn't want to hear what he guessed was Jan Skritz's last order. Tyrol said, Hey, why not leave it on? We might not notice much difference. Glimfrell snickered at his brother's wit, but his long fingers danced across the comm panel, and the display came a window on the stars. The two dirochimes had a thing about, about bureaucrats. Svenzendot ignored them, and looked at the remaining comm window. The channel to Fam and Ravna had, was wideband video with scarcely any interpretation. There would be no perverse subtleties if it went down. Sorry about that. The last few days, we've had a lot of problems with comm. Apparently, this zone storm is the worst in centuries. In fact, it was getting still worse. The starboard ultra-trace displays were showing random garbage. You've lost your contact with your command? asked Ravna. For the moment, he glanced at Fan. The redhead's eyes were still a bit glassy. Look, I'm even more sorry about how things have turned out, but Lamend and Skritz are bright people. You can see their point of view. Strange, interrupted Fan. The pictures were strange. His tone was drifty. You mean our relay from Fleet Central? Svenzendot explained about the narrow bandwidth and the crummy performance of his ship's processors down here at the bottom. And so their picture of us must have been equally bad. I wonder what they thought I was. Ah, good question. Consider Fam Nguyen, bristly red hair, spoke a gray skin, sing-song voice. If cues such as those were sent, like as not the display at Fleet Central would show something quite different from the human Kijet saw. Wait a minute, that's not how evocations work. I'm sure they got a pretty clear view of you. See, a few high-resolution pics could get sent at the beginning of the session. Then those would be used as the base for the animation. Fam stared back lumpishly, almost as though he didn't buy it and was daring Kijet to think things through. Well, damn it, the explanation was correct. There was no doubt that Lamend and Skritz had seen the redhead as a human. Yet there was something here that bothered Kijet. Lamend and Skritz had both looked out of date. Glimfrell. Check the raw stream we got from Central. Did they send us any sync pictures? It took Glimfrell only seconds. He whistled, whistled a sharp tone of surprise. No, boss, and since it was all properly encrypted, our end just made do with an old ad animation. He said something to Tyrol, and the two twittered rapidly. Nothing seems to work down here. Maybe this is just another bug. But Glimfrell didn't sound very confident of the assertion. 
Svensson Dot turned back to the picture from the out of band. Look, the channel to Fleet Central was fully encrypted, using one time schemes I trust more than what we're talking with now. I can't believe it was a masquerade. But Naza was creeping up Kijet's guts. This was like the first minutes of the battle for Shanjo Kai, when he guessed how thoroughly they had been outmaneuvered, when he realized that everyone he was trying to protect would be murdered. Hey, we'll contact other vessels. We'll verify Central's location. Pham Nguyen raised an eyebrow. Maybe it wasn't a masquerade. Before he could say more, one of the riders, the one with the greater scrode, was shouting at them. It rolled across the room's apparent ceiling, pushing the humans aside to get close to the camera. I have a question. The voter's speech was burred, nearly unintelligible. The creature's tendrils rattled dryly against each other, as distressed as Kjet Svensson Dot had ever heard. My question, are there scrode riders aboard your fleet's command vessel? Why do you... Answer the question. How should I know? Kjet tried to think. Tyrol, you have friends on Skrit's staff. Are there any riders, riders aboard? Tyrol stuttered a few bars. Ah, 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 ah. Yes. Emergency hires. Rescues, actually. Right after the battle. That's the best we can do, friend. The scrode rider trembled, unspeaking. Then its tendrils seemed to wilt. Thank you, it said softly. It rolled back and out of camera range. Fam Nguyen disappeared from view. Ravna looked wildly around. Wait, please, she said to the camera, and Kajet was looking at the abandoned command deck of the out-of-band. At the limit of the pickup's hearing came sounds of mumbled conversation, voter and human. And then she was back. What was that all about? Svensson dot to Ravna. Nothing any of us can help anymore. Captain Svensson dot, it looks to me like your fleet is no longer run by the people you think. Maybe. Probably. It's something I've got to think about. She nodded. For a moment they looked at each other, unspeaking. So strange, so far from home, and after all the heartbreak, to see someone so familiar. You were truly at Relay? The question sounded stupid at his, in his ears. Yet in a way she was a bridge from what he knew, and trusted to the deadly weirdness of the present situation. Ravna Bergson's dot nodded. Yes, and it was like everything you've read. We even had direct contact with a power, and yet it was not enough, group captain. The blight destroyed it all. That part of the news is no lie. Tyrol pushed back from his nav station. Then how can anything you do down here hurt the blight? The words were blunt, but Roll's eyes were wide and serious. In fact, he was pleading for some sense behind all the death. Dairokimes had not been the greatest part of the Sandrakai civilization, but they had been by far its oldest member race. A million years ago they had burst out of the slow zone, colonizing the three systems that humans one day would call Sandrakai. Long before the humans arrived, they were a race of inward dreamers. They protected their star systems with ancient automation and friendly younger races. Another half-million years and their race might be gone from the beyond, extinct, or evolved into something else. It was a common pattern, something like death in old age, but gentler. There is a common misconception about such uh, senescent races, that their members are senescent too. In any large population there will be variation. There will always be those who want to see the, out wide, who want to see the outside world and play there for a while. Humankind had gone on very well with the likes of Grim Frell and Tyrol, and Bergen's dot seemed to understand. Have any of you heard of God Shatter? Kjet said, no, then noticed that both Dairokimes had started. They whistled at each other for several seconds in some kind of surprised dialect. Yes, Roll spoke at last in Sam Norsk, his voice as close to awe as Kjet had ever heard. You know we Dairokimes have been in the beyond for a long time. We've sent many colonies into the transcend. Some became powers, and once, something came back. It wasn't a power, of course. In fact, it was more like a mind-crippled dirokime. But it knew things, and did things that made great changes for us. Fentrolar? Kshet asked wonderingly, suddenly recognizing the story. It had happened 100,000 years before humankind arrived at Sandrakai, yet it was a central contradiction of the dirokime terrains. Yes, Tyrol said. Even now people don't agree if Fentrolar was a gift or a curse, but he founded the dream habitats of the old religion. Ravna nodded. That's the case most familiar to us of Sandra Kai. Maybe it's not a happy example considering all its effects. And she told them about the fall of Relay, what had happened to Old Zone, and what had become of Fam Nguyen. The Dairokheim's side chat dwindled to zero, and they were very still. Finally, Kajet said, So what does Nu- He stumbled over the name, as strange as everything else about the fellow. Nguyen know about the thing you seek at the bottom. What can he do with it? I don't know, group captain. Fam Nguyen himself doesn't know. A little bit at a time, the insight comes. I believe, because I was there for some of it, but I don't know how to make you believe. She drew a shuddering breath. 
Gajet suddenly guessed what a strange, tortured place the out of band must be. Somehow that made the story more credible. Anything that really could destroy the blight would be unwholesomely t weird. Gajet wondered how he could, would do, locked up with such a thing. My Lady Ravna, he said, the words stilted, stilted and formal. After all, I'm suggesting treason. I, uh, I've got a number of friends in the commercial security fleet. I can check on the suspicions you've raised and... Say it. It's possible we can give you support in spite of my HQ. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Glimfrell broke the silence. We're getting a poor signal on the out-of-bands channel now. Kajet eyes swept the windows. All the ultra-trace displays looked like random noise. Whatever the storm was, it was bad. Looks like we won't be talking much longer, Ravna Bergenstadt. Yes, we're losing signal. Group captain, if none of this works, if you can't fight for us, your people are all that's left of Sandra Kai. It's been a good to see you in the Dairo Kimes. After so long to see familiar faces, people I really understand, I... As she spoke, her image square blurred into low-frequency components. Hui, said Glimfrell. Bandwidth just dropped through the floor. There was nothing sophisticated about their link to the out-of-band. Given communications problems, the ship's processors just switched to low-rate coding. Hello, out of band. We've got problems on this channel now. Suggest we sign off. The window turned gray, and printed Samnorsk flickered across it. Yes, it is more than a communicate. Glimfreld diddled his comm panel. Zip, zero, he said. No detectable signal. Tyrol looked up from his navigation tank. This is a lot more than a communications problem. Our computers haven't been able to commit on an ultra drive jump in more than 20 seconds. They had been doing five jumps a second, and just over a light year per hour, now. Glimfrell leaned back from his panel. Hey, so welcome to the slow zone. The slow zone. Ravna Bergenstadt looked across the deck of the out-of-band two. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she had always had a vision of the slowness as a stifling darkness lit at best by torches, the domains of cretins, and mechanical calculators. In fact, things didn't look much different from before. The ceilings and walls glowed just as before. The stars sh still shone through the windows, only now it might be a very long time before any of them moved. It was on the OOB's other displays that the change was most obvious. The Ultra Trace tank blinked monotonously, a red legend displaying elapsed time since the last update. Navigation windows were filled with output from the diagnostics exercising the drive processors. An, an audible message in Trisquillen was repeating over and over. Warning. Transition to slowness detected. Execute back jump at once. Warning. Transition to slowness detected. Execute. Turn that off. Ravna grappled a saddle, grabbed a saddle and strapped herself down. She was actually feeling dizzy, though that could only be a very natural panic. Some bottom lugger this is. We run right into the slow zone and all I can do is spout warnings after the fact. Greenstock drifted closer, tiptoeing off the ceiling with her tendrils. Even bottom luggers can't avoid things like this, my lady Ravna. Fam said something at the ship, and most of the displays cleared. Blue shell. Even a huge zone storm doesn't normally extend more than a few light years. We were 200 light years above the zone boundary. What hit us must be a monster surge, the sort of thing you only read about in archives. Small consolation. We knew something like this could happen, Fam said. Things have been getting awfully rough for the last few weeks. For a change, he didn't seem too upset. Yes, she said. We expected a slowing, maybe, but not the slowness. We are trapped. Where's the nearest habitable system? Ten light years? Fifty? The vision of darkness had a new reality, and the starscape beyond the ship's walls was no longer a friendly, steadying thing. Surrounded by unending nothingness, moving at some vanishing fraction of the speed of light, entombed. All the courage of Kajet Svenzendat and his fleet for nothing. Jeffrey Olsendat forever unrescued. Fam's hand touched her shoulder, the first touch in days. We can still make it to the Tyne's world. This is a bottom lugger, remember? We're not trapped. Hell, the ram scoop on this is buggy. Uh, on this buggy is better than anything I ever had on the Chang Ho, and I thought I was the freest man in the universe back then. Decades of travel time, mostly in cold sleep. Such had been the world of the Chang Ho, the world of Fam's memories. Ravna let out a shuddering breath, and, and that ended in weak laughter. For Fam, the terrible pressure pressure was abated, at least temporarily. He could be human. What's so funny? said Fam. She shook her head. All of us. Never mind. She took a couple of slow breaths. 
Okay, I think I can make rational conversation. So the zone is surged. Something that normally takes a thousand years, even in a storm, to move a single light year, has suddenly shifted two hundred. Huh. There'll be a m people a million years from now reading about this in the archives. I'm not sure I want the honor. We knew there was a storm, but I never expected to be drowned. Buried light years deep beneath the sea. The sea storm analogy is not perfect, said Blue Shell. The scrode rider was still in on the far side of the deck, where he had retreated after questioning the Sandra Kai captain. He still looked upset, though he was back to sounding precise and picky. Blue Shell was studying a nav display, evidently a recording from right before the surge. He dumped the picture to a display flat and rolled slowly across the ceiling toward them. Greenstock's fronds brushed him gently as he passed. He sailed the display flat into Ravna's hands and continued in a lecturing tone. Even in a sea storm, the water's surface is never as roiled as in a big interference disturbance. The most recent news reports showed it as a fractal surface with dimension close to three, like foam and spray. Even he could not avoid the storm analogy. The starscapes hung serene beyond crystal walls, and the loudest sound was a faint breeze from the ship's ventilators. Yet they had been swallowed in the maelstrom. Blue Shell waved a frond at the display flat. We could be back in the beyond in a few hours. What? See. The plane of the display is determined by the positions in the supposed Chandra Kai command vessel, the outlying, outflying craft that we contacted directly, and ourselves. The three formed a narrow triangle, the Lemend and Svenzendot vertices close together. I've marked the times that contact was lost with other, the others. Notice, the link to commercial security HQ went down 150 seconds before we were hit. From the incoming signal and its requests for prot protocol changes, I believe that both we and the outflyer were enveloped at just about the same time. Fam nodded. Yeah, the most distant sites losing contact last. That must mean the surge moved in from there, from the side. Exactly. From his perch on the ceiling, Blue Shell reached to tap the display. The three ships were like probes in the standard zone mapping technique. Replaying the trace displays will no doubt confirm the conclusion. Ravna looked at the plot. The long point of the triangle, tipped by the OOB, pointed almost directly toward the heart of the galaxy. It must have been a huge, cliff-like thing perpendicular to the rest of the surface. A monster wave sweeping sideways, said Greenstock, and that's also why it won't last long. Yes, it's the radial changes that are most often long-term. This thing must have been a trailing edge. We should pass through it in a few hours, and back into the beyond. So there was still a race to be won or lost. The first few hours were strange. A few hours had been Blue Shell's estimate of when they would be back in the beyond. They hung around the bridge, alternately watching the clock and stowing, stewing about the strange conversations just completed. Fam was building himself back to triggered tension. Any time now, they would be back in the beyond. What to do then? If only a few ships were perverted, perhaps Svensendot could still coordinate an attack. Would that do any good? Fan played the Ultra tra Trace recordings over and over, studying every detectable ship in, in all the fleets. But when we get out, we get out. I'll know what to do. Not why I must do it, but what. And he couldn't explain more. Any time now. There was scarcely any reason to do much about resetting equipment that would need another initialization right away. But after eight hours... It really could be longer, even a day. They had been scrounging around in the historical literature. Maybe we should do a little housekeeping. The Out of Band 2 had been designed for both the beyond and the slowness, but that second environment was regarded as an unlikely emergency one. There were special purpose processors for the slow zone, but they hadn't come up automatically. With Blue Shell's advice, Fan took high performance automation offline, but that wasn't that wasn't too difficult, except for a couple of voice-actuated independents that were no longer bright enough to understand the quitting commands. Using the new automation gave Ravna a chill that, in a subtle way, was almost as frightening as the original loss of the Ultra Drive. Her image of the slow slowness as darkness in torchlight, that was just a nightmare fantasy. On the other hand, the slowness as the domain of cretins and mechanical calculators, there was something to that. The OOB's performance had degraded steadily during their voyage to the bottom, but now... Gone were the voice-driven jack graphics generators. They were just a bit too complex to be supported by the new OOB, at least in full interpretive mode. Gone were the intelligent context analyzers that made the ship's library almost as accessible as one's own memories. Eventually, Ravna even turned off the art and music units. Without mood and context response, they seemed so wooden, constant reminders that there were no brains behind them. Even the simplest things were corrupted. Take voice and gesture controls. They no longer responded consistently to sarcasm and casual slang. It took a certain discipline to use them effectively. 
Fan actually seemed to like this. It reminded him of the Cheng Ho. Twenty hours. Fifty. Everyone was still telling each other there was nothing to worry about, but now Blue Shell said that talk of hours had been unrealistic. Considering the height of the tsunami, at least two hundred light years, it would likely be several hundred light years across. Then, in keeping with the scaling laws of historical precedent, there was only one trouble with this reasoning. They were beyond all precedent. For the most part, zone boundaries followed the galactic mean density. There was virtually no change from year to year, just the eons long shrinkage that might someday, after the death of all but the smallest st stars, expose the galactic core to the beyond. At any given time, perhaps one billionth of that boundary might qualify as being in a storm state. In an ordinary storm, the surface might move in or out a light year in a decade or so. Such storms were common enough to affect the fortunes of many worlds every year. Much rarer, perhaps once in a hundred thousand years in the whole galaxy, there would be a storm where the boundary became seriously distorted, and where surges might move at a high multiple of light speed. These were the transverse surges that Fam and Blue Shell made their scale estimates from. The fastest moved at about a light year per second, across a distance of less than three lights. The largest were thirty light years high and moved at scarcely a light year per day. So what was known of monsters like the thing that had engulfed them? Not much. Third-hand stories in the ship's library told of surges perhaps as big as theirs, but the quoted dimensions and propagation rates were not clear. Stories more than a hundred million years old are hard to trust. There are scarcely any intermediate languages, and even if there were, it wouldn't have helped. The dumb, new version of the OOB absolutely could not do mechanical translation of natural languages. Judging the library was pointless. When Ravna complained about this to Fam, he said, Things could be worse. What was the Ur partition, really? Five billion years ago. No one's sure. Fam jerked a thumb at his library display. Some people think it was a super, super surge, you know. Something so big it swallowed the races that might have recorded it. Sometimes the biggest disasters aren't noticed at all. No one's around to write horror stories. Great. I'm sorry, Ravna. Honestly, if we're in anything like the most past disasters, we'll come out of it in another day or two. The best thing is to plan for things that way. This is like a time out in the battle. Take advantage of it to have a little peace. Figure out how to get the unperverted parts of commercial security to help us. Yeah. Depending on the shape of the surge's tailing edge, the OOB might have lost a good part of its lead, but I'll bet the Alliance fleet is completely panicked by all this. Such opportunists would likely run for safety as soon as they're back in the beyond. The advice kept her busy for another twenty hours, fighting with the half-witted things that claimed to be strategy planners on the new version of the OOB. Even if the surge passed right this instant, it might be too late. There were players in this game for whom the surge was not a timeout. Jeffrey Olsen Dodd and his Tynish allies. It had been seventy hours now since their last contact. Ravna had missed the three comm sessions with them. If she were panicked, uh, what must be like for Jeffrey? Even if Steel could hold off his enemies, time and trust would be running out at Tyne's world. One hundred hours into the surge, Ravna noticed that Blue Shell and Fam were doing power tests on the OOB's ram scoop drive. Some timeouts last forever. Chapter 34 The summer hot spell broke for a time. In fact, it was almost chilly. There was still the smoke and the air was still dry, but the wind seemed less driven. Inside their cubby aboard the ship, Amdi Jeffrey weren't taking much notice of the nice weather. They've been slow in answering before, said Amdi. She's explained how the ultra wave. Ravna's never been this late. Not since the winter, anyway. Jeffrey's tone hovered between fear and petulance. In fact, there was supposed to be a transmission in the middle of the night, technical data for them to pass on to Mr. Steele. It hadn't arrived by this morning, and now Ravna had also missed their afternoon session, the time when normally they would just chat for a bit. The two children reviewed all the comm settings. The previous fall, they had laboriously copied those in the first-level diagnostics. It all looked the same now, except for something called the carrier detect. If only they had a data set, they might have looked up what, they, what that meant. They had even very carefully reset some of the comm parameters, and then nervously set them back when nothing happened. Maybe they hadn't given the changes enough of a chance to work. Maybe now they had really messed something up. They stayed in the command cubby all through the afternoon, their minds cycling uh, through fear and boredom and frustration. After four hours, boredom had at least a temporary victory. Jeffrey was napping uneasily in his father's hammock, with two of Amdi curled up in his arms. Amdi poked idly around the room and looked at the rocket controls. No, not even his self-confidence was up to playing with those. Another of him jerked at the wall, quilting. He would always watch the fungus grow for a while, 
things that were slow. Actually, the gray stuff had spread a lot further than the last time you looked. Behind the quilt, it was quite thick. He sent a chain of himself squirreling back between the wall and the fabric. It was dark, but some light spilled through the gap at the ceiling. In most places, the mold was scarcely an inch thick, but back here it was five or six. Wow. Just above his exploring nose, a huge lump of it grew through the wall. This was as big as some of the ornamental moss that decorated castle meeting halls. Slender gray filaments grew down, grew down from the fungus. He almost called out to Geoffrey, but the two of him in the hammock were so comfortable. He brought a couple more heads close to the strangeness. The wall behind it looked a little odd, too, as though part of its substance had been taken by the mold. And the gray itself, like smoke, he felt the filaments in his nose. They were solid, dry. His nose tickled. Amdi froze in shocked surprise. Watching himself from behind, he saw that two of the filaments had actually passed through his member's head. And yet there was no pain, just that tickling feeling. What? What? Jeffrey had been jostled into wakefulness as Amdi tensed around him. I found something really strange behind the quilts. I touched this big hunk of fungus and... As he spoke, Amdi gently backed away from the thing on the wall. The touch didn't hurt, but it made him more nervous than curious. He felt the filaments sliding slowly out. I told you, you aren't supposed to play with that stuff. It's dirty. The only good thing is, it doesn't smell. Jeffrey was out of the hammock. He stepped across the cubby and lifted the quilting. Amdi's tip member lost its balance and jerked away from the fungus. There was a snapping sound and a sharp pain in his lip. Jeez, that thing is big. Then hearing Amdi's pain whistle. You okay? Amdi backed away from the wall. I think so. The tip of one last filament was still stuck in his lip. It didn't hurt as much as the nettles he'd sampled a few days earlier. Amdi Jeffrey looked over the wound. What was left of the smoky spine seemed hard and brittle. Jeffrey's fingers quickly, gently worked it free. Then the two of them turned to wonder at the thing in the wall. It really has spread. Looks like it's hurt the wall, too. Amdi dabbed his bloodied muzzle. Yeah, I see why your folks told you to stay away from it. Maybe we should have Mr. Steele scrub it all out. The last two spent a half an hour crawling around behind all the quilting. The grayness had spread far, but there was only the ma marvelous, only the one marvelous flowering. They came back to stare at it, even sticking articles of clothing into the wisps. Neither risked fingers or noses on further contact. Staring at the fungus on the wall was by far the most exciting thing that happened that afternoon. There was no message from the OOB. The next day, the hot weather was back. Two more days passed, and still there was no word from Ravna. Lord Steele placed the walls atop Starship Hill. It was near the middle of the night, and the sun hung around, or about fifteen degrees above the northern horizon. Sweat filmed his fur. This was the warmest summer in ten years. The dry wind was into its thir thirtieth day around. It was no longer a welcome break in the chill of the Northland. The crops were dying in the fields. Smoke from fjord fires was visible as brownish haze both north and south of the castle. At first, the reddish color had been a novelty, a welcome change from the unending blue sky and distance, and the whitish haze of the sea fogs. Only at first, when fire struck East Streamsdale, the entire sky had been dipped in red. Ash had drained all the day round, and the only smell had been that of burning. Some said it was worse than the filthy air of the southern cities. The troops on the walls backed far out of his way. There was more, this was more than a courtesy, more than their fear of steel. His troops were still not used to the cloaked ones, and the cover story Shrek was spreading did nothing to ease their minds. Lord Steele was accompanied by a singleton, in the colors of a lord. The creature made no mind sounds. It walked incredibly close to its master. Steele said to the singleton, Success is a matter of meeting a schedule. I remember you teaching me that. Cutting it into me, in fact. The member looked back at him, cocked its head. As I remember, I said that success was a matter of adapting to changes in schedules. The words were perfectly articulated. There were singletons that could talk that well, but even the most verbal could not carry on intelligent conversation. Shrek had no trouble convincing the troops that Flenzer Science had created a race of super packs, that the cloaked ones were individually as smart as any ordinary pack. It was a good cover for what the cloaks really were. It both inspired fear and obscured the truth. The member stepped a little closer, nearer to steel than anyone had been, except during murders and rapes and the beatings of the past. Involuntarily, Steele li licked his lips and spread out from around the threat. Yet in some ways, the dark cloaked one was like a corpse, without a trace of mind sound. Steele snapped his jaws shut and said, Yes, the genius isn't winning, even when the schedules have fallen down the guard robe. 
He looked all the way from the Flenser member and scanned the red-shrouded southern horizon. What's the latest estimate of Ward Carver's progress? He's still camped about five days southeast of here. The damned incompetent. It's hard to believe she's your parent. Vendacious made things so easy for her. Her soldiers and toy cannon should have been here almost a ten-day pass, and been well butchered on schedule. Yes, long before our sky friends arrived. Instead, she wanders inland and then balks. The Flenser member shrugged in its dark cloak. Steele knew the radio was as heavy as it looked. It consoled him that the other was play paying a price for his omniscience. Just think, in heat like this, to have every part of oneself muffled to the tympana. He could imagine the discomfort. Indoors, he could smell it. They walked past one of the wall cannon. The barrel gleamed of a layered material, or metal. The thing had thrice the range of Woodcarver's pitiful invention. While Woodcarver had been working with a data set and a human child's intuition, he had had the direct advice of Ravna and company. At first, he'd feared their largesse, thinking it meant that visitors were superior beyond need for care. Now, the more he heard of Ravna and the others, the more he clearly he understood their weakness. They could not experiment with themselves, improve themselves, inflexible, slow-changing dullards. Sometimes they showed a low cunning, Ravna's coyness about what she wanted from the first starship, but their desperation was loud in all their messages, and that was their attachment to the human child. Everything had been going so well to do till just a few days ago. As they walked out of earshot of the gunner pack, Steele said to the Flenser member, It's still no word from our rescuers. Quite so. That was the other botched schedule, the important one, which they could not control. Ravna has miss missed four sessions. Two of me is down with Amdi Jeffrey right now. The singleton jabbed its snout towards the dome of the inner keep. The gesture was an awkward abortion. Without other muzzles and other eyes, spotty language was a limited thing. We just aren't built to wander around a piece here, a piece there. Another few minutes and the space folk will have missed a fifth talk session. The children are getting desperate, you know. The member's voice sounded sympathetic. Almost unconsciously, Lord Steele sidled a little farther out from around it. Steele remembered that tone from his own early existence. He also remembered the cutting and death that had always followed. I want them kept happy, Tyrathect. We're assuming communication will resume. When it does, we'll need them. Steele bared six pairs of claws at the surrounded singleton. None of your old tricks. The member flinched, an almost imperceptible twitch that pleased Steele more than the groveling of ten thousand. Of course not. I'm just saying that you should visit them. Try to help them with their fear. You do it. Ah, they don't fully trust me. I've told you before, Steele. They love you. Ha, ah, and they've seen through to your meanness, hey? The situation made Steele proud. He had succeeded where Flenser's own methods would have failed. He had manipulated without threats or pain. It had been the Steele's craziest experiment, and certainly his most profitable. But, look, I don't have time to wet nurse anymore. It's a tiresome thing to talk to those two. And it was very tiresome to hold his temper, to suffer Geoffrey's petting and Amdi's pranks. In the beginning, Steele had insisted that none, no one else have close contact with the children. They were too important to expose to others. The most casual slip-up might show them the truth and ruin them. Even now, Tyrathect was the only pack besides himself who had regular contact. But for Steele, every meeting was worse than the last, an ultimate test of his self-control. It was hard to think straight, in a killing rage. And that's how almost every conversation with them ended for Steele. How, wonder it, how wonderful it would be when the space folk landed. Then he could use their other end of the tool that was Andy Jeffrey. Then there would be no need to have their trust and friendship. Then he would have a lever, something to torture and kill to enforce his demands. Of course, if the aliens never landed, or if... We must do something. I will not be flotsam on this wave of future. Steel lashed at the scaffolding that ran along the inner side of the parapet, shredding the wood with his gleaming tines. We can't do anything about the aliens, so let's deal with Woodcarver. Yes. He smiled at the Flenser member. Ironic, isn't it? For a hundred years you sought her destruction. Now I can succeed. What would have been your great triumph is for me just an annoying detour, undertaken because greater projects have are temporarily delayed. The cloaked one did not look impressed. There is a little matter of gifts falling out of the sky. Yes, into my open jaws. And that is my good fortune, isn't it? He walked on several paces, chucking to himself, chuckling to himself. Yes, it's time to have Vendacious bring his trusting queen in for the slaughter. Maybe it will interfere with other events, but I know, we'll have the battle east of here. The Magrim climb? Correct. 
Woodcarver's forces should be well concentrated, coming up the defile. We'll move our cannon over there, set them behind the ridge line at the top of the climb. It will be very easy to destroy all of her people. And it's far enough from Starship Hill. Even if the space folk arrive at the same time, we can keep the two projects separate. The singleton didn't say anything, and after a moment, Steel glared at him. Yes, dear teacher, I know there is a risk. I know it splits our forces, but we've got an army sitting on our doorstep, and they've arrived inconveniently late. But even Vendatius can't make them turn around and go home. And if he tries to stall things, the queen might... Can you predict just what she would do? No. She has always had a way with the unexpected. She might even see through Vendatius's fraud. So, we take a small chance and destroy her now. You are with Far Scout Rengolith? Yes, two of me. Tell him to get the word to Vendatius. He is to have the Queen's army coming up Magrim Climb not less than two days from now. Feel free to elaborate. You know the region better than I. We'll work out the final details when both sides are in position. It was a wonderful thing to be the effective commander of both sides in a battle. One more thing. It's important, and Vendatius must see to it within the day around. I want Woodcarver, Woodcarver's human dead. What harm can she do? That's a stupid question, especially coming from you. We don't know when Ravna and Fan may reach us. Till we have them safe in our jaws, the Joanna creature is a dangerous thing to have nearby. Tell Vendatius to make it look like an accident, but I want that two legs dead. Flenzer was everywhere. It was a form of godhood he'd dreamed of since he was Woodcarver's newbie. While one of him talked to Steel, two others lounged about the starship with M.D. Jeffrey, with two more padded through light forests just north of Woodcarver's encampment. Paradise can also be an agony, and each day the torment was a little harder to bear. In the first place, the summer was as insufferably hot as any in the north, and the radio cloaks were, merely, were not merely hot and heavy. They necessarily covered the members' tympana, and unlike other uncomfortable costumes, the price of taking these off for even a moment was mindlessness. His first trials had lasted just an hour or two. Then had come a five-day expedition with Far Scout Rangolith, providing Steel with instant information and instant command of the country around Starship Hill. It had taken a couple of day arounds to recover from the sores and aches of the radio cloaks. This latest exercise in omniscience has lasted twelve days. Wearing the cloaks all the time was impossible. Every day in rotation, one of his members threw off its radio, was bathed, and had its cloak liner changed. It was Flenzer's hour of daily madness, when sometimes the weak-willed Tyrethect would come back to mind, vainly trying to re-establish her dominance. It didn't matter. With one of his members disconnected, the remaining pack was only four. There are four sums of normal intelligence, but none existed in Flenzer slash Tyrethect. The bathing and recloaking were all done in a confused haze. And of course, even though Flenzer was everywhere at once, he wasn't any smarter than before. After the first jarring experiments, he got the hang of seeing slash hearing scenes that were radically different, but it was as difficult as ever to carry on multiple conversations. When he was bantering with Steel, his other members had very little to say to M.D. Jeffrey or to Rangolith's scout. Lord Steel was done with him. Flenzer walked along the parapets with his former student, but if Steel had anything to say to him, had said anything to him, it would have taken him away from his current conversation. Flenzer smiled, carefully so the one with Steel would not show it. Steel thought he was talking to Far Scout Rangolith just now. Oh, he would do that in a few minute, minutes. One advantage of his situation was that no one could know for sure everything Flenzer was up to. If he was careful, he would eventually rule here again. It was a dangerous game, and the cloaks were themselves dangerous devices. Keep a cloak out of sunlight for a few hours and it lost power, and the member wearing it was cut off from the pack. Worse was the problem of static. That was a mantis word. The second set of cloaks had killed its user, and the spacers weren't sure of the cause, except that it was some sort of interference problem. Flenzer had experienced nothing so extreme, but sometimes on his farthest hikes with Rangolith, or when a cloak's power faded, there was an incredible shrieking in his mind, like a dozen packs crowding close, sounds that scaled between sex madness and killing frenzy. Tyrethect seemed to like times like that. She'd come out, she'd come bounding out of the confusion, swamping him with her soft hate. Normally, she lurked around edges of his consciousness, tweaking a word here, a motive there. After the static, she was much worse. On one occasion, she'd held control for almost a day around. Given a year without crises, Flenzer could have studied Ty and Ra and Thecht and done a proper excision. Thecht, the member with the white-tipped ears, was probably the one to kill. It wasn't bright, but it was like the, the capstone of the trio. With a precisely crafted replacement, 
Flenser might be even greater than before the massacre at Parliament Bowl. But for now, Flenser was stuck. Soul surgery on oneself was an awesome challenge, even to the master. So, careful, careful. Keep the cloaks well charged, take no long trips, and don't let any one person see all the threads of your plan. While Steele thought he was seeking Rangelith, Flenser was talking to Amdi and Geoffrey. The human's face was wet with tears. Four times we've missed Ravna. What has happened to her? His voice screeched up. Flenser hadn't realized there was such flexibility in the belching mechanism that humans use to make sound. Most of Amdi clustered round the boy. He licked Geoffrey's cheeks. It could be our ultrawave. Maybe it's broken. He looked beseechingly at Flenser. There were tears in the puppy's eyes, too. Tyrethect, please ask, ask Steele again. Let us stay in the ship all the day around. Maybe there are messages that have come through and have not been recorded. Flenser with Steele descended the northern stairs, crossed the parade ground. He gave a sliver of attention to the other's complaints about the sloppy maintenance around the practice stands. At least Steele was smart enough to keep the disciplined scaffolds over on Hidden Island. Flenser with Rangelith's troopers splashed through a mountain stream. Even in high summer, in the middle of a dry wind, there were, little, there were still snow patches, and the streams running from under them were icy cold. Flenser and Amdi, with Amdi Jeffrey edged forward, let two of Amdi rest against his sides. Both children liked physical contact, and he was the only one that they had besides each other. It was all perversion, of course, but Flenser had based his life on manipulating others' weakness and, but for the pain, welcomed it. Flenser buzzed a deep purring sound through his shoulders, caressing the puppy next to him. I'll ask our Lord Steel the very next time I see him. Thank you, the puppy nuzzled at his cloak, and then mercifully moved away. Flenser was a mass of sores beneath that cover. Perhaps Anby realized that, or perhaps, more and more, Flenders, Flenser saw a uh, reticence in the children. His comment to Steele had been a slip into the truth. These two really didn't trust him. That was Tyrethect's fault. On his own, Flenser would have no trouble winning Amdi Jeffrey's love. Flenser had none of Steele's killing temper and fragile dignity. Flenser could chat for casual pleasure, all the while mixing truth with lies. One of the greatest talent one of his greatest talents was empathy. No sadist can aspire to perfection without that diagnostic ability. But just when he was doing well, when they seemed about open to him, about too open to him, then Ty or Ra or Thekt would pop up, twisting his expression or poisoning his choice of phrase. Perhaps he should content himself with undermining the children's respect for Steel, without, of course, ever saying anything directly against him. Flenser sighed and patted Geoffrey's arm comfortingly. Ravna will be back, I'm sure of it. The human sniffled a little, then reached out to pet the part of Flenser's head that was not shrouded by the cloak. They sat in companionable silence for a moment, and his attention drifted back to the forest and Rangelith's troops. The group had been moving uphill for almost ten minutes. The others were lightly burdened and used to this, short of, this sort of exercise. Flenser's two members were lagging. He hissed at the group leader. The group leader sidled back, his squad shifting briskly out of his way. He stopped when his nearest was fifteen feet from Flenser's. The soldiers' heads cocked this way and that. Your wishes, my lord? This one was new. He had been briefed about the cloaks, but Flenser knew the fellow didn't understand the new rules. The gold and silver that glinted in the darkness of the cloaks, those colors were reserved for the lords of the domain. Yet there are only, there are only two of Flenser here. Normally such a fragment could barely carry on a conversation, much less give reasonable orders. Just as disconcerting, Flenser knew, was his lack of mind sound. Zombie was the word some of the troops used when they thought they, themselves alone. Flenser pointed up the hill. The timber line was only a few yards away. Far Scout Rangelith is on the other side. We will take a shortcut, he said weakly. Part of the other was already looking up the hill. That is not good, sir, the trooper spoke slowly. Stupid damn duo, his posture said. The bad ones will see us. Flenser glowered at the other, a hard thing to do properly when you are just two. Soldier, do you see the gold on my shoulders? Every one of me is worth all of you. If I say take a shortcut, we do it, even if it means walking belly deep through brimstone. Actually, Flenser knew exactly where Vendacious had put lookouts. There was no risk in crossing the open ground here, and he was so tired. The group leader still didn't know quite what Flenser was, but he saw the dark cloaks were at least as dangerous as any full pack lord. He backed off humbly, bellies dragging on the ground. The group turned uphill, and a few minutes later were walking across open heather. Rengelith's command post was less than half a mile away along his path. Flenser with steel walked into the inner keep. The stone was freshly cut, 
the walls thrown up with the feverish speed of all this castle's construction. Thirty feet over their heads were vaultimate buttresses. There were small holes set in the stonework. Those holes would soon be filled with gunpowder, as would slots in the wall surrounding the landing field. Steele called those the jaws of welcome. Now he turned a head back to Flenzer. So what does Rengeleth say? Sorry, he's out on patrol. He should be here. I mean, he should be in the camp any minute. Flenzer did his best to conceal his own trips with the scouts. Such recons were not forbidden, but Steele would have demanded explanations if he knew. Flenzer with Rengeleth's troops sloshed through water-soaked heather. The air over the snowmelt was delightfully chill, and the breeze pushed cool tongues partway under his wretched cloaks. Rengeleth had chosen the site for his command post as well. His tents were in a slight depression at the edge of a large summer pond. A hundred yards away, a huge patch of a snow covered the hill. Above them and fed the pond, and kept the air pleasantly cool. The tents were out of sight from below, yet the sight was so high in the hills that from the edge of the depression there was a clear view across three points of the compass, centered on the south. Resupply could be accomplished from the north with little chance of detection, and even if the dam fires struck the forest below, this post would be untouched. Far scout Rangelith was lounging about his signal mirrors, oiling the aiming gears. One of his subordinates lay with snout stuck over the lip of the hill, scanning the landscape with its telescopes. He came to attention at the sight of Flenzer, but his gaze wasn't full of fear. Like most long-range scouts, he wasn't completely terrorized by castle politics. Besides, Flunder had cultivated an us-against-the-prigs relationship with the fellow. Now Rangelith growled at the group leader. The next time you come prancing across in the open like that, your asses go on report. My fault, Far Scout, put in Flenzer. I have some important news. They walked away from the others, down toward Rangelith's tent. See something interesting, did you? Rangelith was smiling oddly. He had long ago figured out that Flenzer was not a brilliant duo, but part of a pack with members back at the castle. When is your next session with Cradleheads? That was the field name for Vendacious. Just past noon. We haven't missed in four days. Or he hasn't missed in four days. The southerners seem to be on one big squat. That will change. Flenzer repeated Steele's orders for Vendacious. The words came hard. The traitor within him was restive. He felt the beginnings of a major attack. Wow, you're going to move everything over to Margum Climb in less than two. Never mind, that's something I'd best not know. Under his cloaks, Flenzer bristled. There are limits to chumminess. Rengeleth had his points, but maybe after all this was over he could be smoothed into something less. Ad hoc. Is that all, my lord? Yes. No. Flenzer shivered with uncharacteristic puzzlement. The trouble with these cloaks, sometimes they made it hard to remember things. By the great pack, no. It was that Tyrathect again. Steel had ordered the killing of Woodcarver's human, all things considered a perfectly sensible move, but... Flunzer with steel to shook his head angrily, his teeth clicking together. Something the matter? said Lord Steel. He really seemed to love the pain that the radio cloaks caused Flunzer. Nothing, my lord, just a touch of static. In fact, there was no static, yet Flunzer felt himself disintegrating. What had given the other such sudden power? Flunzer with empty Jeffrey snapped his jaws open and shut, open and shut. The children jumped back from him, eyes wide. It's okay, he said grimly, even as his two bodies thrashed against each other. There really were lots of good reasons why they should keep Joanna Olsen Dot alive. In the long run, it assured Jeffrey's good will, and it could be Flenzer's secret human. Perhaps he could fake the two legs' death to steal and... No, no, no. Flenzer grabbed back control, jamming the rationalizations out of mind. The very tricks he had used against Tyrathek she thought to turn against him. It won't work on me. I am the master of lies. And then her attack twisted again. It became a massive bludgeoning that destroyed all thought. With Flenzer, with Rangelith, with M.D. Jeffrey, all of him was making little gibbering noises now. Lord Steel danced around him, unsure whether to laugh or be concerned. Rangelith goggled at him in frank amazement. The two children edged back to touch him. Are you hurt? Are you hurt? The human slipped those remarkable hands under the radio cloak and brushed softly at Flenzer's bleeding fur. The voice, the world blurred in a surge of static. No, don't do that. It might hurt him more, came Amdi's voice. The puppy's tiny muzzles reached out, trying to help with the cloaks. Flenzer felt his being pushed the downwards towards oblivion. Tyrathek's final attack was a frontal assault, without rationalizations or sly infiltration, and... And she looked out upon herself in astonishment. After so many days, I am me, and in control. Enough butchering of innocence. If anyone is to die, it is Steel and Flenzer. 
Her head followed Steele's prancing forms, picked out the most articulate member. She gathered her legs beneath her and prepared to leap at its throat. Come just a little closer and die. Tyrethek's last moment of consciousness probably didn't last longer than five seconds. Her attack on Flenzer was a desperate, all-out thing that left her without reserves or internal defense. Even as she tensed to leap upon Steel, she felt her soul being pulled back up and down, and Flenzer rising up from the darkness. She felt the member's legs spasm and collapse, and the ground smash into its face. And Flenzer was back in control. The weakling's attack had been astonishing. She really cared for the ones who were to be destroyed, cared so much that she was willing to sacrifice herself if it would kill Flenzer. And that would have been her undoing. And that had been her undoing. Suicide is never something to hang pack dominance on. Her very resolve had weakened her hold on the hive mind, and given the master his chance, he was back in control, and with a great opportunity. Tyrethek's assault had left her defenseless. The innermost mental barriers around her three members were suddenly as thin as the skin of an overripe fruit. Flunzer slashed through the membrane, pawed at the flesh of her mind, spattering it across his own. The three who had been her core would still live, but never again would they have a soul separate from his. Flunzer with steel sprawled through unconscious, his convulsions subsiding. Let steel think him incap incapacitated. It would give him time to think of the most advantageous explanation. Flunzer with Rangaliff came slowly to his feet, though with the two members that were still in a posture of confusion. Flenzer pulled them together. No explanations were due here, but it would be best if Far Scout didn't suspect soul strife. The cloaks are powerful tools, dear Rangalith. Sometimes a bit too powerful. Yes, my lord. Flenzer let a smile spread across his features. For a moment he was silent, savoring what he would say next. But there was no sign of the weak-willed one. This had been her last, best try at domination. Her last and biggest mistake. Flenzer's smile spread further, all the way with to the two with Amd Jeffrey. It suddenly occurred to him that Joanna Olsendot would be the first person he had ordered killed since he was returned to Hidden Island. Joanna Olsendot would therefore be the first blood on three of his muzzles. There's one more item for Cradleheads for a scout, an execution. As he spoke the details, the warmth of a decision, a well-made, spread through his members. Chapter 35 The only good thing about all the waiting had been the chance it gave the wounded. Now that Vendacious had found a way past the Flenzerist defenses, everyone was anxious to break camp, but... Joanna spent the last afternoon at the field hospital. The hospital was laid off in rough rectangles, each about six meters across. Some of the pl plots had ragged tents, those belonging to the wounded who were still smart enough to care for themselves. Others were surrounded by stranded fencing. Inside each of those was a single member, the survivor of what had once been an entire pack. The singletons could easily have jumped the fences, but most seemed to recognize their purpose and stayed within. Joanna pulled the food cart through the area, stopping at the first, at first one patient and then another. The cart was a bit too large for her, and sometimes it got caught in the roots that grew across the forest floor. Yet this was a job that she could do better than any pack, and it was a nice way. It, it was nice to find a way she could help. In the forest around the hospital, there was the sound of curhogs being coaxed up to wagon ties, the shouts of crews securing the cannons and getting the camp gear stowed. From the maps Vendacious had shown at the meeting, it was clear the next two days would have been exhausting time. But at the end of it, they would have the, have the high ground behind unsuspecting flinzerists. She stopped at the first little tent. The threesome inside had heard her coming, and was outside now, running little circles around her cart. Joanna! Joanna! it said in her own voice. This was all that was left of one of Wood Carter's, Carver's minor strategists. Once upon a time, it had, been known so, it had known some Sam Norsk. The pack had originally been six. Three had been killed by the wolves. What was left was the talker part, about as bright as a five-year-old, though with an odd vocabulary. Thank you for food. Thank you. Its muzzles pushed at her. She patted the heads before reaching into the cart and pulling out bowls of lukewarm stew. Two of them dug in right away, but the third sat back for a moment and chatted. I hear, we fight soon. Not you anymore, but... Yes, we are going up by the dry fall, just east of here. Uh-oh, it said. Uh-oh, that's bad. Poor scene, no control, ambush scary. Apparently the fragment had some memories of its own tactical work, but there was no way Joanna could explain Vendacious's reasoning to it. Don't worry, we will make it okay. You sure? You promise? Joanna smiled gently at what was left of a rather nice fellow. Yes, I promise. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. Now all three had their muzzles stuck into stew bowls. 
This was one of the lucky ones, really. It showed plenty of interest in what went on around it. Just as important, it had childlike enthusiasms. Pilgrim said fragments like this could grow back easily if they were just treated right long enough to bear a puppy or two. She, could, she pushed the cart a few meters further, to the fenced square that was the symbolic corral for a singleton. There was a faint, door of, a faint odor of shit in the air. Some of the singletons and duos were not housebroken. In any case, the camp latrines were a hundred meters away. Here, blackie, blackie. Joanna banged an empty bowl against the side of the cart. A single head eased up from behind some root bushes. Sometimes, this one wouldn't even do that much. Joanna got on her knees, so her eyes weren't much higher than the black-faced one. Blackie? The creature pulled it himself out of the bushes and slowly approached. This was all that was left of one of Scrupillo's cannoneers. She vaguely remembered the pack, a handsome sixum, handsome sixum, all large and fast. But now, even Blackie wasn't whole. A falling gun had crushed his rear legs. He dragged his legless rear on a little wagon with thirty-centimeter wheels, sort of like a scrode rider with four legs. She pushed a bowl of stew towards him, and made the noises that Pilgrim coached her in. Blackie had refused food the last three days, but today he rolled and walked close enough that she could pet his hand. After a moment, he lowered his muzzle to the stew. Joanna grinned in surprised pleasure. This hospital was a strange place. A year ago, she would have been horrified by it. Even now, she didn't have the proper tinish outlook on the wounded. As she continued to pet Blackie's lowered head, Joanna looked across the forest floor at the crude tents, the patients and parts of patients. It really was a hospital. The surgeons did try to save lives, even if the medical science was a horrifying process of cutting and splinting without anesthetics. In that regard, it was quite comparable to the medieval human medicine that Johanna had seen on the on data set. But with the times, there was something more. This place was almost a spare parts warehouse. The medics were interested in the welfare of packs. To them, singletons were pieces that might have a use in making a larger fragments workable, at least temporarily. Injured singletons were at the bottom of all medical priorities. There's not much left to save in such cases, one medic had said to her via pilgrim. And even if there was, would you want a crippled, loose-bonded member in yourself? The fellow had been too tired to notice the absurdity of his question. His muzzles had been dripping blood. He'd been working for hours to save wounded members of whole packs. Besides, most wounded singletons just stopped eating and died in less than a ten-day. Even after a year with tines, Joanna couldn't quite accept it. Every singleton reminded her of dear Scriber. She wanted them to have a better chance than his last remnant had. She had taken over the food cart and spent as much time with the wounded singletons as she did with any of the other patients. It had worked out well. She could get close to each patient without mind-sound interference. Her help gave the brood kenners more time to study the larger fragments and the uninjured singletons, and try to build working packs from the wreckage. And now maybe this one wouldn't starve. She'd tell Pil Pilgrim. He'd done miracles with some of his other matchups, and seemed to be the only pack who shared some of her feelings for damned singlet damaged singletons. If they don't starve it, if they don't starve, it often means a strength of mind. Even crippled, they could be an advantage to a pack. He'd said to her. I've been crippled off and on in my travels. You can't always pick and choose when you're down when you're down to three and you're a thousand miles into unknown land. Joanna set a bowl of water beside the stew. After a moment, the crippled member turned on his axle and took some sallow ships shallow sips. Hang on, Blackie, we'll find someone for you to be. Chitterat was where he was supposed to be, walking his post exactly as expected. Nevertheless, he felt a thrill of nervousness. He always kept at least one head gazing at the mantis creature, the two legs. Nothing suspicious about that posture, either. He was supposed to be doing security duty here, and that meant keeping a lookout in all directions. He shifted his crossbow nervously about from jaws to field, back, field pack and back to jaws. Just a few more minutes. Chitterat circled the hospital compound once more. It was soft duty. Even though his stretch of wood had been spared, the dry wind fires had chased the bigger wildlife downstream. This close to the river, the ground was covered with soft bush, and there was scarcely a thorn to be found. Pacing around the hospital was like a walk on Woodcarver's Green down south. A few hundred yards east was harder work, getting the wagons and supplies in shape for the climb. The fragments knew that something was up. Here and there, heads stuck up from pallets and burrows. They watched the wagons being loaded, heard the familiar voices of friends. The dumbest ones felt a call to duty. He had chased three able-bodied singles back into the compound. 
No way such Phoebes could be of any help. When the army marched up Margrum Climb, the hospital would stay behind. Chitterat wished he could, too. He'd been working for the boss long enough to guess whence his orders ultimately came. Chitterat suspected that not many would be coming back from Margrim Climb. He turned three pairs of eyes towards the mantis creature. This latest job was the riskiest thing he'd been a part of. If it worked out, he might just demand that the boss leave him with the hospital. Just be careful, old fellow. Vendacious didn't get where he is by leaving loose ends. Chitterat had seen what happened to that Easterner who, no who nosed a little too close into the boss's business. Damn, but the human was slow. She'd been grunting at that one singleton for five minutes. You'd think she was having sex with these fang frags for all the time she spent with them. Well, she'd pay for the familiarity very soon. She started. He started to cock his bow, and then thought better of it. Accident, accident. It must all look like an accident. Aha. The two legs was collecting food and water bowls and stowing them on the meal chart, cart. Chitterat made unobtrusive haste around the hospital perimeter, positioning himself in the view of Kratzy Duo, the fragment that would actually do the killing. Kratzini Sani... <laughs> Kratzini Sinari uh, had been a foot trooper before losing the Nisenari parts of himself. He had no connection with the boss or security, but he'd known as a crazy headed he he'd known as a crazy headed get of bitches, a pack that was almost that was always on the edge of combat rage. Getting killed back to two members normally has a gentling influence. In this case, well, the boss claimed that. Kratzy was specially prepared, a trap ready to be sprung. All Chitty, R Chitty Rat had needed to do was give the signal, and the duo would tear the mantis apart. A great tragedy. Of course, Chitty Rat would be there, the alert hospital warden. He would quickly put arrows through Katz Kratzy's brains, but alas, not in time to save the two legs. The human dragged the metal meal cart awkwardly around the root bushes towards Kratzy, her next patient. The duo came out of its burrow, speaking half-witted greetings that even Chitterat could not understand. There were undertones, though, a killing anger that edged its friend friendly mien. Of course, the mantis thing didn't notice. She stopped the cart, began filling food in water bowls, all the time grunting away at the twosome. In a moment, she would bend down to put the food on the ground. For half an instant, Chitterat considered shooting the mantis himself if Kratzy was were not immediately successful. He could claim it was a tragic miss. He really didn't like the two legs. The mantis creature was a menacing thing. It was so tall and moved so weirdly. By now he knew it was fragile compared to Pax, but it was scary to think of a single animal so smart as this. He shelved the temptation even faster than he had thought it. No telling what price he might pay for that, even if he believed his shot was an accident, even if they believed his shot was an accident. No altruism today, thank you very much. Kratzy's jaws and claws would have to do. One of Kratzy's heads was, heads was looking in Chitterat's general direction. Now the mantis picked up the bowls and turned from the meal cart. Hey, Joanna, how's it going? Joanna looked up from the stew to see Peregrine Wickrackscar walking along the edge of the hospital. He was moving to get as close as possible without invading the mind sounds of the patients. The guard who had stopped there for a moment before retreated before his advance and stopped a few meters further on. Pretty good, she called back. You know the one on wheels? He actually ate some stew tonight. Good. I've been thinking about him and the threesome on the other side of the hospital. The wounded medic? Yes. What's left of Trelalac is all female. You know. I've been listening to mind sounds, and Pilgrim's explanation was delivered in fluid Samnorsk, but it didn't make much sense to Joanna. Broodkinning had so many concepts without reference in human language that even Pilgrim couldn't make it clear. The only obvious part was that since Blackie was a male, there was a chance that he and the medic threesome might have pups early enough to bind the group. The rest was talk of mood resonance and meshing weak points with strong. Pilgrim claimed to be an amateur at brood kenning, but it was interesting the way the docks, and even woodcarvers sometimes, deferred to him. In his travels, he had, he had been through a lot. His matchup seemed to take more often than anybody's. She waved him to silence. Okay. We'll try it as soon as I've fed everybody. Pilgrim cocked a head or two at the nearby hospital plot. Something strange is going on. Can't quite put my finger on it, but all the fragments are watching you, even more than usual. Do you feel it? Joanna shrugged. No. 
She knelt to set the water in stew bowls before the twosome, patient. The pair had been vibrating with eagerness, though they had been quite polite in not interrupting. Out of the corner of her eye, she noticed the hospital guard make a strange dipping motion with its two middle heads, and... The blows were like two great fists smashing into her chest and face. Joanna fell to the ground, and they were on her. She raised bloody arms against the slashing claws, jaws and claws. When Chitterat gave the signal, both of Kratzy leaped into action, crashing into each other, almost incidentally knocking the mantis on her back. Their claws and teeth were tearing at empty air and at each other as much as the two legs. For an instant, Chitterat was struck motionless with surprise. She might not be dead. Then he remembered himself and jumped over the fence, and at the same time cocking and loading his bow. Maybe he could miss the first shot. Kratzy was shredding the mantis, but slow. Suddenly, there was no possibility of shooting the twosome. A wave of snarling black and white surged over Kratzy and the mantis. Every able-bodied fragment in the hospital seemed to be running to the attack. It was an instant killing rage, far wilder than anything that could come from whole packs. Chitterat fell back in astonishment before the sight and mind sound of it. Even the pilgrim seemed caught up in it. The pack raced past Chitterat and circled the melee. The pilgrim never quite plunged in, but nipped here and there, screaming words that were lost in the general uproar. A splash of coordinated mind sound boomed out from the mob, so loud it numbed Chitterat twenty yards away. The mob seemed to shrink in on itself, the frenzy gone from most of its members. What had been near a single beast with two dozen bodies was suddenly a confused and bloody crowd of random members. The pilgrim still ran around the edge, somehow keeping him, his mind in per purpose. His huge, scarred member <laughs> dived in and out of the remaining crowd, clawing at anything that still fought. The patients dragged themselves away from the killing ground. Some that had gone in as threesomes or duos came out single. Others seemed more numerous than before. The ground that was left was soaked with blood. At least five members had died. Near the, med the middle, a pair of prosthetic wheels lay incongruously. The pilgrim paid it all no attention. The four of them stood around and over the bloody mound at the center. Chitterat smiled to himself. Mantis splatter. Such a tragedy. Joanna never quite lost consciousness, but the pain and the suffocating weight of dozens of bodies left no room for thought. Now the pressure eased. Somewhere beyond the local din, she could hear shouts of normal tinish talk. She looked up and saw Pilgrim standing all around her. Scarbutt was straddling her, its muzzle centimeters away. It reached down and licked her face. Joanna smiled and tried to speak. Vendacious had arranged to, be in con arranged to be in conference with Scrupilo and Woodcarver. Just now, the commander of cannoneers was deep into tactics, using data set to illustrate his scheme for Margram climb. Squalls of rage sounded from down by the river. Scrupilo looked up peevishly from the pink oliphant. What the muddy hell? The sounds continued, more than a casual brawl. Woodcarver and Vendacious exchanged worried glances even as they arched necks to cease among the trees. A fight in the hospital, said the queen. Vendacious dropped his noteboard and lunged out of the meeting area, shouting for the local guards to stay with the queen. As he raced across the camp, he could see that his roving guards were already converging on the hospital. Everything seemed as smooth as a program on data set, except... Why so much noise? The last few hundred yards, Scrupilo caught up with him and pulled ahead. The cannoneer raced into the hospital and stumbled over himself in abrupt horror. Vin Vendacious burst into the clearing, all prepared to display his own shock combined with alert resolve. Peregrine Rickrack Scar was standing by a meal cart, Chitterat not far behind him. The pilgrim was standing over the two legs in a litter of carnage. By the pack of packs, what happened? There was much. There was too much blood by far. Everyone back except the doctors. Vendacious bellowed at the soldiers, who crowded at the edge of the compound. He picked his way along a path that avoided the loudest-minded patients. There were a lot of fresh wounds, and here and there speckles of blood dark on the pale tree trunks. Something had gone wrong. Meanwhile, Scrupilo had run around the edge of the hospital and was standing just a few dozen yards from the pilgrim. Most of him was staring at the ground under Wickrack Scar. It's Joanna! Joanna! For a moment it looked like the fool would jump over the fence. I think she's okay, Scrupilo, Wick Rackscar said. She was just feeding one of the duos and it went nuts, attacked her. One of the doctors looked over the carnage. There were the three corpses on the ground and blood enough for more. I wonder what she did to provoke them. Nothing, I tell you, but when she went down, half the hospital went after what's-its here. He waggled his nose at unidentifiable remains. Vendacious looked at Chitterat, at the same time saw Woodcarver arrive. What about it, soldier? he asked. 
Don't screw up, Chitterat. It's just like the pilgrim says, my lord. I've never seen anything like it. He sounded properly astounded by the whole affair. Mendacious stepped a little closer to the pilgrim. If you'll let me take a closer look, pilgrim. Wickraxgar had hesitated. He had been snuffling around the girl, looking for wounds that might need immediate attention. Then the girl nodded weakly to him, and he backed off. Vendacious approached, all solemn and solicitous. Inside he raged. He'd never heard of anything like this. But even if the whole damn hospital had come to her aid, she should still be dead. The Kratzy duo could have ripped her throat out in half a second. His plan had seemed foolproof and even now the failure would cause no lasting damage, but he was just beginning to understand what had gone wrong. For days the human had been in contact with these patients, even Kratzy. No tinish doctor could approach and touch them like the two legs. Even some whole packs felt the effect. For fragments, it must be overwhelming. In their inner soul, most of the patients considered an alien part of themselves, considered the alien part of themselves. He looked at the two legs from three sides, mindful that fifty packs of eyes were watching his every move. Very little of the blood was from the two legs. The cuts on her neck and arms were long and shallow, aimless slashings. At the last minute, Kratzy's conditioning had failed before the notion of the human as a pack member. Even now, a quick flick of a forepaw would rip the girl's throat open. He briefly considered putting her under security, security medical protection. The ploy had worked well with Scriber, but it would be very risky here. Pilgrim had been nose-to-nose -nose with Joanna. He would be suspicious of any claims about unexpected complications. No. Even good plans sometimes fail. Count as, as, count it as experience for the future. He smiled at the girl and spoke in Sam Norsk. You're quite safe now. For the moment, and quite unfortunately. The human's head turned to the side, looking off in the direction of Chitterat. Scrupilo had been pacing back and forth along the fence, so close to Chitterat and Pilgrim that the two had been forced back. I won't have it, the cannoneer said loudly. Our most important person attacked like this. It smells of enemy action. Wickraxgar goggled at him. But how? I don't know, Scrupilo said, his voice a desperate shout. But she needs protection as much as nursing. Vendacious must find us some place to keep her. The pilgrim pack was clearly impressed by the argument and unnerved by it. He inclined a head at Vendacious and spoke uh, with uncharacteristic respect. What do you think? Of course, Vendacious had been watching the two legs. It was interesting how little humans could disguise their point of attention. Johanna had been staring at Chitterat. Now she was looking up at Vendacious, her shifty little close-set eyes narrowing. Vendacious had made a project this last year of studying human expressions, both on Johanna and in stories and data set. She suspected something, and she also must have understood part of Scrupilo's speech. Her back arched, and one arm fell raised weakly. Fortunately for Vendacious, her shout came out a whisper that he, even he could bear, scarcely hear. No, not like Scriber. Vendacious was a pack who believed in careful planning. He also knew that the best-made schemes must be altered by circumstances. He looked down at Joanna and smiled with the gentlest public sympathy. It would be risky to kill her like Scriber's frag, but now he saw the alternatives were far more dangerous. Thank goodness Woodcarver was stuck with her limper on the other side of the camp. He nodded back at Pilgrim and drew himself together. I fear Scrupilo is right. Just how it might have been done, I don't know, but we can't take a chance. We'll take Joanna to my den. Tell the queen. He pulled the cloaks from his backs and began gently began to gently wrap the human for the last trip she would ever make. Only her eyes protested. Joanna drifted in and out of consciousness, horrified at her inability to scream her fears. Her strongest cries were less than whispers. Her arms and legs responded with little more than twitches, even that lost in vendacious swaddling. Concussion, maybe, something like that. The explanation came from some absurdly rational corner of her mind. Everything seemed so far away, so dark. Joanna woke in her cabin at Woodcarver's. What a terrible dream! that she had been so cut up, unable to move, and then thinking Vendacious was a traitor. She tried to shrug herself to a sitting position, but nothing moved. Darn sheets are wrapped all around me. She lay quiet for a second, still massively disoriented by the dream. Woodcarver, she tried to say, but only a little moan came out. Some member moved gently around the fire pit. The room was only dimly lit, and something was wrong with it. Joanna wasn't lying in her usual place. There was a moment of puzzled lassitude as she tried to make sense of the orientation of the dark walls. Funny. The ceiling was awfully low. Everything smelled like raw meat. The sight of her face hurt, and she tasted blood on her lips. She wasn't at Woodcarver's, and that terrible dream was... 
Three tinish heads drifted in silhouette nearby. One came closer, and in the dim light she recognized the pattern of white and black on its face. Vendacious. Good, he said. You are awake. Where am I? The words came out slurred and weak. The terror was back. The abandoned cotter's hut at the east end of the camp. I've taken it over. As a security den, you know. His Sam Norsk was quiet and fluent, spoken in one of the generic voices of data set. One of his jaws carried a dagger, the blade a glint in the dimness. Joanna twisted in the tied cloak and whispered, whispered screams. Something was wrong with her. It was like shouting on empty breath. One of Vendacious paced the hut's upper level. Daylight splashed across its muzzle as it peered out first one, and then another narrow slit, another one of the narrow slits cut in the timbers. Ah, it's good that you don't pretend. I could see you somehow guessed about my second career, my hobby. But screaming, even loud, won't help either. We will only have a brief time to chat. I'm sure the queen will come visiting soon, and I will kill you just before she arrives. So sad. Your hidden wounds were tragically severe. Joanna wasn't sure of all he had said. Her vision blurred every time she moved her head. Even now she couldn't remember the details of what had happened back in the hospital compound. Somehow Vendacious was a traitor, but how? Memories wriggled past the pain. You did murder Scriver, didn't you? Why? Her voice came louder than before, and she choked on blood dribbling back down her throat. Soft, human laughter came from all around her. He learned the truth about me. Ironic that such an incompetent would be the only one to see through me. Or do you mean a larger why? The three nearby muzzles moved closer still, and the blade in one's jaw patted the side of Joanna's cheek. Poor two legs. I'm not sure you could ever understand. Some of it. The will to power, maybe. I've read what Dataset has to say about human motivation, the Freudian stuff. We Tynes are much more complicated. I am almost entirely male, did you know that? A dangerous thing to be, all one sex. Madness lurks, yet it was my decision. I was tired of being an indifferently good inventor, of living in Woodcarver's shadow. So many of us are her get, and she dominates most all of us. She was quite happy about my going into security, you know. She doesn't quite have the combination of members for it. She thought that all male, uh, but one, would make me controllably devious. His sentry member made another round of the window slates. Again, there was a human chuckle. I've been planning a long time. It's not just a woodcarver I'm up against. The power side of her soul is scattered all over the Arctic coast. Flenzer had almost a century head start on me. Steel is new, but he has the Empire Flenzer built. I made myself indispensable to all of them. I'm Woodcarver's chief of security, and Steel's most valued spy. Played all right. Uh, I will end up with data set, and all the others will be dead. His blade tapped her face again. Do you think you can help me? Eyes peered close into her terror. I doubt it very much. If my proper plan had succeeded, you would be neatly dead now. A sigh breathed around the room. But that failed, and I'm stuck with carving you up myself. And yet it may all turn out for the best. Dataset is a torrent of information about most things, but it scarcely acknowledges the existence of torture. In some ways, your race seems so fragile, so easily killable. You die before your minds can be dismembered. Yet I know you can feel pain and terror. The trick is to apply force without quite killing. The three nearby members snuggled into more con comfortable positions, like a human settling down for a serious talk. And there are some questions you may be able to answer, things I couldn't really ask before. Steel is very confident, you know, and it's not just because he has me with Woodcarver. That pack has some other advantage. Could he have his own data set? Vendacious paused. Joanna didn't answer, her silence a combination of terror and stubbornness. That was the monster that killed Scriber. The muzzle with the knife slid between the blankets and Joanna's skin, and the pain shot up Joanna's arm. She screamed. Ah, data set said a human could be hurt there. No need to answer that one, Joanna. Do you know what do you know what I think is Steele's secret? I think one of your family survived, most likely your little brother, considering what you've told us about the massacre. Jeffrey, alive? For an instant she forgot the pain, and almost forgot the fear. How? Vendacious gave a tinish shrug. You never saw him dead. You can be sure Steele wanted alive two legs, and after reading about cold sleep and data set, I doubt he could have revived any of the others. And he's got something up there. He's been eager for information from Dataset, but he's never demanded I steal the device for him. Joanna closed her eyes, denying the traitor pack's existence. Geoffrey lives. Memories rose before her. Geoffrey's playful joy, his childish tears, his trusting courage aboard the refugee ship. Things she had thought forever lost to her. 
For a moment, they seemed more real than the slashing violence of the last few minutes. But what could Jeffrey do to help the Flunzerists? The other data sets had surely burned. There's something more here, something that Vendacious is still missing. Vendacious grabbed her chin and gave her head a little shake. Open your eyes. I've learned to read them, and I want to see. Hmm. I don't know if you believe me or not. No matter. If we have time, I will learn just what he might have done for Steele. There are other, sharper questions. Data set is clearly the key to all. In less than half a year, I and Woodcarver and Pilgrim have learned an enormous amount about your race and civilization. I dare say we know your people better than you do. Sometimes I think we know them even better than we know our own world. When all the violence is over, the winner will be the pack that still controls data set. I intend to be that pack, and I've often wondered if there are other passwords or programs I can run that would actually watch for my safety. The babysitter code. The watching heads bobbed a grin. Aha, so there is such a thing. Perhaps this morning's bad luck is all for the best. I might never have learned. His voice broke into discords. Two of Vendacious jumped up to join the one already at the window slits. Softly by her ear, the voice continued. It's the pilgrim, still far away, but coming toward us. I don't know. You would be much better safely dead. One deep wound, all out of sight. The, ni the knife slide further down. Joanna arched futilely back from the point. Then the blade withdrew, the point poised gently against her skin. Let's hear what Pilgrim has to say. No point in killing you this instant if he doesn't insist on seeing you. He pushed a cloth into her mouth and tied it tight. There was a moment of silence, maybe the crunch of paws in the brush right around the cabin. Then she heard a pack warble loud from beyond the timbered walls. Joanna doubted that she would ever learn to recognize packs by their voices, but her mind stumbled through the sounds, trying to decode the tinish chords that were the words piled on top of each of one another. Joanna, something interrogative, screech safe. Vendacious gobbled back. Hail, Peregrine Rick Raxcar. Joanna Trill, not visible hurts, sad, uncertain squeak. And the traitor murmured in her ear, Now he'll ask if I need medical help, and if he insists, our chat will have an early end. But the only reply Pilgrim made was a chorus of sympathetic worry. Damn assholes are just sitting down out there, came Vendacious's irritated whisper. The silence stretched on a moment, and then Peregrine's human voice, the Joker from Data Set, said in clear Samnorsk, Don't do anything foolish, Vendacious, old man. Vendacious made a sound of polite surprise, and tensed around her. His knife jabbed a centimeter deep between Joanna's ribs, a thorn of pain. She could feel the blade trembling, could feel his member's breath on her bloody skin. Pilgrim's voice continued, confident and knowing. I mean, we know what you're up to. Your pack at the hospital has gone completely to pieces, confessed what little he knew of Woodcarver. Or to Woodcarver. Do you think your lies can get by her? If Joanna is dead, you'll be bloody shreds. He hummed an ominous tune from Dataset. I know her well, the queen. She seems such a gracious pack. But where do you think Flenzer got his gruesome creativity? Kill Joanna, and you'll find just how far her genius in that exceeds Flenzer's. The knife pulled back. One more of Vendacious leaped to the window slits, and the two by Joanna loosened their grip. He stroked the blade gently across her skin, thinking, is Woodcarver really that fearsome? The four at the windows were looking in all directions. No doubt Vendacious was counting guard packs and planning furiously. When he finally replied, it was in Sam Norsk. The threat would be more credible, er, that, yeah, the threat would be more credible if it were not at second hand. Pilgrim chuckled. True. But we guessed what would happen if she approached. You're a cautious fellow. You'd have killed Joanna instantly, and been full of a lying explanation before you even heard what the Queen knows. But seeing a poor pilgrim amble over, I think you I know you think me a fool, only one step better than Scriber Jacaramuffin. Peregrine stumbled on the name, and for an instant lost his flippant tone. Anyway, now you know the situation. If you doubt, send your guards beyond the brush. Look at what the Queen has surrounding you. Joanna dead only kills you. Speaking of which, I assume this conversation has some point. Yes, she lives. Vendacious slipped the gag from Joanna's mouth. She turned her head, choking. There were tears running down the sides of her face. Pilgrim, oh pilgrim. The words, words were scarcely more than a whisper. She drew a painful breath, concentrated on making noise. Bright spots danced before her eyes. Hey, pilgrim. Hey, Joanna, has he hurt you? Some, I... That's enough. She's alive, Pilgrim, but that's easily corrected. Vendacious didn't jam the gag back in her mouth. Joanna could see him rubbing heads nervously as he paced round and round the ledge. He trilled something about stalemated game. Peregrine replied, 
Speak Salmon Norse Commendatious. I want Joanna to understand. And you can't talk quite as slick as in pack talk. Whatever. The trader's voice was unconcerned, but his members kept up their nervous pacing. The queen must realize we have a standoff here. Certainly I'll kill Joanna if I'm not treated properly, but even then, Woodcarver would not, could not afford to hurt me. Do you realize that trap steel has set, the trap steel has set on Margram Climb? I'm the only one who knows how to avoid it. Big deal. I never wanted to go up Margram anyway. Yes, but you don't count, Pilgrim. You're a mongrel patchwork. Woodcarver will understand how dangerous this situation is. Steele's forces are everything I said they weren't, and I've been sending ev them every secret I could write down from my investigations of Dataset. My brother is alive, Pilgrim, Joanna said. Oh, you're kind of a record-setter for treason, aren't you, Vendacious? Everything to us was a lie, while Steele learned all the truth about us. You figure that means we daren't kill you now? Laughter, and Vendacious's pacing stopped. He sees control coming back to him. More, you need my full-membered cooperation. See? I exaggerated the number of enemy agents in Woodcarver's troops, but I do have a few, and maybe Steele has planted others I don't know about. If you even arrest me, word will get back to the Flinzer armies. Much of what I know will be useless, and you'll face an immediate, overwhelming attack. You see? The Queen needs me. And how do we know this is not more lies? That is a problem, isn't it? Matched only by how I can guar be guaranteed safety once I've sa saved the expedition. No doubt it's beyond your mongrel mind. Woodcarver and I must have a talk. Some place mutually safe and unseen. Carry that message back to her. She can't have this traitor's hides. But if she cooperates, she may be able to save her own. There was a silence from outside, punctuated by the squeaking of animals in the nearer trees. Finally, surprisingly, Pilgrim laughed. Mongrel mind, eh? Well, you have me in one thing, Vendacious. I've been all the world round. I remember back half a thousand years. But all of the villains and traitors and geniuses, you take the record for bald impudence. Vendacious gave a tinish chord, untranslatable but as a sign of smug pleasure. I'm honored. Very well. I'll take your points back to the Queen. I hope the two of you are clever enough to work something out. One thing more. The Queen requires that Joanna come with me. The Queen requires? That sounds more like your mongrel sentiment to me. Perhaps, but it will prove you're serious in your confidence. View it as my price for cooperation. Vendacious turned all his heads towards Joanna, silently regarding. Then he scanned out all the windows one last time. Very well, you may have her. Two jumped down to the cabin's hatch while another pair pulled her toward it. Her voice was soft and near her ear. Damn pilgrim, alive, you're just going to cause me trouble with the queen. His knife slid across her field of view. Don't oppose me with her. I'm going to survive this affair still powerful. He lifted back the hatch and daylight spilled blindingly across her face. She squinted. There was a sweep of branches in the side of the hut. Vendacious pushed and pulled her cot onto the forest floor, and at the same time gobbling at his guards to keep their positions. He and Peregrine chatted politely, agreeing on when the pilgrim would return. One by one, Vendacious trotted back through the cabin's hatch. Pilgrim advanced and grabbed the handles at the front of the cot. One of his pups reached out from his jacket and nuzzled her face. You okay? I'm not sure. I got bashed in the head, and it seems kind of hard to breathe. He loosened the blankets from around her chest as the rest of him dragged the cot away from the hut. The forest shade was peaceful and deep, and Vendacious's guards were stationed here and there about the area. How many really were in on the treason? Two hours ago, Joanna had looked to them for protection. Now their every glance sent a shiver through her. She rolled back to the center of the cot, dizzy again, and stared up into the branches and leaves and patches, patches of smoke-stained sky. Things like stromly tree squiggles chased each other back and forth, chittering in seeming debate. Funny. Almost a year ago, Pilgrim and Scriber were dragging me around, and I was even worse hurt and terrified of everything, including them. And now, she had never been so glad to see another person. Even Scarbutt was a reassuring strength, walking beside her. The waves of terror slowly subsided. What was left was an anger as intense, though more reasoning, than the year before. She knew what had happened here. The players were not strangers. The betrayal was not random murder. After all, Vendacious's treachery, after all Vendacious's treachery, after all his murders, and his planning to kill them all, he was going to go free. Pilgrim and Woodcarver were just going to overlook that. He killed Scriber, Pilgrim. He killed Scriber. He cut Scriber to pieces, then chased down what was left, and killed that right out of our arms. And Woodcarver is just going to let him go free? How can she do it? How can you do it? 
The tears were coming again. Shh, shh. Two of Pilgrim's heads came into view. They looked down at her, then swiveled around almost nervously. She reached out, touching the short plush fur. Pilgrim was shivering. One of him dipped close. His voice didn't sound jaunty at all. I don't know what the Queen will do, Joanna. She doesn't know about any of this. What? Shh. And his voice became a scarce became scarcely a buzzing through her hand. His people can still see us. He could still figure things out. Only you and I know, Joanna. I don't think anyone else suspects. But the pack that confessed? Bluff. All bluff. I've done some crazy things in my life, but next to following Scriber down to your starship, this takes the prize. After Vendacious took you away, I began to think. You weren't that badly injured. It was all too much like what happened to Jacaramuffin, but I had no proof. And you haven't told anyone? No. Foolish as poor Scriber, aren't I? His heads looked in all directions. If I was right, he'd be silly not to kill you immediately. I was so afraid I, would, I was already too late. You would have been, if Vendacious was, weren't quite the monster I know he is. Anyway, I learned the truth just like poor Scriber, almost by accident. But if we can get another twenty, seventy meters away, we won't die like him, and everything I claimed to Vendacious will be true. She patted his nearest shoulder and looked back. The tiny cabin and its ring of guards disappeared behind the forest brush. And Jeffrey lives. Crypto, zero. Ninety-five encrypted packets have been discarded. As received by O slash Elvira shipboard ad hoc. Language path. Tredeshk, Trisquillen, SJK units. From Zonograph, Eidolon. Co-op or religious order in Middle Beyond maintained by subscription of several thousand low beyond civilizations, in particular those threatened by immersion. Subject, surge bulletin update and ping. Distribution, Zonograph Eidolon subscribers, Zonometric interest group, threats interest group. Subgroup, navigational, ping participants. Date, 10878923017 seconds, since calibration event 239011, Eidolon frame, 66.91 days since fall of Sandra Kai. Key phrases, galactic scale event, superluminal, charitable emergency announcement. Text of message, please include accurate local time in any ping responses. If you receive this, you know that the monster surge has receded. The new zone surface appears to be a stable froth of low dimensionality between 2.1 and 2.3. At least five civilizations are trapped in this new configuration. Thirty virgin solar systems have achieved the beyond. Subscribers may find specifics in the encrypted data that follow this bulletin. The change corresponds to what is seen in the normal period of two years across the whole galaxy's slow zone surface, yet this surge happened in less than 200 hours and less than one thousandth of that surface. Even these numbers do not show the scale of the event. The following can only be estimates, since so many sites were destroyed, and no instruments were calibrated for this size event. At its maximum, the surge reached 1,000 light-years above zone surface standard. Surge rates of more than 30 million times light speed, about one light-year per second, were sustained for periods of more than 100 seconds. Reports from subscri subscribers show more than 10 billion normalized savant deaths directly attributable to the surge local network failures, failures leading to environment collapse, medical collapse, vehicle crashes, security failures. Posted economic damage is much greater. The important question now is what we can accept, expect in after surges. Our predictions are based on instrumented sites and zonometric surveys, combined with historical data from our archives. Except for long-term trends, predicting zone changes has never been a science. But we have served our subscribers well in advising of after surges and in identifying available new worlds. The present situation makes all previous work almost useless. We have precise documentation going back 10 million years. Faster than light surges happen about every 20,000 years, usually with speeds under 7.0 C. Nothing like this monster is on file. The surge just seen is the kind described at third hand in old and glutted databases. Sculpture had one this size 50 million years ago. The Perseus arm in our galaxy probably suffered something like this half a billion years ago. This uncertainty, uncertainty makes our mission nearly impossible, and is an important reason for this public message to the Zonometry News Group and others. Everyone interested in zonometry and navigation must pool resources on this problem. Ideas, archive access, algorithms, all these things could help. We pledge significant contributions to non-subscribers. 
and one-for-one -one trades to those with important information. Note, we are also addressing this message to the Swindwip Oracle and to direct beaming it to points in the Transcend thought to be inhabited. Surely an event such as this must be of interest even there? We appeal to the powers above. Let us send you what we know. Give us some hint if you have ideas about this event. To demonstrate our good faith, here are the estimates we have currently. These are based on na naive scale-up of well-documented sur surges in this region. Details are in the non-encrypted the, the non appendix to this sending. Over the next year, there will be five or six after-surges of diminishing speed and range. During this time, at least two more civilization, see risk list, will be likely will likely be permanently immersed. Zone storm conditions will prevail even when after surges are not in progress. Navigation in the the volume coordinate specification will be extremely dangerous during this period. We recommend that shipping in the volume be suspended. This timeline is probably too short to admit feasible rescue plans for their civilizations at risk. Our long-range prediction, probably the least uncertain of all. The million-year scale, secular shrinkage, will not be affected at all. The next hundred thousand years will, however, show a retardation in the shrinkage of the slow zone boundary in this portion of the galaxy. Finally, a philosophical note. We of Zonographic Eidolon watch the zone boundary and the orbits of border stars. For the most part, the zone changes are very slow. 700 meters per second in the case of the long-term secular shrinkage. Sup bitches. Sup bitches. This chair warden here. Alright, I'm talking about that PS triple. The PS triple. I ain't talking about that we. That we shit. Shit, people, people will be talking about how it's all new and shit. But you know what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say is that Come on now, we. Come on, that that little control, baby. That looks like a dildo. I I ain't trying to play my games with no dildo. I right, maybe if the game is like, you know, Wario where shove up your own ass game. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's any mini games where you know, you have to shove it up your ass. But come on now, the we. People try to say that the the PS3 copy the Wii with the motion sensor. I don't give a fuck. Shit, shit, the Wii, you know what they should copy? They should copy how to get good games. They should copy how to get good games from the PS3. Everybody knows is that PS3 make the best games. Know what I mean, nigga? I mean, come on. You got little games when you got Wii, or you got Legend of Zelda, where you walk around with a little bitch, and his little bitch ass sword, with a little shield, and he just goes, ha, 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 come on, who wants to play that shit, I, I need to shoot some niggas, like, pow, pow, Nintendo, and then you talk about Nintendo isn't copying anything, and how Sony is copying everything, and that's just bullshit, that's bullshit. Shit, to saying Final Fantasy was on Nintendo before Sony? Have you played the PS1? Nigga, nigga, the PS1 got Final Fantasy 7. Shit, Nintendo trying to copy that shit. They know that they can't compete if they don't got Final Fantasy. Nigga, I don't even care if any other systems get Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy sucks ass now. Ooh, look at Final Fantasy 12. You know, you're running around with a little girl and shit. Fuck, everybody knows that girls can't do shit other than suck dick. So, what I'm really trying to say is that Sony, Sony's the bond, nigga. It's that it's true shit. Sony's true shit. You know. So, and then you, and then we got these Xbox fans, about fans of the Xbox 360. The Xbox 360, Xbox Circle, they fuck, they think they are, they think they're smart and shit. We ain't doing geometry, we try to play some games. And that's one thing Xbox don't got. Xbox ain't got games. It ain't got games. Shit, what, 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 nigga, niggas trying to say like, Gears of War. Shit, fuck Gears of War, more like Tears of War. 
Man, that shit has that little bitch crying all the time. You see that commercial? Little bitch ass commercial with that song? With the, with that with that pussy ass song? Shit. True games, true games has some some feely scent in the background. Some fat jokes, some ballin'. Shit. Not not some of this mad world shit, man. Fuck that. And then then what else this Xbox got? Xbox got Halo. Niggas niggas trying to talk about Halo. About Halo 3. You know what I'm saying? Man, they best rename that shit to Galo 3. Shit, that shit is mad gay. Uh, two niggas. Two niggas don't play that game. You know who plays that shit? Gay niggas. Gay niggas. Sony always wins, baby. Sony always wins. You can't beat Sony. Shit, that shit is slick. Slick. That shit. Have you seen the PS3? That shit is nice, nice, slick, black. That shit is nice. See, see like my hair over here, bitch? My hair? You like that shit. That shit, that shit is slick. Shit is black. Shit. My hair was was blown before this shit, alright? I, I, I dyed that shit black. You know why? Because PS triple. The PS triple. That shit is money. Money. We got this one little fat bitch. I don't even know his fucking name. But we got the little fat bitch trying to say that the PS3 console. Like, what kind of poor bitch ass cardboard box is he living out of, baby? $600 ain't shit to Chad Wooden. Chad Wooden wipes his ass with $600. $600 ain't shit. Shit. I'll give you $600 just to shut the hell up, nigga. Fuck. In you know, I can't take the Wii with me. I can't have my caddy. You know, I need I need to play some HD games while I'm rolling my caddy. How am I supposed to get some honeys with a Wii? It's like, yo, baby, look at my Wii. You know what they say to me? I fucking laugh when I when I show when I show them my PS3. Honeys, all get all over the shit. Get all the honeys with a PS troop. Yet these changes together with the orbital motion affects billions of lives each year. Just as the glaciers and droughts of a pre-technical world must affect a people, so must we accept these long-term changes. Storms and surges are obvious tragedies, near instant death for some civilizations. Yet these are as far beyond our control as the slower movements. Over the last few weeks, some news groups have been full of tales of war and battle fleets, of billions dying in the clash of species. To all such, and those living more peaceably around them, we say, look out on the universe. It does not care, and even with all our science, there are some disasters that we cannot avert. All evil and good is petty before nature. Personally, we take comfort from this, that there is a universe to admire that cannot be twisted to villainy or good, but which simply is. Crypto, zero, as received by O slash Elvira shipboard ad hoc. Language path, Arbowith, trade, Chirgulin, Trisquilin, SJK units. From, Twirlip of the Mists. Who knows what this is? Probably, though probably not a propaganda voice. Very sparse priors. Subject, the cause of the recent great surge. Distribution, threat of the blight, great secrets of creation, zonometric interest group. Date, 66.47 days since fall of Sandrakai. Key phrases, zone instability and the blight. Hexapodia as the key insight. Text of message. Apologies if I am repeating obvious conclusions. My only gateway onto the net is very expensive, and I miss a many important postings. The great surge now in progress appears by all accounts to be an event of cosmic scope and rarity. Furthermore, the other posters put its epicenter less than 6,000 light years from recent warfare related to the blight. Can this be mere coincidence? As has long been theorized, citations from various sources, three known to old slash Elvira, the theories cited are of long standing and uh, non disprovable. The zones themselves may be an artifact, perhaps created by something beyond transcendence for the protection of lesser forms, or, hypothetical, sentient gas clouds in galactic cores. Now for the first time in net history, we may have a transcendent form, the blight, that can effectively dominate the beyond. Many on the net, cites hands and Sandor at the zoo, believe that it is searching for an artifact near the bottom, 
It is no wonder that this could upset the natural balance and provoke. Is it no wonder that this could upset the natural balance and provoke the recent event? Please write to me and tell me what you think. I don't get much mail. Crypto, zero, as received by O slash Elvira shipboard ad hoc, language path, Baylor esque, Twisquiline, SJK units, from Alliance for the Defense, claimed union of five empires below Stromley Realm. No ref references prior to the fall of Stromley Realm. Numerous counterclaims, including from Out of Band 2, that this alliance is a front for the old Aprahant hegemony, CF Butterfly Terror. Subject. Courageous mission accomplished. Distribution. Threat of the Blight, War Tracker's Interest Group, Homo Sapiens Interest Group. Date. 67.07 days since fall of Sandra Kai. Key phrases. Action, not talk. Text of message. Subsequent to our action against the human nest at Sandra Kai, a part of our fleet pursued human and other blight-controlled forces toward the bottom of the beyond. If evidently, the perversion hoped to protect these forces by putting them in, in, in an environment too dangerous to challenge. That thinking did not count on the courage of Alliance commanders and crews. We can now report the substantial destruction of those escaping forces. The first major operation of your alliance has been an enormous success. With the extermination of their most important supporters, blight encroachment on the middle beyond has been brought to a standstill. Yet much remains to be done. The Alliance fleet is returning to the middle beyond. We've suffered some casualties and need substantial reprovisioning. We know that there are still scattered pockets of humanity in the beyond, and we've identified secondary races that are aiding humanity. The defense of the middle beyond must be the goal of every savant of goodwill. Elements of your Alliance fleet will soon visit systems in the volume, parameter specification. We ask for your aid and support against what is left of this terrible enemy. Death to Vermin. Chapter 36 Kshet Svensendot was alone on the old Slash Elvira's bridge when the surge passed. They had long since done all the preparations that were meaningful, and the, the ship had no realistic means of propulsion in the slowness that surrounded it. Yet the group captain spent much of his time up here, trying to program some sort of responsiveness into the automation that remained. Half-assed programming was a time filler that, like knitting, must date to the beginning of the human experience. Of course, the actual transition out of slowness would have been totally unnoticed if not for all the alarms he and the Dirokimes had installed. As it was, the noise and, night and lights blew him out of a half-drowse into hair-raised wakefulness. He punched the ship's calm. Glimfrel, Tyrol, get your tails up here. By the time the brothers reached the command deck, preliminary nav displays had been computed, and a jump sequence was awaiting confirmation. The two were grinning from ear to ear as they bounced in and strapped themselves down at action posts. For a few moments there was little chit-chat, only an occasional whistle of pleasure from the dirokimes. <coughs> they had rehearsed this over and over during the last hundred-plus hours, and with the poor automation there was, lo there was a lot for them to do. Gradually the view from the deck's windows sharpened. Where at first there had only been vague blurs, the ultra-wave sensors were posting individual traces with steadily improving information on range and rates. The communication window showed the queue of fleet comm messages getting longer and longer. Tyrol looked up from his work. Hey boss, these jump figures look okay, at least as a first cut. Good, commit and allow auto-commit. In the hours after the surge, they had decided that their initial priority would be to continue with the pursuit. What they did then... They had, long t they had talked long on that, and Group Captain Svensendot had thought even longer. Nothing was routine anymore. Yes, sir, the Dirokime's long fingers danced across the controls, and Roll added some verbal control. Bingo. Status showed five, sh five jumps completed. Ten. Kshet stared out the true view window for a few seconds. No change. No change. Then he noticed that one of the brightest stars in the field had moved, was sliding imperceptibly across the sky. Like a juggler getting her pace, old Slash Elvira was coming up to speed. Hey, hey! Glimfrell leaned over to see his brother's work. We're making 1.2 light years per hour. That's better than before the surge. Good. Common surveillance? Where was everybody else when... What were they up to? Yep, yep, I'm on it. Glimfrell bent his slender frame back to the console. For some seconds, he was almost silent. 
Svensson Dot began a paging through the mail. There was nothing yet from owner Lamend. Twenty-five years Cajette had worked for Lamend and SGK, JK, commercial security. Could he mutiny? And if he did, would any follow? Okay, here's the situation, boss. Glim Frell shifted the main window to show his interpretation of the ship's reports. It's like we guessed, maybe a little more extreme. They had realized almost from the beginning that the surge was bigger than anything in recorded history. That's not what the Dairokai meant by extreme. He swept his short fingers down, making a hazy blue line across the window. We guessed that the leading edge of the surge moved normal to this line. That would account for it taking Boss Lamend out 400 seconds before it hit the out of band, and hitting us 10 seconds after that. Now if the trailing edge were similar to ordinary surges, upgraded a million times, then we and the rest of the pursuing fleets should come out well before out of band. He pointed at a single glowing dot that represented the O-slash Elvira. Around and just ahead of it, dozens of points of light were popping into existence as the ship's detectors reported seeing the initiation of ultra-drive jumps. It was like a cold fire sweeping away, the, away from them into the darkness. Eventually, Lamend and the heart of the anonymous fleet would all be back in business. Our pickup log shows what a, that's a, about what happened. Most all the pursuing fleets would be out of the surge before the out-of-band. Hmm, so it'll lose parts of, it, of its lead. Yep, but if it's going where we think, a G-star 80 light-years ahead, it'll still get there before they kill it. He paused, pointed at a haze that was spreading sideways from the growing knot of light. Not everybody is still chasing. Yeah. Svensson Dot had been reading the news as, even as he listened to Frell's summary. According to the net, that's the Alliance for the Defense, departing the battlefield, victorious. Say what? Tyrol twisted abruptly in his harness. His large, dark eyes held none of their usual humor. You heard me. Kajet put the item where the brothers could see it. The two read rapidly, Frell mumbling phrases aloud. Courage of Alliance commanders, substantial destruction of escaping forces. Glimfrell shuddered, all flippancy departed. They don't even mention the surge. Everything they say is a cowardly lie. His voice shifted up to its normal speaking range, and he continued in his own language. Kajet could understand parts of it. The Dairokimes that left their dream habitats were normally light-hearted folk, full of whimsy and gentle sarcasm. Grim Glimfrell sounded almost that way now, except for the high edges to his whistling and the insults more colorful than Svensson Dot had ever heard from them. Get from a, a vermin, verminous cow pie, killers of innocent dreams. Even in Samnorsk, the words were strong, but in Dairokheim, verminous cow pie was drenched in explicit imagery that almost brought the smell of such a thing into the room. Glimfrell's voice went higher and higher, then beyond the human register. Abruptly, he collapsed, shuddering and moaning low. Dairokheims could cry, though Svensson Dot had never seen such a thing before. Glimfrell rocked in his brother's arms. Tyrol looked over Grim Glimfrell's shoulder at Kajet. Where does revenge take us now, group captain? For a moment, Kajet looked back silently. I'll let you know, lieutenant. He looked at the displays. Listen and watch a little longer and maybe we'll know. Meantime, get us nearer the center of pursuit, he said gently. Aye, sir. Tyrol patted his brother's back gently and returned back to the console. During the next five hours, O slash Elvira's crew watched the Alliance fleet race helter skelter for the higher spaces. It could not be even be called a retreat, more a panicked dissolution. Great opportunists, they had not hesitated to kill by treachery and to give chase when they thought there might be treasure at the end. Now that they were confronted with the possibility of being trapped in the slowness, of dying between the stars, they raced for their separate safety. Their bulletins for the news groups were full of bravado, but their maneuver couldn't be disguised. Former neutrals pointed to the discrepancy. More and more, it was accepted that the alliance was built around the Aprahanti hegemony, and perhaps had other motives than altruistic opposition to the blight. There was nervous speculation about who might receive the next uh, alliance attention. Major transceivers still targeted the fleets. They might as well have been on a network trunk. The news traffic was a vast waterfall, totally beyond O slash Elvira's present ability to receive. Nevertheless, Svensson Dot kept an eye on it. Somewhere there might be some clue, some insight. The majority of war trackers and threats seemed to have little interest in the Alliance or the death of Svan Sandra Kai, per se. Most were terrified the blight that was still spreading through the top of the beyond. None of the highest uh, had successfully resisted, and there were rumors that two more interfering powers had been destroyed. 
There were some, secret mouths of the blight, who welcomed the new stability at the top, even one based on permanent parasitization. In fact, the chase down here at the bottom, the flight of the out-of-band and its pursuers, seemed the only place where the blight was not completely triumphant. No wonder they were the subject of 10,000 messages an hour. The geometry of emergence was an enormously favorable to O slash Elvira. They had been on the outskirts of the action, but now they had an hour's head start on the main fleets. Glimfrel and Tyrol were busier than they had ever been in their lives, monitoring the fleet's emergence and establishing O slash Elvira's identity with the other vessels of commercial security. Until Skritz and Lamend emerged from the slowness, Kajet Svensendot was the ranking officer of the organization. Furthermore, he was personally known to most of the commanders. Kajet had never been the admiral type. His group captaincy had been a reward for piloting skills, in, Sandra Kai, in a Sandra Kai at peace. He had always been content to defer to his employers, but now... The group captain used his ranking status. The Alliance vessels were not pursued. Wait till we can all act together, ordered Svensson Dot. Possible game plans bounced back and forth across the emerging fleet, including schemes that assumed HQ was destroyed. With certain commanders, Cajet hinted that this, might la this last might be the case, that Lament's flagship was in enemy hands, and that the alliance was somehow just a side effect of that true enemy. Very soon, Cajet would be committed to the treason he planned. The Lament flagships and the core of the Blighter fleet came out of the slowness almost simultaneously. Com alarms went off across O slash Elvira's deck as priority mail arrived and passed through the ship's crypto. Source, Lamend at HQ, Starbreaker priority, said the ship's voice. Glimfrel put the message on the main window, and Svensson Dot felt a chill, cer uh, chill certainty spread up his neck. All units are to pursue fleeing vessels. These are the enemy, the killers of our people. Warning, masquerade suspected. Destroy any vessels countermanding these orders. Order of battle and validation codes follow. Order of battle was simple, even by commercial security standards. Lamend wanted them to split up and be gone, saying only, staying only long enough to destroy masqueraders. Kajet said to Glimfrel, how about the validation codes? The Dyrokheim seemed his usual self again. They're clean. We wouldn't be receiving the message at all unless the cinder had today's one-time pad. We're beginning to receive queries from the others. Boss. Audio and video channels. They want to know what to do. If he hadn't prepared the ground during the last few hours, Kajet's mutiny wouldn't have had a chance. If commercial security had been a real military organization, the Lamend order might have been obeyed without question. As it was, the other commanders pondered the questions that Svensson Dot had raised. At these ranges, video communication was easy, and the fleet had one-time ciphers large enough to support enormous amounts of it. Yet Lamend had chosen printed mail for her priority message. It made perfect military sense, given that encryption that the encryption was correct, but it was also what Svensson Dot had predicted. The supposed HQ was not quite willing to show its face down here, where perfect visual masquerades were not possible. Their commands would be by mail, or evocations that a sharp observer might suspect. Such a slender thread of reason Kijet and his friends they were hanging from. Kijet eyed the knot of light that represented the Blighter fleet. It was suffering from no indecision. None of its vessels were straggling back towards safer heights. Whatever commanded there had discipline beyond most human militaries. It would sacrifice everything in its single-minded pursuit of one small starship. What next, group captain? Just ahead of that cold smear of light, a single tiny gleam appeared. The out of band, said Glimfrel. Sixty-five light years out now. I'm getting encrypted video from them, boss. The same half-cocked XOR pad as before. He put the signal on the main window without waiting for Kujet's direction. It was Ravna Bergson's dot. The background was a jumble of motion and shouting, the strange human and a Skrodrager arguing. Bergson's dot was facing away from the pickup and doing her share of shouting. Things looked even worse than Kujet's recollection of the first moments of the ship's emergence. It doesn't matter just now, I tell you. Let him be. We've got a contact. She must have seen the signal Glimfrel was sending back to her. They're here, by the powers. Fam, please. She waved her hand angrily and turned to the camera. Group captain, we're... I know, we've been out of the surge for hours. We're near the center of the pursuit now. She caught her breath. Even with a hundred hours of planning, events were moving too fast for her. And for me, too. That's something, she said after an instant. Everything we said before holds, group captain. We need your help. That's the blight that's coming behind us. Please. Svensson Dot noticed a telltale by the window. 
Sassy Glimfrill was retransmitting this to all the fleet they could trust. Good. He had talked about the situation with others these last hours, but it meant something more to see Ravna Birkenstadt on the comm, to see someone from Sandra Kai, who still survived and needed their help. You can spend the rest of your life chasing revenge in the middle beyond, but all you will kill will be the vultures. What's chasing Ravna Birkenstadt may be the first cause. The butterflies were long gone, still singing their courage across the net. Less than one percent of commercial security had followed Le Men's order to chase after them. Those were not the problem. It was the ten percent that stayed behind and arrayed themselves with the Blight's forces that bothered Kishet Svensson Dot. Some of those ships might not be subverted, might simply be loyal to orders they believed. It would be very hard to fire on them. And there would be fighting, no doubt of that. Maneuvering for conflict while under ultradrive was difficult. If the other side attempted to evade. But but Blight's fleet was unwavering in its pursuit of the out of band. Slowly, slowly, the two fleets were coming to occupy the same volume. At present, they were scattered across Cuic light years, but with every jump, the group's captain, Aniara Fleet, was more finely tuned to the stutter of the quarry's drives. Some ships were actually within a few hundred million kilometers of the enemy, or where the enemy had been, or would be. Targeting tactics were set. First fire was only a few hundred seconds away. With the Aprahanti gun, we have numerical superiority. A normal enemy would back off now. But of course, that is one thing the Blight Fleet is not. It was the red-haired guy who was doing the talking now. It was a good thing Glimfrell hadn't relayed his face to the rest of Svensson Dot's fleet. The guy acted edgy and alien most of the time. Just now, he seemed intent on bashing every idea Svensson Dot advanced. The Blight doesn't care what losses it, its losses are as long as it arrives with the upper hand. Svensson Dot shrugged. Look, we'll do our best. First fire is seventy seconds off. If they don't have any secret advantage, we may win this one. He looked sharply at the other. Or is that your point? Could the Blight... Stories were still coming down about the Blight's progress ac across the top of the beyond. Without a doubt, it was a transhuman intelligence. An unarmed man might be outnumbered by a pack of dogs, yet still defeat them. So might the Blight? Fam Nguyen shook his head. No, no, no. The Blight's tactics down here will probably be inferior to yours. Its great advantage is at the top, where it can control its slaves like fingers on a hand. Its creatures down here are like badly synced Waldos. Nguyen frowned at something off camera. No, what we have to fear is its st strategic cleverness. His voice suddenly had a detached quality that was more unsettling than the earlier impatience. It wasn't the calm of someone facing up to a threat. It was more the calm of the demented. One hundred seconds to contact. Group Captain, we have a chance, if you could concentrate your forces on the right points. Ravna floated down from the top of the picture, put one hand on the redhead's shoulder. God Shatter, she said he was, their secret edge against the enemy. God Shatter, a power's dying message, garbage or treasure, who really knew? Damn, if the other guys are just badly synced Waldos, then what does following Fam Nguyen make us? But he motioned Tyrol to mark the targets Nguyen was saying. Ninety seconds. Decision time. Kajet pointed at the red marks. Tyrol had scattered through the enemy fleet. Anything special about those targets, Roll? The Dairokheim whistled for a moment. Correlations popped up agonizingly slowly on the windows before him. The ships he's targeting aren't the biggest or the fastest. It's going to take extra time to position on them. Command vessels? One other thing. Some of them show real high velocities, or high real velocities, not natural resid residuals at all. Ships with ram drives? Planet busters? Hmm. Svensson Dot looked at the display just a second more. Thirty seconds, and Joe Haugen's ship Lin Linsnar would be in contact, but not with one of Nguyen's targets. Get on the comm, Glimfrell. Tell Linsnar to get off. To, to back off. Retarget. Retarget everything. The lights that were the Aniara fleet fled slow, slid slowly around the core of the Blighter fleet, searching for their new targets. Twenty minutes passed, and not a few arguments with the other captains. Commercial security was not built for military combat. What had made Kajet Svensendot's appeal successful was also the cause of constant questioning and counter-suggestions. And then there were the threats that came from Omer, owner Lamen's channel. Kill the mutineers. Death to all those disloyal to the company. The encryption was valid, but the tone was totally alien to the mild, profit-oriented uh, Gisk Lamend. Everyone could now see that disbelieving lament was one correct decision anyway. 
Joanna Haugen was the first to achieve sync with the new targets. Glimfrel opened the main window on Linsnar's data stream. The view was almost natural, a night sky of slowly shifting stars. The target was less than 30 million kilometers from Linsnar, but about a millisecond out of sync. Hagen was arriving just before or just after the other had jumped. Drones away, Hagen's voice said. Now they had a true view of Linsnar from a few meters away, from a camera aboard one of the first weapons drones launched. The ship was barely visible, a darkness obscuring the stars beyond, a great fish in the depths of an endless sea, a fish that was now giving spawn. The picture flickered, Linsnar disappearing, reappearing, as the drone lost sync momentarily. A swarm of blue lights spilled from the ship's hold, weapon drones. The swarm hung by Linsnar, calibrating itself, orienting on the enemy. The light faded from around Linsnar as the drones moving fractionally out of sync in space and time. Tyrol opened a window on a hundred million click sphere centered at Linsnar. The target vessel was a red dot that flickered around the sphere like a maddened insect. Linsnar was talking, stalking prey at eight thousand times the speed of light. Sometimes the target disappeared for a second, sink almost lost. Other times, Linsnar and the target merged for an instant as the two craft spent a tenth of a second at less than a million co kilometers remove. What could not be accurately displayed was the disposition of the drones. The spawn diffused on a myriad trajectories, their sensors extended for the sign of the enemy ship. What about the target? Is it swarming back? Do you need backup? said Svensson Dot. Tyrol gave a Dirochime shrug. What they were watching was three light years away. No way he could know. But Joe Hogan replied, I don't think my bogey is swarming. I've lost only five drones, no more than you'd expect from a fratricide. We'll see, she paused, but Linsnar's trace and signal remained strong. Cajette looked out the other windows. Five of Aniara were already engaged, and three had complete, completed swarm deploy. Nguyen looked on silently from out of band. The god shatter had had its way, and now Cajette and his people were committed. And now the good news uh, and bad came in very fast. Got him, from Joe Haugen. The red dot in Linsnar's swarm was no more. It had passed within a few hundred or few thousand kilometers of one of the drones in the milliseconds <coughs> necessary to compute a new jump. The drone had discovered its presence and detonated. Even that would not have been fatal if the target had jumped before the blast front hit. It. There had been several near misses in earlier seconds. This time the jump did not reach commit in time. A mini star was born, one whose light would be years in reaching the rest of the battle volume. Glimfrel gave a rasping whistle, an untranslatable curse. We just lost Abelzendot and Holder, boss. Their target must have counter-swarmed. Send in Gilwing and Trance. Something in the back of his head curled up in horror. These were his friends who were dying. Kshet had seen death before, but never like this. In police action, no one took lethal chances except in a rescue. And yet, he turned from the field summary in order to to order more ships on a target that had acquired defending vessels. Tyrol was moving in others on his own. Ganging up on a few non-essential targets might lose in the long run, but in the short term, the enemy was being hurt. For the first time since the fall of Sandra Kai, commercial security was hurting someone back. Hagen. Powers, that guy was moving. Secondary drone got EM spectrum on the kill. Target was going uh, 15,000 KPS true speed. A rocket bomb ramping up? Damn. They should be postponing those until they have, uh, after they have controlled the battlefield. Tyrol. More kills, far side of the battle volume. The enemy is repositioning. Somehow they've guessed which we're after. Grim Glimfrel. Triumph whistle. Get him, get him. Oops. Boss, I think Lamend has figured we're coordinating things. A new window has opened over Tyrol's post. It showed the five million kilometers around O slash of Elvira. Two other ships were there now. The window identified them as Lemen's flag, and one of the vessels that had not responded to Svensson Dot's recruiting. There was an instant of sil stillness on Old Slash of Ira's command deck. The voices of triumph and panic coming from the rest of the fleet seemed suddenly far away. Svensson Dot and his crew were looking at death close up. Tyrol, how long till the swarm? They're on us already. Just missed a drone by ten milliseconds. Tyrol, finish running current engagements. Glimfrel, tell Linsnar and Trance to chain command if we lose contact. Those ships had already spent their drones, and Joe Hagen was known to all the other captains. Then the thought was gone, 
and he was busy coordinating O-slash Elvira's own battle swarm. The local tactics window showed the cloud dissipating, taking on colors coded by whether uh, they were lagging or leading in time relative to O-slash Elvira. Their two attackers had matched pseudo-speeds perfectly. Ten times per second, all three ships jumped a tiny fraction of a light year. Like rot rocks skipping across the surface of a pond, they appeared in real space perfectly measured hops, in perfectly measured hops. And the distance between them at every emergence was less than five million kilometers. The only thing that separated them now was millisecond differences in jump times, and the fact that the light itself could not pass between them in the brief time they spent at each jump point. Three uh, asymptic Actinic, three actinic flashes lit the deck, casting shadows back from Svens and Dot in the dirochimes. It was secondhand light, the display's emergency signal of nearby detonation. Run like hell was the message any rational person should take from that awful light. It would be easy enough to break sync and lose tactical control of Aniara fleet. Tyrol and Glimfrel bent their heads away from the local window, shying from the glare of nearby death. Their whistling voices scarcely broke cadence, uh, and the commands from O slash Elvira to the others continued. There were dozens of other battles going on out there. Just now, O slash Elvira was the only source of precision and control available to their side. Every second they remained on station meant protection and advantage to Aniara. Breaking off would mean minutes of chaos till Linznar or Trance could pick up control. Nearly two-thirds of Fam Nguyen's targets were destroyed now. The price had been high, half of Svensendot's friends. The enemy had lost much to protect those targets, yet much of its fleet survived. An unseen hand smashed O-slash Elvira, driving Svensendot hard against his combat harness. The lights went out, and even the glow from the windows. Then dim red light came from the floor. The dirochimes were silhouetted by one small monitor. Roll whistled softly. We're out of the game, boss, at least while it counts. I didn't know you could get misses that near. Maybe it wasn't a miss. Kshet scrambled out of his harness and boosted across the room to float head down over the tiny monitor. Maybe we're already dead. Somewhere very close by, a drone had detonated, the wave front reaching O slash Elvira before she jumped. The concussion had been the outer part of the ship's hull exploding as it absorbed the soft X-ray component of the enemy ordnance. He stared at the red letters marching slowly across the damage display. Most likely, the electronics was permanently dead. Chances were that they had all received the fatal dose of gamma. The smell of burnt insulation floated across the room on the ventilator's breeze. Yeah, look at that. Five nanoseconds more and we wouldn't have been clipped at all. We actually committed the jump after the front hit. And somehow the electronics had survived long enough to complete the jump. The gamma flux through the command deck had 300 men. Rem. Uh, nothing that would slow them down over the next few hours, and easily managed by a ship's surgeon. As for the surgeon and all the rest of the O-slash Elvira's automation... Tyrol typed several long queries at the box. There was no voice recognition left. Several seconds passed before a response marched across the screen. Central automation suspended. Display management suspended. Drive computation suspended. Tyrol dug an elbow at his brother. Hey, Frell, looks like the Viro managed a clean disconnect. We can bring most of this back. Dirochimes were known for being drifty optimists, but in this case Tyrol wasn't far from the truth. Their encounter with the drone bond had been a one-in-a-billion thing, the tiniest fraction of an exposure. Over the next hour and a half, the dirochimes ran reboots off the monitor's hardened processor, bringing up first one utility and then another. Some things were beyond recovery. Parsing intelligence was gone from the comm automation, and the ultra-drive spines on one side of the craft were partially melted. Absurdly, the burning smell had been a vagrant diagnostic, something that should have been disabled along with the rest of the O-slash-Elvira's automation. They were far behind the blighter fleet. And there was still a blighter fleet. The knot of enemy lights was smaller than before, but on the same unwavering trajectory. The battle was long over. What was left of commercial security was scattered across four light years of abandoned battlefield. They had started the battle with numerical superiority. If they'd fought properly, they might have won. Instead, they'd destroyed the vessels with significant real velocities, and knocked out only about half of the others. Some of the largest enemy vessels survived. These outnumbered the corresponding Aniara survivors by more than four to one. Blight could, e could have, um, Blight could have, could have easily destroyed all that remained of co commercial security, but that would have meant a detour from the pursuit, and that pursuit was the one constant in the enemy's behavior. 
Tyrol and Glynfrell spent hours re-establishing communications and trying to discover who had died and who might be rescued. Five ships had lost all drive capability, but still had surviving crew. Some ships had been hit at known locations, and Svensendot dispatched vessels with drone swarms to find the wrecks. Ship-to-ship -ship warfare was a sanitary, intellectual exercise for most of the survivors, but the rubble and the destruction were as real as in any ground war, only spread over a trillion times more space. Finally, for the, uh, finally, the time for miracle rescues and sad discoveries was past. The SJK commanders gathered on a common channel to decide, decide a common future. It might better have been awake. Uh, for Sandra Kai and the Anyara fleet. Partway through the meeting, a new window appeared. A view onto the bridge of the Out of Band. Ravna Bergen's dot watched the proceedings silently. The erstwhile god shatter was nowhere in evidence. What more to do, said Joanna Hagen. The, da the damn butterflies are long gone. Are we sure we've rescued anyone? Everyone? Said Jan Tremblitz. Svensson Dot uh, bit back an angry reply. The commander of Trance had become a recording loop on that issue. He had lost too many friends in the battle. All the rest of his life, Jan Tremblitz would leave with nightmares of ships slowly dying in the deep night. You've accounted for everything, even to vapor. Hagen spoke as gently as the words aloud. The question is where to go now. Ravna made a small throat-clearing sound. Gentlemen and ladies, if... Tringlitz looked up at her transceived image. All this hurt transformed into a blaze of anger. We're not your gentleman, slut. You're not some, ha some princess we happily die for. You deserve our deadly fire now, nothing more. The woman shrank from Tringlitz's rage. I... You put us into this suicidal battle, shouted Tringlitz. You made us attack secondary targets, and then you did nothing to help. The blight is locked on you like a damn, like a dumb shark on a squid. If you had just altered your course the tiniest fraction, you could have thrown the blighters off our path. I doubt that would have helped, sir, said Ravna. The blight seems most interested in when, where we're bound. The solar system just fifty-five light years beyond the out of band. The fugitives would arrive there just over two days before their pursuers. Joe Hagen's shrugged. You must realize that your friend's crazy battle plan has done what your friend's crazy battle plan has done. If we had attacked rationally, the enemy would be a fraction of its present size. If it chose to continue, we might have been able to protect you at this, this, this Tyne's world. She seemed to, to taste the strange name, wondering at its meaning. Now, no way I'm going to chase them there. What's left of the enemy could wipe us out. She glanced at Svensson Dot's viewpoint. Kjet forced himself to look back. No matter who might blame out of band, it had been Group Captain Kajet Svensendot's word that had persuaded the fleet to fight as they did. Anyar's sacrifice had been ill-spent, and he wondered what Hagen and Tremblitz and the others had talked er, talked to him at all now. Suggest we continue the business meeting later. Rendezvous in 1,000 seconds, Kajet. I'll be ready. Good. Joe cut the link without saying anything more to Ravna Bergensdott. Seconds later, Tremblitz and the other commanders were gone. It was just Svensendot and the two Dirokheims, and Ravna Bergensdot looking out her window from out of band. Finally, Bergensdot said, When I was a little girl unhurt, sometimes we would play kidnappers and commercial security. I always dreamed of being rescued by your company from fates worse than death. Kajet smiled bleakly. Well, you got the rescue attempt. And you not even a currently subscribed customer. That was far... that was... This was far the biggest gunfight we've ever been in. I'm sorry, G Group Captain. He looked into her dark features, a lash from Sander Kai down to the violet eyes. No way this could be a simulation, not here. He had bet everything that she was not. He still believed she was not. Yet, what does your friend say about all this? Fam Nguyen had not been seen since the so impressive God Shatter Act at the beginning of the battle. Ravna's glance shifted to something off camera. He's not saying much, Group Captain. He's wandering around even more upset than your Captain Tringlitz. Fam remembers being absolutely convinced he was demanding the right thing, but now he can't figure out why it was right. Hmm. A little late for second thoughts. What are you going to do now? Hagen is right, you know. It would be useless suicide for us to follow the blighters to your destination. I dare say it's useless suicide for you, too. You'll arrive maybe fifty-five hours before them. What can you do in that time? Ravna Bergenstadt looked back at him, and her expression slowly collapsed into sobbing grief. I don't know. I don't know. She shook her head, her face hidden behind her hands in a sweep of black hair. Finally, she looked up and brushed back her hair. Her voice was calm, but very quiet. But we are going ahead. It's what we came for. 
Things could still work out. You know there's something down there, something that the Blight wants desperately. Maybe 55 hours is enough to figure out what it is and tell the net, and, and we'll still have Fam's god shatter. Your worst enemy? Quite possibly this Fam Nguyen was a construct of the powers. He certainly looked like something built from second-hand description of humanity. But how can you tell god shatter from simple nuttery? She shrugged, as if acknowledging the doubts and accepting them. So what will you and commercial security do? There is no commercial security anymore. Virtually all our customers got shot out from under us. Now we've killed our company's owner, or at least destroyed her ship and those supporting her. We are Eniara fleet now. It was the official name chosen at the fleet conference just ended. There was a certain grim pleasure in embracing it, the ghost from before Sandrakai and before Niorja, from the earliest times of the human race. For they were truly cast away now, from their worlds and their customers and their former leaders. One hundred ships bound for... We talked it over. A few still wanted to follow you to the Tyne's world. Some of the crews want to return to the middle beyond, to spend the rest of their lives killing butterflies. The majority want to start the races of Sandra Kai all over again, some place where we won't be noticed, some place where no one cares if we live. And the one thing everyone agreed on was that Aniara must be split no further, must make no further sacrifices outside of itself. Once that was clear, it was easy to decide what to do. In the wake of the Great Surge, this part of the bottom was an incredible froth of slowness and beyond. It would be centuries before the zonographic vessels from above had reasonable maps of the new interface. Hidden away in the folds and interstices were worlds fresh from the slowness, worlds where Sandra Kai could be born again. Ni Sandra Kai? He looked across the bridge at Tyrol and Glimfrel. They were busy bringing the main navigation processors out of suspension. That wasn't absolutely necessary for the rendezvous with Linznar, but things would be a lot more convenient if both ships could maneuver. The brothers seemed oblivious to Kajet's conversation with Ravna, and maybe they weren't paying attention. In a way, the Anyar decision meant more to them than to the humans on the fleet. No one doubted that millions of humans survived in the beyond, and who knew how many human worlds might still exist in the slowness, distant coven cousins of Neorja, distant children of Old Earth. But this side of the Transcend, the Dirochimes of Aniara were the only ones that existed. The dream habitats of Sandra Kai were gone, and with them, the race. There were at least a thousand Dirochimes left aboard Aniara, pairs of sisters and brothers scattered across a hundred vessels. These were the most adventurous of their race's latter days, and now they were faced with their greatest challenge. The two on Old Slash Elvira had already been scouting among the survivors, looking for friends and dreaming a new reality. Ravna listened solemnly to his explanations. Group Captain, xenography is a tedious thing, and your ships are near their limits. In this froth, you might search for years and not find a new home. We're taking precautions. We're abandoning all of our ships except the ones with ram scoop and cold sleep capability. We'll operate it in coordinated nets. No one should be lost for more than a few years, he shrugged. And if we never find what we seek, if we die between the stars as our life support finally fails... Well, then, will we still have lived true to our name, Aniara? I think we have a chance. More than can be said for you. Ravna nodded slowly. Yes, well, it helps me to know that. They talked a few minutes more, Tyrol and Glimfrel joining in. They had been at the center of something vast, but as usual with the affairs of the powers, no one knew quite what had happened, nor the result of the strivings. Rendezvous Liz Linznar, 200 seconds, said the ship's voice. Ravna heard it, nodded. She raised her, she raised her hand. Fare you well, Kjet Svensendad and Tyrol and Glimfrel. The Dirochimes whistled back the common farewell, and Svensendad raised his hand. The window on Ravna Bergen's dot closed. Kjet Svensendad remembered her face for all the rest of his life, though in later years it seemed more and more to be the same as O slash Elvira's. Part 3, Chapter 37 Tyne's world, I can see it, fam. The main window showed a true view upon the system, a sun less than two hundred million kilometers off, daylight across the command deck. The positions of identified planets were marked with blinking red arrows, but one of those, just twenty million kilometers off, was labeled terrestrial. Coming off an interstellar jump, you couldn't get much positioning better than that. Fam didn't reply, just glared out the window as if there was something wrong with what they were seeing. Something had broken in him after the battle with the Blight. He'd been so sure of his god shatter, and so bewildered by the consequences. Afterward, he had retreated more than ever. Now he seemed to think that even if they moved fast enough, the surviving enemy could do them no harm. 
More than ever, he was suspicious of blue shell and green stock, as if somehow they were the greater threats than the ships that still pursued. Damn, Pham said finally. Look at the relative velocity. Seventy kilometers per second. Position matching was no problem, but matching velocities will cost us time, Sir Pham. Pham stare turned on blue shell. We talked this out with the locals three weeks ago, remember? You managed the burn. And you checked my work, Sir Pham. This must be another nav system bug, though I didn't expect anything was wrong in simple ballistics. A sign inverted, seventy clicks per second closing velocity instead of zero. Blue Shell drifted toward the secondary console. Maybe, said Pham. Just now, I want you off the deck, Blue Shell. But I can help. We should be contacting Jeffrey and rematching velocities and... Get off the deck, Blue Shell. I don't have time to watch you anymore. Pham dived across the intervening space and was met by Ravna, just short of the rider. She floated between the two, talking fast, hoping whatever she, shed, she said would make both, uh, would both make sense and make peace. It's okay, Pham. He'll go. She brushed her hand across one of Blue Shell's wildly vibrating fawns. After a second, Blue Shell wilted. I'll go. I'll go. She kept an encouraging touch on him, and kept herself between him and Pham, as the scrolled rider made a dejected exit. When the rider was gone, she turned to Pham. Could, couldn't it have been a nav bug, Pham? The other didn't seem to hear the question. The instant the hatch had closed, he had returned to the command console. OOB's latest estimate put the Blight's arrival less than 53 hours away, and now they must waste time redoing a velocity match supposedly accomplished three weeks earlier. Somebody, something, screwed us over, Pham was muttering, even as he finished with the control sequence. Maybe it was a bug, but this next damn burn is going to be as manual as it can be. Acceleration alarms echoed through the core of the OOB. Pham flipped through the monitor windows, searching for loose items that might be big enough to be dangerous. You tie down, too. He reached out to override the five-minute timer. Ravna died ba dived back across the deck, unfolding the three free-fall saddle into a seat and strapping in. She heard Pham speaking on the general announce channel, warning of the timer override. Then the impulse drive cut in, a lazy pressure back into the webbing. Four-tenths of a G, all the poor OOB could still manage. When Pham said manual, he meant it. The main window appeared to be bore-centered now. The view didn't drift at the whim of the pilot, and there were no helpful legends and schematics. As much as possible, they were seeing true view along OOB's main axis. Peripheral windows were, help in, were held in fixed geometry with main. Pham's eyes flickered from one to another as his hands played over the command board. As near as could be, he was flying by his own senses, trusting no one else. But Pham still had use for the ultra drive. They were still 20 million clicks off target, a submicroscopic jump. Pham knew and fiddled with the drive parameters, trying to make an accurate jump smaller than the standard interval. Every few seconds the sunlight would shift a fraction, coming first over Ravna's left shoulder and then her right. It made re-establishing calm with Jeffrey nearly impossible. Suddenly the window below their feet was filled by a world, huge and gibbous, blue and swirling white. The Tyne's world was as Jeffrey O's Olsendot advertised, a normal terrestrial planet. After the months of space and the loss of Sandra Kai, the sight caught Ravna short. Ocean. The world was mostly ocean, but near the Terminator there were the darker shades of land. A single tiny moon was visible beyond the limb. Pham sucked in his breath. It's about 10,000 kilometers off. Perfect, except we're closing at 70 clicks per second. Even as she watched, the world seemed to grow, falling toward them. Pham watched it for a few seconds more. Don't worry. We're going to miss. Fly right past the, um, north limb. The globe swelled below them, eclipsing the moon. She had always loved the appearance of Hurt, and Sandra, Hurt at Sandra Kai, but that world had smaller oceans and was crisscrossed with dirochime accidents. This place was as beautiful as Relay and seemed truly untouched. The smaller polar cap was in sunlight, and she could follow the coastline that came south from, from it toward the Terminator. I'm seeing the northwest coast. Jeffrey's right down there. Ravna reached for her keyboard, asked the ship to attempt both ultrawave comm and a radio link. Ultrawave contact, she said after a second. What does it say? It's garbled. Probably just a ping response. Acknowledgement to OOB's si signal. Jeffrey was housed very near the ship these days. Sometimes she had gotten responses almost immediately, even during his night time. It would be good to talk to him again, even if... Tyne's world filled the entire aft inside windows now. 
its limb a barely curving horizon. Sky colors stood before them, fading to the black of space. Ice cap and icebergs showed detail within detail against the sea. She could see cloud shadows. She followed the coast southwards, in islands and peninsulas, so closely fit that she could not be sure of one from the other. Blackish mountains and black striped glaciers, green and brown valleys. She tried to remember the geography they had learned from Geoffrey. Hidden island? But there were so many islands. I have radio contact from the planet's surface, came the ship's voice. Simultaneously, a blinking arrow pointed at the spot just in from the coast. Do you want the audio in real time? Yes, yes, said Ravna, then punched at her keyboard when the ship did not respond immediately. Hey, Ravna, oh, Ravna. The little boy's voice bounced to excitement around the deck. He sounded just as she had imagined. Ravna keyed in her request for two-way. There were less than 5,000 clicks from Jeffrey now, even if they were sweeping by at 70 kilometers per second, plenty close enough for a radio conversation. Hey, Jeffrey, she said, we're here at last, but we need... We need all the cooperation of your four-legged friends can give us. How to say that quickly and effectively. But the boy on the ground already had an agenda. Need help now, Ravna. The woodcarvers are attacking now. There was a thumping, as if the transmitter was bouncing around. Another voice spoke, high-pitched and weirdly inarticulate. This is steel, Ravna. Jeffrey Wright. Woodcarver. The almost human voice dissolved into a hissing gobble. After a moment, she heard Jeffrey's voice. Ambush. The word is ambush. Yes, Woodcarver has done big, big ambush. They all around now. We die in hours if you not help. Woodcarver had never wanted to be a warrior, but ruling for half a thousand years requires a range of skills, and she had learned a about making war. Some of that, such as trusting to staff, she had temporarily unlearned these last few days. There had indeed been an ambush on Margram Climb, but not one that Lord Steele had planned, not the one that Lord Steele had planned. She looked across the tinted field at Vendacious. The pack was half hidden by noise baffles, but she could see he wasn't so jaunty as before. Being put to the question will loosen anyone's control. Vendacious knew his survival now depended on her keeping a promise. Yet, it was awful to think that Vendacious would live after he had killed and betrayed so many. She realized that two of herself were keening rage, lips curled back from clenched teeth. Her puppies huddled back from threats unseen. The tented area stank of sweat and the mind noise of too many people in too small a space. It took a real effort will of will to calm herself. She licked the puppies and daydreamed peaceful thoughts for a moment. Yes, she would keep her promises to Vendacious, and maybe it would be worth the price. Vendacious had only speculations about Steele's inner secrets, but he had learned far more about Steele's tactical situation than the other side could have guessed. Vendacious had known just where the Flenserists were hiding and in what numbers. Steele's folk had been overconfident about their super guns and their secret traitor. When Woodcarver's troops surprised them, victory had been easy, and now the Queen had some of these marvelous guns. From behind the hills, those cannons were still pounding away, eating through the stocks of ammunition the captured gunners had revealed. Vendacious the traitor had cost her much, but Vendacious the prisoner might yet bring her victory. Woodcarver? It was Scrupilo. She waved him closer. Her chief gunner edged out of the sun, sat out an intimate twenty-five feet away. Battle conditions had blown away all notions of decorum. Scrupilo's mind noise was an anxious jumble. He looked by parts exhausted and exhilarated and discouraged. It's safe to advance up the castle hill, your majesty, he said. Answering fire is almost extinguished. Parts of the castle walls have been breached. There is an end to the castles here, my queen. Even our own poor cannons would make it so. She bobbed agreement. Scrupilo spent most of his time with Dataset in learning to make cannons in particular. Woodcarver spent her time learning what those inventions ultimately created. But by now she knew far more than even Joanna about the social effects of weapons, from the most primitive to ones so strange they seemed not weapons at all. A thousand million times castle technologies had fallen to things like cannon. Why, sh why should her world be different? We'll move up then. From beyond the shade of the tent there was a faint whistle, a rare, incoming round. She folded the puppies within herself and paused a moment. Twenty yards away, Vendacious shrank down in great cower. But when it came, the explosion was a muffled thump above them on a hill. It might even have been one of our own. Now our troops must take advantage of the destruction. I want Steele to know that the old games of ransom and torture will only win him worse. 
will most likely win the starship and the child. The question was, would either be alive when they got them? She hoped Joanna would never know the threats and the risks she planned for the next few hours. Yes, Majesty, but Scrupillo made no move to depart, and suddenly seemed more bedraggled and worried than ever. Woodcarver, I fear. What? We have the tide. We must rush to sail on it. Yes, Majesty, but while we move forward, there are serious dangers coming up on their flanks and rear. The enemy's far scouts in the fires. Scrupillo was right. The flensorists who operated behind her lines were deadly. There weren't many of them. The enemy troops at Margram Climb had been mostly killed or dispersed. The few that ate at Woodcarver's flanks were equipped with ordinary crossbows and axes. But they were extraordinarily well-coordinated, and their tactics were brilliant. She saw the snouts and tines of Flenser himself in that brilliance. Somehow her evil child lived. Like a plague of years past, he was slipping back upon the world. Given time, those gorilla packs would seriously hurt Woodcarver's ability to supply her forces. Given time, two of her stood and looked Scrupillo in the eyes, emphasizing the point. All the more reason to move now, my friend. We are the ones far from home. We are the ones with limited numbers and food. If we don't win soon, then we will be cut up a bit at a time. Flensed. Scrupillo stood up, nodding submission. That's what Peregrine says, too. And Johanna wants to chase right through the castle walls. But there's something else, your majesty. Even if we must lunge all forward, I worked for a ten of ten days, using every clue I could understand from data set to make our cannon. Majesty, I know how hard it is to do such, yet the guns we captured on Margram have three times the range and one quarter the weight. How could they do it? There were chords of anger and humiliation in his voice. The traitor, Scrupillo jerked the snout in the direction of Vendacious, thinks they may have Johanna's brother, but Johanna says they have nothing like data set. Majesty, Steel has some advantage we don't yet know. Even the executions were not helping. Day by day, Steel felt his rage growing. Alone on the parapet, he whipped back and forth upon himself, barely conscious of anything but his anger. Not since he had been under the flenser's knife had the anger been such a radiant thing. Get back control before he cuts you more, the voice of some early Steel seemed to say. He hung on the thought, pulled himself together. He stared down the, at bloody drool and tasted ashes. Three of his shoulders were streaked with tooth cuts. He'd been hurting himself. Another habit of Flenser had cured him of long ago. Or Flenser had cured him of long ago. Hurt outwards, never toward yourself. Steele licked mechanically at the gashes and walked closer to the parapet's edge. At the horizon, gray-black haze obscured the sea and the islands. The last few days, the summer winds coming off the inland had been a hot breath, tasting of smoke. Now the winds were like fire themselves, whipping past the castle, carrying ash and smoke. All the last day around, the far side of Bitter Gorge had been a haze of fire. Today he could see the hillsides. They were black and brown, crowned with smoke that swept towards the sea's horizon. There were often brush and forest fly fires uh, in the high summer. But this year, as if nature was a godly pack of war, the fires had been everywhere. The wretched guns had done it. And this year, he couldn't retreat to the cool of Hidden Island and let the coastlings suffer. Steel ignored his smarting soldiers and paced the stones, more thoughtfully, almost analytical for a change. The creature Vendacious had not stayed bought. He had turned traitor to his, reason, to his treason. Steele had anticipated that Vendacious might be discovered. He had other spies who should have re reported such a thing. But there had been no sign, until the disaster at Margram Climb. Now the twist of Vendacious's knife had turned all his plans on their heads. Woodcarver would be here very soon, and not as a victim. Who would have guessed that he would really need the spacers to rescue him from Woodcarver? He had worked so hard to confront the Southerners before Ravna arrived, but now he did need that help from the sky, and it was more than five hours away. Steele almost slipped back into a rage state at the thought. In the end, would all the cozening of M.D. Jeffrey be for nothing? Oh, when this is over, how much will I enjoy killing those two? More than any of the others, they deserved death. They had caused so much inconvenience. They had consistently required his kindliest behavior, as though they ruled him. They had showered him with more insolence than ten thousand normal subjects. From the castle yard, there was the sound of laboring packs, straining winches, the screech and groan of rock being moved about. The professional core of Flenser's empire survived.
Given a few more hours, the breaches in the walls would be repaired and new guns would be brought in from the north. And the grand scheme can still succeed. As long as I am together, no matter what else is lost, it can succeed. Almost lost in the racket, he heard the click of claws of, on the inward steps. Steele drew back, turned all heads towards the sound. Shrek? But Shrek would have announced himself first. Then he relaxed. There was only one set of claw sounds. It was a singleton coming up the stairs. Flinzer's member cleared the steps and bowed to Steele, an incomplete gesture without other members to mirror it. The member's radio cloak shone clear and dark. The army was in awe of those cloaks, and of those singletons and duos who seemed smarter than the brightest pack. Even Steele's lieutenants, who understood what the cloak cloaks really were, even Shrek, were cautious and tentative around them. And now Steele needed the Flenzer fragment more than anyone, more than anything except Starfolk gullibility. Somebody just started up their truck. You can hear it. <laughs> what news? Leave to sit? Was the sar sardonic Flenser smile behind that request? Granted, snap st snapped steel. The singleton eased itself onto the, onto the stones, a parody of an insolent pack. But steel saw when the other winced. The fragment had been dispersed across the domain for almost twenty days now. Except for brief periods, he had been wrapped in radio cloaks that whole time. Dark and golden torture. Steel had seen this member without its cloak when it was bathed. Its pelt was rubbed raw at shoulder and haunch, where the weight of the radio was greatest. Bleeding sores had opened at the center of the bald spots. Alone without its cloak, the mindless singleton had blabbered its pain. Steele enjoyed those sessions, even if this one was not especially verbal. It was almost as if he, Steele, were now the one who teaches with a knife, and Flenzer were his pupil. The singleton was silent for a moment. Steele could hear its ill-concealed panting. The last day around has gone well, my lord. Not here. We've almost lost all our cam we've lost almost all our cannon. We're trapped inside these walls, and the Starfolk may arrive too late. I mean out there. The singleton poked its nose toward the open spaces beyond the parapet. Your scouts are well trained, my lord, and have some bright commanders. Right now, I am spread around Woodcarver's rear and flanks. The singleton made its part of a laughing gesture. Rear and flanks. Funny. To me, Woodcarver's entire army is like a single enemy pack. Our attack infantries are like uh, tines on my own paws. We are cutting the queen deep, my lord. I set the fire in Bitter Gorge. Only I could see exactly where it is spreading, exactly how to kill with it. In another four day arounds, there will be nothing left of the queen's supplies. She will be ours. Too long if we're dead this afternoon. Yes, the singleton cocked its head at steel. He's laughing at me, just like all those times under Flinders, Flenzer's knife, when a problem would be posed and death was the penalty for failure. But Ravenna and company should be back here in five hours, no? Steele nodded. Well, I guarantee you that will be hours ahead of Woodcarver's main assault. You have MD Jeffrey's confidence. It seems you need only advance and compress your previous schedule. If Ravenna is sufficiently desperate. The Starfolk are desperate, I know that. Ravenna might mask her precise motives, but her desperation was clear. And if you can slow Woodcarver... Steele settled all of himself down to concentrate on the scheming at hand. He was half conscious of his fears retreating. Planning was always a comfort. The problem is that we have to do two things now, and perfectly coordinated. Before, it was simply a matter to feign a siege and trick the starship into landing in the castle's jaws. He turned ahead in the direction of the courtyard. The stone dome over the landed starship had been in place since mid-spring. It showed some artillery damage now, the marble facing chipped away, but hadn't taken direct hits. Beside it lay the field of the Jaws, large enough to accept the rescue ship, but surrounded by pillars of stone, the teeth of the Jaws. With the proper use of gunpowder, the teeth would fall on the rescuers. That would be a last resort, if they didn't kill and capture the humans as they came out to meet dear Geoffrey. That scheme had been lovingly honed over many ten days, aided by M.D. Jeffrey's admissions about human psychology and his knowledge of how starships normally land. But now, now we really need their help. What I ask is, what I ask them must do double duty, to fool them, and to destroy Woodcarver. Hard to do all at once, agreed the cloak. Why not play it in two steps, the first more or less undeceitful? Have them destroy Woodcarver, then to worry about them make, then worry about them taking over. Steele clicked a tine, thoughtfully on stone. Yes, trouble is, if they see too much, they can't possibly be as naive as Geoffrey. 
He says that humankind has a history that includes castles and warfare. If they fly around too much, they'll see things that Geoffrey never saw or never understood. Maybe I could get them to land inside the castle and mount weapons on the walls. We'll have them hostage the moment that they stand between our jaws. Damn. That would take some clever work with empty Geoffrey. The bliss of abstract planning foundered for a moment of rage. It's getting harder and harder for me to deal with those two. They're both holy puppies, for pack's sake. The fragment paused a second. Of course, Emdriani Fani may have more raw intelligence than any pack I've ever seen. You think he may even be smart enough to see past his childness, childishness. He used the Sam Norsk word, and see the deception. No, not that. I have their necks in my jaws, and they still don't see it. You're right. Tyrethect, they do love me, and how I hate them for it. When I'm around him, the mantis thing is all over me, close enough to cut my throat or poke out my eyes, but hugging and petting, and expecting me to love him back. Yes, they believe everything I say, but the price is accepting unending insolence. Be cool, dear student. The heart of manipulation is to empathize without being touched. That fragment stopped, as always, just short of the brink. Steele felt himself hissing at the words even before he was consciously aware of his reaction. Don't lecture me. You are not Flenzer. You are a fragment. Shit. You are a fragment of a fragment now. A word and you will be cut up, dead in a thousand pieces. He tried to suppress the trembling that spread through his members. Why haven't I killed him before now? I hate Flenzer more than anything in the world, and it would be so easy. Yet that fragment was always so indispensable, somehow the only thing between steel and failure. And he was under Steele's control. And the singleton was doing a very good terrified cower. Sit up, you. Give me your counsel and not your lectures, and you will live. Whatever the reason, it's impossible for me to carry on the charade with these puppies. Perhaps for a few minutes at a time I can do it, or if there are other packs to keep them away from me. But none of this unending loving. Another hour of that and I... I know I'll start killing them. So, I want you to talk with Andy Jeffrey. Explain the situation. Explain... But the singleton was looking up at him in astonishment. I'll be watching. I'm not giving up those two to your possession. Just handle the close diplomacy. The fragment drooped, it, the pain in its shoulders undisguised. If that is your wish, my lord. Steel showed all his teeth. It is indeed. Just remember, I'll be present for everything important, especially direct radio communication. He waved the singleton off the parapet. Now go and cuddle up to the children. Learn something of self-control yourself. After the cloak was gone, he called Shrek up to the parapet. The next few hours were spent in touring the defenses and planning with his staff. Steele was very surprised how much clearing up the puppy problem improved his quality of mind. His advisors seemed to pick up on it, relaxed at the point of offering substantive suggestions. Where the breaches in the walls could not be repaired, they would build deadfalls. The cannon from the northern shops would arrive before the end of day round and one of Shrek's people had worked out an alternate plan for food and water resupply. Reports from the far scouts showed steady progress, a withering of the enemy's rear. They would lose most of their ammunition before they reached Starship Hill. Even now there was scarcely any shot falling on the hill. As the, runs, as the sun rose into the south, Steele was back on the parapets, scheming on just what to say to the starfolk. This was almost like earlier days, when plans went well and success was wondrous yet achievable. And yet, at the back of his mind, all the hours since talking with the singleton, there had been the little claws of fear. Steel had the appearance of ruling. The Flenzer fragment gave the appearance of following. But even though it was spread across miles, the pack seemed more together than ever before. Oh, in earlier times, the fragment often pretended equilibrium. But its internal tension always showed... Lately, it seemed self-satisfied, almost smug. The Flenzer fragment was responsible for the Domain's forces south of Starship Hill, and after today, after Steele had forced the responsibility upon him, the cloaks would be with M.D. Jeffrey every day. Never mind that the motivation had come from within Steele. Never mind that the fragment was in an obvious state of agonized exhaustion. In its full genius, the Great One could have, been charmed a forest, could have charmed a forest wolf into thinking Flenzer its queen. And do I really know what he's saying to the packs beyond my hearing? Could my spies be feeding me lies about him? Now that he had a moment away from immediate concerns, these little claws dug deeper. I need him, yes. But the margin of error is smaller now. After a moment, he grated a happy cord, accepting the risk. If necessary, he would use what he had learned with the second set of cloaks, something he had artfully concealed from Flenzer Tyrethect. 
If necessary, the fragment would find that death can be radio swift. Even as he flew the velocity match, Pham was working the ultra drive. This would save them hours of flyback time, but it was a chancy game, one the ship had never been designed for. OOB bounced all around the solar system. One really lucky jump was all they needed, and one really unlucky jump into the planet would kill them, a good reason why this game was not normally played. After hours of hacking the flight automation, of playing ultra drive roulette, poor Pham's hands were faintly trembling. Whenever Tyne's world came back into view, often no more than a fair, far point of blue light, he would glare for a second at it. Ravna could see the doubts rising within him. His memories told him that he should be good with low-tech automation, yet some of the OOB primitives were almost impenetrable. Or maybe his memories of competence, of the Cheng Ho, were cheap fakes. The blighter fleet, how long? asked Pham. Greenstock was watching the nav window from the rider's cabin. It was the fifth time the question had been asked in the last hour, yet her voice came back calm and patient. Maybe the repeated questions even seemed a natural thing. Range 49 light years. Estimated time of arrival 48 hours. Seven more ships have dropped out. Revna could subtract. 152 were still coming. Blue Shell's voter sounded over his mates. During the last 200 seconds, they have made slightly better time than before, but I think that that is local variance in bottom conditions. Sir Fam, you are doing well, but I know my ship. We could get a little uh, we could get a little more time if only you'd allow me control, please. Shut up. Fam's voice was sharp, but the words were almost automatic. It was a conversation, or the abortion of one, that occurred almost as often as Fam's demand for status info on the blighter fleet. In the early weeks of their journey, she had assumed that God Shatter was somehow superhuman. Instead, it was parts and pieces, automation loaded in a great panic. Maybe it was working right, or maybe it had run amok and was tearing Fam apart with its errors. The old cycle of fear and doubt was suddenly broken by soft blue light. Tyne's world. At last, a wondrously accurate jump, almost as good as the shocker of five hours before. Twenty thousand kilometers away hung a vast narrow crescent, the edge of planetary daylight. The rest was a dark blot against the stars, except where the auroral ring hung a faint green glow around the South Pole. Jeffrey Olsendot was on the other side of the world from them, in the Arctic day. They wouldn't have radio communication until they arrived, and she hadn't figured out how to recalibrate the ultrawave for short-range transmission. transmission. She turned back from the view. Pham still stared upward into the sky behind her. Pham, what good is 48 hours? Will we just destroy the countermeasure? What of Jeffrey and Mr. Steele's folk? Maybe, but there are other possibilities. There must be. That lasts softly. I've been chased before. I've been in j bigger jams before. His eyes avoided hers. Chapter 38 Jeffrey hadn't seen the sky for more than an hour in the last two days. He and MD were safe enough in the great stone dome that sheltered the refugee ship, but there was no way to see outside. If it weren't for Amdi, I couldn't have stood it a minute. In some ways, it was worse than even the first days on Hidden Island. The ones who killed Mom and Dad and Joanna were just a few kilometers away. They captured some of Mr. Steele's guns. In the last few days, the explosions had gone on for hours, a booming that shook the ground beneath them, and sometimes even smashed at the walls of the dome. Their food was brought into them, and when they weren't sitting at the ship's command cabin, the two wandered outside the ship to the rooms with the sleeping children. Geoffrey had kept up with the simple maintenance procedures he remembered, but looking through the chill transp of the cold-sleep coffins, he was terribly afraid. Some of them weren't breathing very much, the inside temperature seemed too high, and he and Amdi didn't know how to help. Nothing had changed here, but now there was a joy. Ravna's long silence had ended. Amdi Geoffrey and Misty, Mr. Steele actually talked to her in voice. Three more hours and her ship would be here. Even the bombardment had ended, almost as if Woodcarver realized that their her time was near to ending. Three more hours. Left to himself, Geoffrey would have spent the time in a state of wall-climbing anxiety. After all, he was nine years old now, a grown-up with grown-up problems. But then there was Andy. The pack was much smarter than Geoffrey in some ways, but he was such a little kid, about five years old, and as near as Andy Geoffrey could figure it. Except when he was into heavy thinking, he could not stay still. After the call from Ravna, Jeffrey wanted to sit down for serious worrying, but Amdi began chasing himself around the pylons. He shouted back and forth in Jeffrey's voice in Ravna's, and bumped the boy accidentally, on purpose. 
Jeffrey hopped up and glared at the careening puppies, just a little kid, and suddenly, happy and so sad all at once. Is this how Joanna saw me? And so he had responsibilities now, too, like being patient. As one of Amdi came rushing past his knees, Jeffrey swept down to grab the whip, wriggling form. He raised it to shoulder level as the rest of the pack converged gleefully, pounding on him from all directions. They fell to the dry moss and wrestled for a few seconds. Let's explore, let's explore. We have to be here for Ravna and Mr. Steele. Don't worry, we'll remember when. Okay, where was there really to go? The two walked through the torchlit dimness to the Celrestory uh, that rid, ringed the inner edge of the dome. As far as Geoffrey could see, they were alone. That was not unusual. Mr. Steele was very worried that woodcarver spies might get into the ship. Even his own soldiers rarely came there. Empty Geoffrey had investigated the inside wall before. Behind the quilts, the stone felt cool and damp. There were some holes to the outside, for ventilation, but they were almost ten meters up where the wall was already curving inwards towards the apex of the dome. The stone was rough cut, not yet polished. Mr. Steele's workers had been in a frantic hurry to complete the protection before. Woodcarver's army arrived. Nothing was polished, and the quilts were undecorated. Ahead and behind him, Amdi was sniffing at the cracks in fresh mortar. The one in Geoffrey's arms gave a concerted wiggle. Ha! Up ahead. I knew that mortar was coming loose, the pack said. Geoffrey let all of his friend rush toward a, lo a nook in the wall. It didn't look any different from them before, but Amdi was scratching with five pairs of paws. Even if you can get it loose, what good does it do you? Geoffrey had seen these blocks as they were lowered into place. They were almost fifty centimeters across, laid in alternating rows. Getting past one would just bring them to more stone. Heh <laughs> heh, I don't know. I've been saving up th this up till we had some time to kill. Yuck, the mortar burns my lips. More scratching, and the pack passed back as a fragment as big as Geoffrey's head. Ugh, passed back a fragment as big as Geoffrey's head. <sighs> There really was a hole between the blocks, and it was big enough for Amdi. One of him darted into the tiny cave. Satisfied? Geoffrey plunked himself down by the hole and tried to look in. Guess what? Amdi's shrill came from a member right by his ear. There's a tunnel back here, not just another layer of stone. A member wriggled past Geoffrey and disappeared into the dark. Secret tunnels? That was too much like a Nijoran fairy tale. These are big enough for a full-grown member, Geoffrey. You could get through these on your hands and knees. Two more of Amdi's uh, disappeared into the hole. The tunnel had he had discovered might be large enough for a human child, but the entrance hole was a tight fit even for the puppies. Geoffrey had nothing to do but stare into the darkness. The parts of Amdi that remained at the entrance talked about what he had found. Goes on for a long, long way. I've doubled back a couple of times. The top of me is about five meters up, way over your head. This is kooky. I'm getting all strung out. Amdi sounded even sillier than his normal playfulness. Two more of him went into, the, went into the hole. This was developing into a serious adventure that Geoffrey could have no part of. Don't go too far. It might be dangerous. One of the pair that remained looked up at him. Don't worry, don't worry. The tunnel isn't an accident. It feels like it was cut as, gro as grooves in the stones when they were laid. This is some special escape route Mr. Steele made. I'm all right. I'm all right. Ha ha. Hoo hoo. One more disappeared into the hole. After a moment, the last remaining one ran in, but stayed near enough to the entrance so Amdi could still talk to Geoffrey. The pack was having a high old time, singing and screeching to itself. Geoffrey knew exactly what the other was up to. It was another of the games he could never play. In this posture, Amdi's thoughts uh, would be the weirdest rippling things. Darn. Now that he was playing within stone, it must be even neater than before, since he was totally cut off from all thoughts except from member to adjacent member. The stupid singing went on a little longer, and then Amdi spoke in an almost reasonable tone. Hey, this tunnel actually splits off in places. The front of me has come to a fork. One side is heading down. Wish I had enough members to go both ways. Well, you don't. Hey ho, I'll take the upper tunnel today. A few seconds of silence. There's a little door here, like a member-sized room door, not locked. Amdi relayed the sounds of stone scritching against stone. Ha, huh, I can see light. Up just a few more meters, it opens onto a window. Hear the wind. He relayed the wind sound and the keening of the seabirds that soared up from Hidden Island. It sounded wonderful. Oh, oh, this is stretching things, but I want to look out. Geoffrey, I can see the sun. I'm outdoors, sitting way up on the side of the dome. I can see all around to the south. Boy, it's smoky down there. What about the hillside? 
Jeffrey asked the nearest member. Its white splotched pelt was barely visible through the entrance hole. At least Amdi was staying in touch. A little browner than the last ten day. I don't see any soldiers out there. Relayed sound of a cannon firing. Yipes, we're shooting through. We're shooting, though. It hit just the so on the side of the crest. There's someone out there, just below of my line of sight. Woodcarver, come at last. Geoffrey shivered, angry that he couldn't see, frightened of what might be seen. He often had nightmares about what Woodcarver must truly be, how she had done it to Mom and Dad and Joanna. Images never fully formed, yet almost memories. Mr. Steele will get Woodcarver. Oh, oh, old Tyrethect is coming across the castle yard this way. Thumping sounds came from a hole as Amdi blundered back down. No point in letting Tyrethect know that there was a tunnel hidden in the wall. He'd probably just ordered them to stay away from it. One, two, three, four. Half of Amdi popped out of the wall. The four wandered around a little dazedly. Jeffrey couldn't tell if it was because of their stretched out experience or if they were temporarily split from the other half of the pack. Act natural. Act natural. Then the other four arrived, and Amdi began to settle down. He led Jeffrey away from the wall at a fast trot. Let's get the comm set. We'll pretend we've been trying to raise Ravna with it. Amdi knew well that the starship couldn't be back for another thirty minutes or so. In fact, he had been the one who verified the math for Mr. Steele. Nevertheless, he chased up the ship's, ship's steps and dragged down the radio. The two were already plugging the antenna into a signal booster when the public doors on the west side of the dome were unlatched. Silhouetted against the daylight were parts of a guard pack and a single mother member of Tyrethect. The guard retired, sliding the doors shut, and the cloak walked slowly across the moss toward them. Amdi rushed over and chattered about their attempts to use the radio. It was a little forced, Jeffrey thought. The puppies were still confused by their trip through the walls. The singleton looked at the powdering mortar, uh, powdering of mortar dust on Amdi's pelt. You've been climbing in the walls, haven't you? What? Amdi looked himself over, noticed the dust. Usually he was more clever. Yes, he said shamefacedly. He brushed the powder away. You won't tell, will you? Fat chance he'll help us, said thought Geoffrey. Mr. Tyrethect had learned Sam Norsk even better than Mr. Steele, and besides Steele was the only one who had much time to talk with them. But even before the radio cloaks, he'd been a short-tempered, bossy sort. Geoffrey had had babysitters like him. Tyrethect was nice up to a point, and then would get sarcastic or say something mean. Lately that had improved, but Geoffrey still didn't like him much. But Mr. Tyrethect didn't say anything right away. He sat down slowly, as if his rump hurt. No, I won't tell. Jeffrey exchanged a surprised glance with one of Amdi. What is the tunnel for? he asked timidly. All castles have hidden tunnels, especially in my... in the domain of Mr. Steel. You want ways to escape, ways to spy on your enemies. The singleton shook its head. Never mind. Is your radio properly receiving, Amdi Jeffrey? Amdi cocked a head at the comms display. I think so, but there's nothing yet to receive. See, Ravna's ship had to decelerate, and, um... I could show you the arithmetic, but Mr. Tyrethect was obviously not interested in playing with chalkboards. Well, depending on their luck with the Ultra Drive, we should have a radio with them real soon. But the little window on the comm showed no incoming signal. They watched it for several minutes. Mr. Tyrethect lowered his muzzle and seemed to sleep. Every few seconds his body twitched as with a dream. Jeffrey wondered what the rest of him was doing. Then the comm window was glowing green. There was a garble of sound as it tried to sort signal from background noise. Over you in five minutes, came Ravna's voice. Jeffrey, are you listening? Yes, we're here. Let me talk to Mr. Steele, please. Mr. Tyrethect uh, stopped near the, nearer to the comm. He is not here right now, Ravna. Who is this? Tyrethect's laugh was a, was a giggle. He had never heard any other kind. I... He made the tinish chord that sounded like Tyrethect to Jeffrey. Or do you mean a taken name, like Steel? I don't know the exact word. You may call me Mr. Skinner. Tyrethect laughed again. For now, I can speak for Steel. Jeffrey, are you all right? Yes, yes. Listen to Mr. Skinner. What a strange name. The sounds from the comm became muffled. There was a male voice, arguing. Then Ravna was back, her voice kind of tight, like Mom when she was mad. Jeffrey... What's the volume of a ball ten centimeters across? 
MD had been fidgeting impatiently through the conversation. All through the last year, he had been hearing stories of humans from Jeffrey and dreaming what Ravna might really be like. Now he had the chance to show off. He jumped for the comm and grinned at Jeffrey. That's easy, Ravna. His voice was perfect Jeffrey and completely fluent. It's 523.598 cubic centimeters. Or do you want more digits? Muffled conversation. No, that's fine. Okay, Mr. Skinner, we have pictures from our earlier pass in a general radio fix. Where exactly are you? Under the castle dome at the top of Shar's starship hill. It's right at the coast by a... The man's voice cut in. Fan? He had a funny accent. I got it on the map. We still can't see you direct. Too much haze. That's smoke, said the co cloak. The enemy is almost upon us from the south. We need your help immediately. The singleton lowered its head from the comm set. Its eyes closed and opened a couple of times. Thinking? Hmm, yes. Without your help, we and Jeffrey and the ship are lost. Please land within the castle courtyard. You know we've specially reinforced it for your arrival. Once down, we can use your weapons too. No way, the guy replied immediately. Just separate the friendlies from the bad guys and let us take care of things. Tarathek's voice took on a wheedling tone, like a little kid complaining. He really has been studying us. No, no, didn't mean to be impolite. Certainly, do it your way. About the enemy force. Everyone's close to the castle on the south side of the hill are the enemy. A single pass with your ship's, um, torch would send them running. I can't fly that torch inside an atmosphere. Did your pop really land with the main jet, Jeffrey? No agrav? Yes, sir. All we had was the jet. He was a lucky genius. Maybe we... Ravna. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Ravna. Maybe we could just float across, a few thousand meters up. That might scare them away. Tyrothek began. Yes, that might. The public doors on the north side of the dome slid open. Mr. Steele stood, stood silhouetted against the daylight beyond. Let me talk to them, he said. The goal of all their voyaging lay just twenty kilometers below OOB. They were so close, yet those twenty thousand meters might be hard, might be as hard to bridge as the twenty thousand light years they had come so far. They floated on the agrav directly over Starship Hill. OOB's multispectral wasn't working very well, but where the smoke did not obscure, the ship's optics could count the needles on the trees below. Ravna could see the forces of woodcarver ranged across the slopes south of the castle. There were other troops, and apparently cannon, hidden in the uh, forests that lined the fjord south of that. Given a little more time, they would be able to locate them, too. Time was the one thing that they did not have. Time and trust. Forty-eight hours, fam. Then the fleet will be here, all around us. Maybe. Maybe God Shatter could work a miracle. They'd never know stewing about it up here. Try. You've got to trust somebody, fam. Fam glared back at her, and for an instant she feared he might go completely to pieces. You'd land in the middle of that castle? Medieval villains are just as smart as any you've seen in the beyond, Rav. They could teach the butterflies a thing or two. An arrow in the head will kill you just as sure as an antimatter bomb. More fake memories? But Fam was right on this. She thought about the just-concluded conversation. The second pack, Steel, had been a bit too insistent. He had been good to Jeffrey, but he was clearly desperate and she believed him when he said that a high flyby wouldn't scare the woodcarvers off. They needed to come down near the ground with firepower. Just now, about all the firepower they had was Fam's bean gun. Bean gun. Okay, then. Do what you and Steele talked about. Fly the lander past woodcarvers' lines. Laser blast them. God damn it, you know I can't fly that. The landing boat is nothing like either of us know, and without the automation I... Softly. Without the automation, you need blue shell, Fam. There was horror on Fam's face. She reached out to him. He was silent for a long moment, not seeming to notice. Yeah, his voice was low, strangled. Then, Blue Shell, get up here. OOB's lander had more than enough room for the Scrode Rider and Fam Nguyen. The craft had been built specifically for rider use. With higher automation working, it would have been easy for Fam, for even a child, to fly. Now the craft could not provide stable flight, and the manual controls were something uh, that e gave even Blue Shell a hard time. Damn automation. Damn optimization. For most of his adult life, Fam had lived in the sl slowness. All those decades, he had managed spacecraft and weapons that could have reduced the feudal empire below to slag. Yet now, with equipment that should have been enormously more powerful, he couldn't even fly a damn landing boat. 
Across the crew compartment, Blue Shell was at the pilot's position. His frond stretched across a web of supports and controls. He turned off all display automation. Only the main window was alive, a natural view from the boat's bow camera. OOB floated some hundred meters ahead, drifting up and out of view as their craft slid backwards and down. Blue Shell's fidgety nervousness, furativeness, it seemed to Fam, had disappeared as he got into piloting the craft. His voter voice became terse and preoccupied, and the edges of his fronds writhed across the controls, an exercise that would have been impossible to fan, even if he had a lifetime of experience with the, ge with the gear. Thank you, Sir Fan. I'll prove you can trust. The nose lurched downwards, and they were staring almost straight into the fjord car carven coastline twenty kilometers below. They fell free for half a minute, while the rider's fronds writhed on their supports. Hot piloting? No. Sorry, sorry. Acceleration, and Fam sank into his restraints under a grav load that wobbled between a tenth G and an intolerable crush. The landscape rotated, and they had a brief glimpse of OOB, now like a tiny moth above them. Is it necessary to kill, Sir Fam? Perhaps simply our appearance over the battle? Nguyen gritted his teeth. Just get us down. The steel creature had been adamant that they try to fry the entire hillside. Despite all Fam's suspicions, the pack might be right on that. They were up against a crew of murderers that had not hesitated to ambush a starship. The woodcarvers needed a real demonstration. Their boat fluttered down the kilometers. Steel's fortifications were clearly visible even in the natural view. The rough polygon that guarded the refugee ship, the much larger structure that rambled across an island several kilometers westward. I wonder if this is how my father's castle looked to the Cheng Ho landers. Those walls were high and unsloping. Clearly the Tynes had no idea of gunpowder till Ravna had clued them to it. The valley south of the castle was a blot of dark smoke smoothly streaming toward the sea. Even without data enhancement, he could see hot spots, fringes of orange edging the black. You're at two thousand meters, came Ravna's voice. Geoffrey says he can see you. Patch me through to them. I will try, Sir Fam. Blue Shell fiddled, his lack of attention spinning the boat through a complete loop. Fam had seen falling leaves with more control. A child's piping voice. Are you okay? Don't crash. And then the steel's, steel pack's hybrid of Ravna in the kid. South to go, south to go. Use fire gun, burn them quick. Blue Shell was entirely too cooperative to this direction. He had them down in the smoke already. For seconds they were flying blind. A break in the smoke showed the hillside, less than two hundred meters off, coming up fast. Before Fam could curse at Blue Shell, the rider had turned them around and floated the boat into clearer air. Then he pitched over, so they might see directly down. After thirty weeks uh, of talk and planning, Fam had his first glimpse of the Tynes. Even from here, it was obvious they were different from any Safants Fam had encountered. Clusters of four or five or six members hung together so close they seemed a single spider-like being and each pack stood separated from the others by ten or fifteen meters. A cannon flashed in the murk. The pack crewing it moved like a single coordinated hand to rock the barrel back and ram another charge down the muzzle. But if these are the enemy, Sir Fam, where did they get the guns? They stole them. But muzzle loaders? He didn't have time to pursue the thought. You're right over them, Fam. I can see you in and out of the smoke. You're drifting south at fifteen meters per second, losing altitude. It was the kid, speaking with his usual incredible precision. Kill them. Kill them. Fam wriggled out of his restraints and crawled back to the hatch where they had mounted his beam gun. It was about the only thing salvaged from the workshop fire, but by God, this was something he could operate. Keep a steady, Blue Shell. Bounce me around and I'll fry you as likely as anything. He pushed open the hatch and gagged on spicy smoke. Then Blue Shell's agraves wafted them into clear space, uh, and Fam lined the beamer down the ranks of pack folk. Originally, Woodcarver had demanded Joanna stay at the base camp. Joanna's response had been explosive. Even now, the girl was a little surprised at herself. Not since the first days on Tyne's world had she come cl so close to attacking a pack. No way was anyone going to keep her from finding out about Geoffrey. In the end, they had compromised. Joanna would accept Pilgrim as her guard. She could follow the army into the field as long as she obeyed his direction. Joanna looked up through the drifting smoke. Damn. Pilgrim was always such a carefree joker. By his own telling, he had gotten himself killed over and over again through the years, and now he wouldn't even let her up to Scrupilo's cannons. The two of them paced across a terrace in the hillside. The brush fire had swept through here hours before. 
and the spicy, spicy smell of moss ash was thick around them. And with that smell came the bright memory of horror of a year ago right here. Trusted guard packs paced their course 20 meters on either side. This area was supposedly safe from infiltration, and there had been no artillery fire from the Flenserists for hours. But Peregrine absolutely refused to let her get any closer. It's nothing like last year. Then all had been sunny blue skies and clean air, and her parents' murder. Now she and Pilgrim had returned, and the blue sky was yellow-gray, and the sweeps of mossy hillside were black. And now the packs were now the packs around her were fighting with her, and now there was a chance. Let me closer, damn it. Woodcarver will have the Oliphant, no matter what happens to me. Peregrine shook himself, a tinish negative. One of the puppies reached out from a jacket pouch to catch at her sleeve. A little longer, Pilgrim said for the tenth time. Wait for Woodcarver's messenger. Then we can... I want to be up there. I'm the only one who knows the ship. Geoffrey, Geoffrey, if only Vendacious was right about you. She was twisting about to slap at Scarbutt when it happened. A glare of heat on her back, and the smoke flashed bright. Again, again, and then the impact of rapid thunder. Pilgrim shuddered against her. That's not gunfire, he shouted. Two of me are almost blinded. Come on. He surrounded her, almost knocking her off her feet as he pushed slash dragged her down the hill. For a second, Joanna went along, more dazed and cooperative. Somehow they had lost their escort. From up the hill, the shouts of battle had stopped. The sharp thunder had silenced all. Where the smoke thinned, she could see one of Scrupilo's cannons, the barrel extending from a puddle of melted steel. The cannoneer had been blown to bits, not gunfire. Joanna spasmed out, spasmed out of Pilgrim's grip. Not gunfire. Spacers! Pilgrim! That must be a drive torch. Peregrine grabbed her, continuing down the hill. Not a drive torch. That I've heard. This is quieter, and someone's aiming it. There had been a long stutter of separate blasts. How many of Woodcarver's people had just died? They must think we're attacking, attacking the ship, Pilgrim. If we don't do something, they'll wipe out everyone. His jaws eased their grip on her sleeves and pants. What can we do? Hanging around here will just get us killed. Joanna stared into the sky. No sign of flyers, but there was so much smoke. The sun was a dull, bloody ball. If only the rescuers knew that they were killing her friends. If only they could see. She dug her feet into the ground. Let go of me, Pilgrim. I'm going uphill, out of the smoke. He'd stopped moving, but his grip was fiercely tight. Four adult faces and two puppy ones looked up at her, and indecision was in every look. Please, Pilgrim. It's the only way. Packs were straggling down, some bleeding, some in fragments. His frightened eyes stared at her an instant longer. Then he let go and touched her hand with a nose. I guess this hill will always be the death of me. First scriber, now you. You're all crazy. The old pilgrim smile flickered across his members. Okay, let's try it. The two without puppies went up the hillside, scouting for the safest route. Joanna and the rest of him followed. They were moving across a sloping terrace. The summer drought had drained the chill swamp water he, she remembered from the landing, and the blackened moss was firm under her. The going should have been easy, but Peregrine wound through the deepest hummocks, hunkering down every few seconds to look in all directions. They reached the end of the terrace and began climbing. There were places so steep she had to grab the epaulet stirrups on two of Peregrine and let him hoist her up. They passed the nearest cannon, what was left of it, Joanna had never seen weapons fired except in stories, but the splash of metal and the carbonized flesh could only mean some kind of beam weapon. Running across the hill were similar craters, destruction punched into the already burned land. Joanna leaned against a smooth rounding of rock. Just pull over this one, and we're on the next terrace. Pilgrim's voice came in her ear. Hurry, I hear shouting. He leaned two of himself down, tilting his epaulets toward her hands. She grabbed them and jumped. For a moment, she and the pack teetered over a four-meter fall, and then she was lying on a brownish, unburned moss. Pilgrim clustered around her, hiding her. She peeked out between his legs. The outermost walls of Steel's castle were visible from here. Tinish archers stood boldly on the ramparts, taking advantage of the chaos among Woodcarver's troops. In fact, the Queen's force had not lost many packs in the air attack, but even the unwounded were milling around. The Queen's soldiers were no cowards, Joanna knew that by now, but they had just been confronted by force beyond all defense. Overhead, the smoke faded into blue. The battlefield ahead of her lay under clear sky. In the years before the High Lab, Joanna and her mother had often gone on nature trips over Bigby Marsh at Strom. 
with the sensors on their camper packs, they'd had no trouble watching the sky sky wings from here. Even if this flyer's automation was not specifically looking for a human on the ground, it should notice her. Do you see anything? The four adult heads angled back and forth in coordinated pairs. No, the flyer must be very far away, or behind the smoke. Nuts. Joanna came off her knees, trotted towards the castle walls. They must be watching there. Woodcarver's not going to like this. Two of the queen's soldiers were already running toward them, attracted by their purposeful movement or the sight of Joanna. Pilgrim waved them back. Alone on an open field less than two hundred meters from the castle wall, even with normal vision, how could they be overlooked? In fact, they were noticed. There was a soft hissing, and a meter-long arrow thunked into the turf on their left. Scarbutt grabbed her shoulder, pulling her to a crouch. The puppies shifted his shield into position. Pilgrim made a barricade of himself on the castle side and started back out to back out of range. Back into the smoke. No, run parallel. I want to be seen. Okay, okay. Soft sounds of death whispered down. Joanna kept one hand on his shoulder as they ran across the field. She felt Scarbutt falter. The arrow had caught him in the thick of his shoulder, centimeters from a tympanum. I'm okay. Stay down. Stay down. The front line of Woodcarver's force was rallying toward them now, a dozen packs racing towards the terra- across the terrace. Pilgrim bounced up and down, shouting with a voice that f- punched like physical force. Something about staying back and danger from the sky. It didn't stop their advance. They want you away from the arrows. And suddenly they noticed that the fire from the castle had stopped. Pilgrim scanned the sky. It's back, coming from the east, maybe a kilometer out. She looked in the direction he was pointing. It was a lumpy thing, probably space-based, though it had no ultra-drive spines. It bobbled and staggered. There was no sign of jets. Some kind of agrav? Non-humans? The thought skittered through her mind, alongside the joy. Pale light flickered from a mast on its belly and dirt geysered around the troops who were racing to protect her. Against the stuttering thunder, only now the light was marching right across her friends toward her. Amdi Jeffrey was on the battlements. Steel hid his glares from the two. There simply was no help for it. Ravna had demanded Jeffrey be by the radio to guide the strike. The human was not completely stupid. It shouldn't make any difference. An army looks like an army whether it is a foe or friend. Very soon the army beyond these walls would cease to exist. How did the first run go? Ravna's voice came clearly from the comm set. But it wasn't Jeffrey who answered. All eight of Emdriani Fani was poking through around the battlements, some of him sitting on the cr- uh, crenellations, practicing stereo vision, others eyeing steel and the radio. Telling him to stay back had no effect. Now MD answered the question with Jeffrey's voice. Okay, I counted 15 pulses. Only 10 hit anything. I bet I could shoot better than that. Damn it, that's the best I can do with this, unknown words. The voice was not ravenous. Steel heard the irritation in it. Everyone can find someone to, something to hate in these pups. The thought warmed him. Please, said Steel. Fire again. Again. He looked over the stonework. The air attack had taken out a band of enemy by the edge of the near terrace. It was spectacular destruction, like enormous cannon blows, or the separate landing of twenty starships. And all from the little craft that fluttered like a falling leaf. The enemy front line was dissolving in panic. Up and down the ramparts, his own troops danced about their stations. Things had been bleak since their cannon were knocked out. They needed something to cheer about. The archers trek. Shoot upon the survivors. Then, continuing in Samnorsk, the front ranks are still coming. They are. They are. Damn. What's the word for? Confident? They will kill us without more help. The human child looked at Steel in puzzlement. If he called that a lie, then a moment later Ravna said, I don't know. They're well back from your walls. At least all I can see. At least all that I can see. I don't want to butcher. Rapid fire conversation with the human in the flyer, perhaps not even in Samnorsk. The gunner did not sound pleased. Fam will pull back a few kilometers, she said. We can come back instantly if your enemy advances. Sst. Shrek's high talk hiss was like a physical jab. Steel wheeled, glaring. How dare. But his lieutenant was wide eyed, pointing toward the center of the battlefield. Of course, Steel had a pair of eyes in that direction, but he wasn't been, he hadn't been paying attention. The other two legs. The mantis figure dropped behind an accompanying, accompanying pack, mercifully before MD Jeffrey noticed. Thank the pack of packs that puppies are nearsighted. Steel swept forward, surrounding some of MD, shouting at the others to get off the parapet. 
Both of Tyrathek ran in close, physically grabbing for the disobedient wretches. Get below, Steel screamed in Tynish. For a second, all was confusion, as his own mind sounds mixed with the puppies. Amdi tumbled away from him, thoroughly distracted by the noise and the rough handling. And then in Sam Norsk, Steel said, There are more cannons out there. Get below before you're hurt. Jeffrey started for the parapet. But I don't see. Unfortunately, there was nothing special to see. Now, the other two legs uh, was still crouched behind one of Woodcarver's packs. Shrek took the human child in paw and jaw. He and one of the Tyrathect, or he and one of Tyrathect, hustled the protesting children down the stairs. As they departed, Tyrathect was already embellishing on Steele's story, reporting on the troops it could see from below the crest of the hill. Blow up the lesser powder dump, Steele hissed at the departing Shrek. That dump was near empty, but its destruction might persuade the spacers where words could not. After they were gone, Steele stood for an instant, silent and shivering. He had never seen disaster so narrowly avoided. Along the ramparts, his archers were showering arrows upon an enemy pack and the two, two legs. Damn, they were almost out of range. In the castle yard, Shrek didn't... Uh, Shrek detonated the lesser dump. The explosion was a satisfying one, much louder than an artillery hit. <clears throat> one of the inner towers was blown apart. Flying rock showered the yard, the smallest peaches, pieces reaching all the way to where steel stood on the ramparts. Ravna's voice was sh shouting in swift Samnorsk, too fast for steel to understand. Now all the planning, all the hopes, all balanced on a knife's edge. He must bet everything. Steele leaned a close shoulder close to the comm and said, Sorry, things go fast here. Many more woodcarver come up under smoke. Can you kill all on hill, hill, uh, can you kill all on hillside? Could the mantises see through smoke? That was part of the gamble. The gunner's voice came back. I can try. Watch this. A third voice, thready and narrow even by human standards. It will be fifty seconds more, Sir Steele. We're having trouble turning. Good. Concentrate on your flying and your killing. Don't look at your victims too carefully. The archers had driven the human back, partway under the cover of smoke. Other packs were rushing out to protect her. By the time the visitors circled back, there would be lots of targets, the human lost among them. Two of them caught, clear, caught sight of the spacer floating down through the haze. The visitors would have no clear view of what they were shooting at. Pale light flickered from beneath the craft. A scythe swept across the hillside toward Woodcarver's troops. Fam was bounced around his perch as Blue Shell turned the boat pack back to the target. They weren't moving fast. The airstream couldn't have been more than thirty meters per second, but every second was full of the damnedest jerks and tumbles. At one point, Fam's grip on the gun mount was all that kept him indoors. Forty some hours from now, the deadliest thing in the universe is going to arrive, and I'm taking pot shots at dogs. How to take out the hillside? Steele's whiny voice still echoed in his ears and Ravna wasn't sure what OOB was seeing beneath all the smoke. We might do better without automation than with the, this bastard mix. At least his beamer had a manual control. Fam embraced the barrel with one arm while he reached with the other. At wide dispersion, the beam was useless against armor, but could burst eyes and set skin and hair afire. And the beam width would be dozens of meters across at ground level. Fifteen seconds, Sir Fam. Blue Shell's voice came in his ear. They were low this time. Gaps in the smoke flickered past like, like stop-action art. Most of the ground was burned over black, but there were precipices of naked rock and even sooty patches of snow trapped in crannies and shadow shadow shadowed pits. Here and there was a pile of doggy bodies, an occasional gun tube. There's a crowd of them ahead, Sir Fam, running near the castle. Fam leaned down and looked forward. The mod mob was about four hundred meters ahead. They were running parallel to the castle walls through a field that was a spine hide of arrow shafts. He pressed the firing stud, swept the beam out from below the boat. There was plenty of water under that dried cover. It exploded in steam as the beam passed over it. But further out, the wide dispersion wasn't doing much. It would be another few seconds before he'd have a good shot at the hapless packs. Time for the little suspicions. How come the enemy had muzzle-loading cannon? Those they must have made themselves, in a world with no evidence of firearms. Steel was the classic evil, or classic medieval manipulator. Fam had spotted the type from a thousand light years out. They were doing the critters dirty work, that was obvious. Shut up, deal with Steel later. Slanting in on the packs, Fam fired again, sweeping through the living flesh this time. He fired ahead of them and on the castle side, maybe they wouldn't all die. He stuck his head further into the slipstream, trying for a better view. 
Ahead of the packs was a hundred meters of open field, a single pack of four, and a human figure, black-haired and slim, jumping and waving. Fan smashed the barrel up against the hole, safing it at the same time. The back flash was a surge of heat that crisped his eyebrows. Blue shell, get us down, get us down. Chapter 39 A Bad Understanding She was lied to. Ravna tried to read something behind the voice. Steele's Samnorsk was as creaky as ever, those ch tones childish and whiny. He sounded no different than before, but his story was stretched very thin by what had just happened. He was either a galaxy master of impudence, or his story was actually true. The human must have been hurt, then lied to by Woodcarver. This explains a lot, Ravna. Without her, Woodcarver would, could not attack. Without her, all may be safe. Fam's voice came to Ravna on a private channel. The girl was unconscious during part of the ambush, Rav, but she practically scratched my eyes out when I suggested she might be wrong about Steel and Woodcarver, and the pack with her is a lot more convincing than Steel. Ravna looked questioningly across the deck at Greenstock. Fam didn't know she was here. Tough. Greenstock was an island of sanity amidst the madness, and she knew the OOB infinitely better than Ravna. Steel spoke into her hesitation. See now, nothing has changed except for the better. One more human lives. How can you doubt us? Speak to Geoffrey. He understands. We have done the best for the children in... A gobbling noise, and another voice said, Cold sleep. Certainly. You must speak to him again, Steele. He's our best proof of your good intentions. Okay. In a few minutes, Ravna. But see, he is also my good protection against treachery from you. I know how powerful you visitors are. I fear you. We need to... Gobbling consultation... Accommodate each other in our fears. Um, we'll work something out. Just let us speak to Geoffrey now. Yes. Ravna switched channels. What do you think, fam? There's no question in my mind. This Joanna is not a naive kid like Geoffrey. We've always known Steele was a tough critter. We just had some other facts wrong. The landing site is in the middle of his territory. He's the killer. Fam's voice became quieter, almost a whisper. Hell of it is. This may not change anything. Steel does have the ship. I've got to get in there. It will be another ambush. I know, but does it matter? If we can get uh, me time with the countermeasure, it could be, it will be, worth it. What matter a suicide mission within a suicide mission? I'm not sure, fam. If we give him everything, he'll kill us before we ever get near the ship. He'll try. Look, just keep him talking. Maybe we can get directional on his radio, blow the bastard away. He did not sound optimistic. Tyrathecta didn't take them back to the ship, or to their rooms. They descended the stairs within the outer walls, part of Amdi first, then Geoffrey with the rest of Amdi, then the singleton from Tyrathect. Amdi was still complaining. I don't understand. I don't understand. We can help. Geoffrey, I didn't see any enemy cannons. The singleton was full of explanations, though it sounded even more preoccupied than usual. I saw them from one of my other members out in the valley. We're pulling in all our soldiers. We must make a stand, or none of us will be alive to be rescued. For now, this is the best place for you to be. How do you know? said Geoffrey. Can you talk to Steele right now? Yes, one of me is still up there with him. Well, tell him we have to help. We can talk better Sam Norsk, even than you. I'll tell him right now, was the co cloak's quick reply. There were no more window slots cut in the walls. The only light came from wick torches set every ten meters along the tunnel. The air was cool and musty. Wetness glistened on unquilted stone. The tiny doors were not of polished wood. Instead, there were bars and darkness beyond. Where are we going? Geoffrey was suddenly reminded of the dungeons and stories, the treachery that befell the greater two, and the Countess of the Lake. MD didn't seem to feel it. For all his mischievous nature, Puppies was basically trusting... He had always depended on Mr. Steele, but Geoffrey's parents had never acted quite like this, even during the escape from High Lab. Mr. Steele suddenly, suddenly seemed so different, as if he couldn't be bothered pretending to be nice anymore. And Geoffrey had never really trusted the Solon Tyrathect. Now that one was acting downright sneaky. There had been no new threat on the hillside. Fear and stubbornness and suspicion all came together. Geoffrey spun around, confronting the cloak. We're not going any farther. This isn't where we're supposed to go. We want to talk to Ravna and Mr. Steele. A sudden, liberating realization. And you're not big enough to stop us. The singleton backed up abruptly, then sat down. 
It lowered its head, blinked. So you don't trust me. You were right not to. There is no one here but yourselves that you can trust. Its gaze drifted from Jeffrey to the ranks of Amdi and then down the hall. Steele doesn't know I've brought you here. The confession was so quick, so easily made. Jeffrey swallowed hard. You brought us down here to kill us. All of Amdi was staring at him in Tyrethect, every eye wide with shock. The singleton bobbed its head in part of a smile. You think I am a traitor? After all this time, some healthy suspicion. I am proud of you. Mr. Tyrethect continued smoothly. You are surrounded by traitors, Amdi Jeffrey, but I am not one of them. I am here to help you. I know that. Amdi reached forward to touch a muzzle to the singletons. You're no traitor. You're the only person besides Jeffrey that I can touch. We've always wanted to like you, but... Ah, uh, but you should be suspicious. You will all die if you aren't. Tyrethect looked over the puppies at the frowning Jeffrey. Your sister is alive, Jeffrey. She's out there now, and Steele has known all along. He killed your parents. He did almost everything he said Woodcarver did. Amdi backed away, shaking himself in frightened negations. You don't believe me? That's funny. Once upon a time I was such a good liar, I could talk the fish right into my mouths. But now, when only the truth will work, I can't convince you. Listen. Suddenly it was Steele's human-speaking voice that came from the singleton, Steele talking with Ravna about Joanna being alive, excusing the attack he had just ordered on her. Joanna. Geoffrey rushed forward, fell on his knees before the cloak. Almost without thought, he grabbed the singleton by the throat, shaking it. Teeth snapped at his hands as the other tried to shake free. Amdi rushed forward and pulled, pulled hard on his sleeves. After a moment, Geoffrey let go. Centimeters away from his face, the singleton peered back at him, the torchlight glinting in its dark eyes. Amdi was saying, Human voices are easy to fake. That fragment was disdainful. Of course, and I'm not claiming that was a direct relay. What you heard is several minutes old. Here's what Steele and I are planning this very second. His Sam Norsk abruptly stopped, and the hallway was filled with the goblin cords of pack talk. Even after a year, Geoffrey could only extract vague sense from the conversation. It did sound like two packs. One of them wanted the other to do something. Bring M.D. Geoffrey. That cord was clear. Up. Uh, Andriani Fani <clears throat> went suddenly still, every member straining at the relayed sounds. Stop it, he shrilled, and the hallway was quiet as his tomb. Mr. Steele, oh, Mr. Steele, all of Amdi hugged against Geoffrey. He's talking about hurting you if Ravna doesn't obey. He wants to kill the visitors when they land. The wide eyes were ringed with tears. I don't understand. Geoffrey jabbed the hand at the cloak. Maybe he's faking that, too. I don't know. I could never fake two packs that well. The tiny bodies shuddered against Geoffrey, and there was the sound of human weeping, the eerily familiar sound of a small child desolated. What are we going to do, Geoffrey? But Geoffrey was silent, remembering and finally understanding the first few minutes after Steele's troops had rescued, captured him. Memories suppressed by later kindness crept out from the corners of his mind. Mom, Dad, Joanna. But Joanna still lived, just beyond these walls. Geoffrey? I don't know either. Hyde, maybe? For a moment, they just stared at each other. Finally, the fragment spoke. You can do better than hide. You already know about the passages through these walls. If you want, if you know the entrance points, and I do, you can get almost anywhere you want. You can even get outside. Joanna. Amby's crying stopped. Three of them watched Tyrethect front, aft, and sideways. The rest still clung to Geoffrey. <clears throat> we still don't trust you, Tyrethect, said Geoffrey. Good, good. I am a pack of various parts, perhaps not entirely trustable. Show us all the holes. Let us decide. There won't be time. Okay, but start showing us. <clears throat> and, while <clears throat> and while you do, keep relaying what Mr. Steele is saying. The singleton bobbed its head, and the multiple streams of pack talk resumed. The cloak got painfully to its feet and led the two children down a side tunnel, one where the wick torches were mostly burned out. The loudest sound down here was the soft dripping of water. The place was less than a year old, yet, except for the jagged edges of the cut stone, it seemed ancient. Puppies was crying again. Geoffrey stroked the back of the one that clung to his shoulder. Please, Amdi, translate for me. After a moment, Amdi's voice came hesitantly in his ear. M Mr. Steele is asking again where we are. Tyrethek says we're, we're trapped by a ceiling fall in the inner wing. In fact, they had heard the masonry shift a few minutes before, but it sounded far away. 
Mr. Steele just sent the rest of Tyrethek to get Mr. Shrek and dig us out. Mr. Steele sounds so different. Maybe it's not really him, Jeffrey whispered back. Long silence. No, it's him. He just seems so angry, and he's using strange words. Big words? No, scary ones, about cutting and killing. Ravna and you and me. He, he doesn't like us, Jeffrey. The singleton stopped. They were beyond the last wall torch, and it was too dark to see anything but shadowy forms. He pointed to a spot on the wall. Amdi reached forward and pushed at the rock. All the while, Mr. Tyrethect continued talking, reporting from the outside. Okay, said Amdi. That opens, and it's big enough for you, Jeffrey. I think... Tyrethek's human voice said, The spacers are back. I can see their little, little boat. I got away just in time. Steel is getting suspicious. A few more seconds and he will be searching everywhere. Amdi looked into the dark hole. I say we go, he said softly, sadly. Yeah. Jeffrey reached down to touch one of Amdi's shoulders. The member led him to a hole cut in sharp-edged stone. If he scrunched his shoulders, there would be enough room to crawl in. One of Amdi entered just ahead of him. The rest would follow. I hope it doesn't get any narrower than this. Tyrethect. It shouldn't. All these passages are designed for packs and light armor. The important thing. Keep to upward curving passages. Keep moving, and you'll eventually get outside. Fam's flying craft is less than, uh, 500 meters from the walls. Jeffrey couldn't even look over his shoulder to talk to the cloak. What if Mr. Steele chases us into the walls? There was a brief silence. He probably won't do that, <clears throat> if he doesn't know where you entered. It would take too long to find you, but... The voice was suddenly gentler. But there are openings on the top of the walls. In case enemy soldiers tried to sneak in from the outside, there has to be some way to kill them in the tunnels. He could pour oil down the tunnels. The possibility did not frighten Jeffrey. At the moment it just sounded bizarre. We've got to hurry, then. Jeffrey scrabbled forward as the rest of Amdi crawled in behind him. He was already several meters deep in stone when he heard Amdi's voice back at the entrance, the last one to enter. Will you be okay, Mr. Tyrethect? Or is this all just another lie? thought Jeffrey. The other's voice had its usual cynical tone. I expect to land on my feet. Please do remember that I helped you. And then the hatch was shut, and they scrambled forward into the dark. Negotiations. Shit. It was obvious to Fam that Steele's idea of mutually safe meeting was a cover for mayhem. Even Ravna wasn't fooled by the pack's new proposals. At least it meant that Steele was ad-libbing now. That he was beyond all the scripts and schemes. The trouble was, he still wasn't giving them any openings. Fam would have cheerfully died for a few undisturbed hours with the countermeasure. But Steele's setup would have them dead before they ever saw the inside of the refugee ship. Keep moving around, Blue Shell. I want Steele to have us weighing on his mind, without being a good target. The rider waved a frond in agreement, and the boat bounced briefly up from the moss, drifted a hundred meters parallel to the castle walls, and descended again. They were in the no-man's land between the forces of woodcarver and steel. Joanna Olsen dot twisted around to look at him. The boat was a very crowded place now. Blue shell stretched across the riderish controls at the bow. Fam and Joanna jammed into the seats behind him, and a pack called Pilgrim in every empty space in between. Even if you can locate the commset, don't fire. Jeffrey could be close by. For twenty minutes, Steele had been promising the momentary reappearance of Def Jeffrey Olsen Dot. Fam eyed her smudged face. Yeah, we won't fire, fire unless we can see exactly what we'll hit. The girl nodded shortly. She couldn't have been more than fourteen, but she was a good trooper. Half the people he had known in Chang Ho would have been in limp hysterics after this pickup, and of the rest, few could have given better status report than Joanna and her friend. He glanced at the pack. It would take a while to get used to these critters. At first he'd thought that two of the dogs were sprouting extra heads, then he noticed that the small ones were just puppies carried in jacket pockets. The pilgrim was all over the boat. Just what part of him should he talk to? He picked the head that was looking in his direction. Any th theories how to deal with steel? The pack Sam Norsk was better than Fam's. Steel and Flenzer are as tricky as anything I've ever seen in Joanna's data set, and Flenzer is cool. Flenzer hadn't realized there was a person with that name. There was a Mr. Skinner we talked to, some kind of assistant to Steel. Hmm, he's tricky enough to play flunky. I wish we could drop back and chat with Woodcarver about this. The request was artfully contained in his intonation. 
Fan wondered briefly what percentage of pack folk were so flexible. They might be one hell of a trading uh, race if they ever reached space. Sorry, we don't have time for that. In fact, if we can't get in right away, we've lost everything. I just hope Steel doesn't guess that. The heads subtly rearranged themselves. The biggest member, the one with the broken arrow shaft sticking up from its jacket, moved closer to the girl. Well, if Steel is in charge, there's a chance. He's very smart, but we think he runs amok when uh, things get tough. You're finding Joanna has probably put him into chasing his tails. Keep him off balance, and you can expect some big mistakes. Joanna spoke abruptly. He might kill Jeffrey. Or blow up the starship. Ravna, any luck with steel? Her voice came back over the comm. No, the threats are a bit more transparent now, and his Sam Norsk is getting harder to understand. He's trying to bring a cannon in from the north of the castle. I don't think he knows how much I can see. He still hasn't brought Jeffrey back to the radio. The girl paled, but she didn't say anything. Her hand stole up to grasp one of Pilgrim's paws. Blue Shell had been very quiet through all the rescue, first because he had his fronds full with flying, and then because the girl in the pack had so much to say. Fam had noticed that part of Pilgrim had been politely nosing around the rider. Blue Shell hadn't seemed upset by the attention. His race had plenty of experience with others. But now the rider made a brap for attention. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh my god. But now the now the rider made a brap for attention. <laughs> Sir Fam, there is action in front of the castle. Pilgrim was on it, almost at the same instant. One head helping another look through the telescope. <laughs> yes, that's the main sally port that's coming open. But why would Steel send packs out now? Woodcarver will chew them up. The enemy was indeed fielding infantry. The pack spewed out the wide hole in a headlong dash, much like troops of Fam's recollection. But once they cleared the entrance, they broke in off into clumps of four to six dogs each and spread across the castle perimeter. Fam leaned forward, trying to see as far along the walls as possible. Maybe not. These guys aren't advancing. They're staying in range of the archers on the walls. Yeah, but we still have cannons. Pilgrim's perfect imitation of humanity broke for a second, and a tinish cord filled the cockpit. Something is really strange. It's like they're trying to keep someone from getting out. Are there other entrances? Probably. And lots of little tunnels, just one member wide. Ravna? Steele's not talking at all now. He said something about traitors infiltrating the castle. Now all I'm getting is tinish gobble. From embrasure to embrasure along the battlements, Fam could see enemy soldiers moving above those on the ground. Something had upset the rat's nest. Joanna Olsendot was a vision of horrified concentration, her free hand gathered uh, into a fist, her lips faintly trembling. All this time I thought he was dead. If they kill him now, I... Her voice suddenly scaled up. What are they doing? Cast iron kettles had been dragged to the top of the walls. Fam could guess. Siege fighting on Canberra had involved similar things. He looked at the girl and kept his mouth shut. There's nothing we can do. The pilgrim pack was not so kind, or not so patronizing. It's oil, Joanna. They want to kill someone in the walls. But if he can get out? Blue Shell, I've read about loudspeakers. Can I use one? If Jeffrey is in the walls, Woodcarver can safely scrape Steele's troops off the field and battlements. Fam opened his mouth to object, but the rider had already opened a channel. Pilgrim's tinish voice echoed across the hillside. Along the castle walls, heads turned. To them, the voice must have sounded like a god's. The chords and trills continued a moment longer, then ceased. Ravenna's voice was on the line an instant later. Whatever you did just now, it pushed steel over the edge. I can barely understand him. He seems to be describing how he'll torture Jeffrey if we don't pull the woodcarvers back. Fam grunted. Okay, then. Get us in the air, Blue Shell. It felt it good to kiss subtly goodbye. Blue Shell wobbled the boat aloft. They moved forward, scarcely faster than a, than a man can run. Behind them, more of Woodcarver's troops were coming over the military crest of the hill. Those fellows had been pulled well back after Fam's strafing run. Things might be decided before they got to the castle. But Woodcarver's reach was still long and deadly. 
Splashes of smoke and fire appeared along the battlements, followed by sharp popping noises. Killing Jeffrey Olsen Dot was going to be a very expensive proposition for Steel. Can you use the beamer to clear Steel's troops away from the wall? asked Joanna. Fam started to nod, then noticed what was happening by the castle. See the oil. Dark pools were growing between the enemy packs and the walls they guarded. Until they knew where the kid was coming out, it would be, a be, be, it would be best not to start fires. Oops. Or, sorry. Pilgrim. Oops. Then he was shouting something more on the loudspeakers. Woodcarver's artillery ceased. Okay, said Fan. For now, all eyes on the castle wall. Circle the perimeter, Blue Shell. If we can see the kid before Steel's eye, guys, we may have a chance. Ravna. They're spread evenly around every side except the North Fan. I don't think Steel has any idea where the boy is. When you challenge heaven, the stakes are high, and I could have won. If he had not betrayed me, I could have won. But now the masks were down, and the enemy's brute physical power was all that counted. Steele brought himself down from the hysterical blackout of the last few minutes. If I could not have heaven, at least I could still take them to hell. Kill M.D. Jeffrey. Destroy the ship the visitors wanted so. Most of all, destroy his traitorous teacher. My lord? It was Shrek. Steele turned ahead in Shrek's direction. The time for hysteria was past. How goes the flooding, he said mildly. He wouldn't ask about Tyrathect again. All but complete. The oil is pooling beyond the castle walls. The two packs crouched as one of Woodcarver's bombs exploded, just beyond the battlement. Her troops were already halfway back across the field, and Steele's archers were preoccupied with flooding the tunnels and watching the exits. We may have flushed out the traitors, my lord. Just before Woodcarver resumed fire, we heard something by the southeast wall. But I fear the... The spacers will see whatever we do there. His heads bobbed, spastically. Strange to see Shrek coming apart, Steele thought vaguely. Shrek's was the loyalty of clockwork, but now his orderly world was fallen, failing, and there was nothing left to support him. The madness he was born from was all that was left. If Shrek was close to breaking, then the siege of Starship Hill was nearly at an end. Just a little longer, that is all I ask now. Steel forced a confident expression upon his members. I understand. You have done well, Shrek. We may still win. I know how these mantises think. If you can kill the child, especially before their eyes, it will break their spirit, just as puppies can be broken by the right terrors. Yes, sir. There was dull incredulity in, Sh in Shrek's eyes, but this would hold him, a plausible excuse to continue the charade. Light the oil beyond the walls. Move the troops in front of where you think Empty Jeffrey will exit. The visitors must see this if it is to have proper effect. And... And blow up the refugee ship. The words almost slipped out, but he caught himself in time. The explosive built into the jaws and, uh, and the starship... Jo jo ugh. The explosives built into the jaws and the starship dome would bring down everything interior to the outer walls and kill most of the packs within. Ordering Shrek to do that would make Steele's real, real goal all too clear. And move quickly before the woodcarver's troops can close. This is the movement's last hope, hope Shrek. The pack bowed its way back out down the steps. Steele maintained an expansive posture, boldly looking across the battlefield until the other was out of sight. Then he reached across the battlements and slammed the radio into the stone walkway. This one didn't break, and now the ravenous mantis's voice um, came uh, curi uh, curio <laughs> curiously, curiously from it. Steele bounded down the stairs. You get nothing. He shrieked back at her in Tyne's talk. Everything you want will die. And then he was down the stairs and running across the courtyard. He ducked out of sight into the hallway that circled the jaws of welcome. He could blow those easily, but very likely the main dome and the ship within would survive. No, he must go to the heart, kill the ship and all the sleeping mantises. He stepped into a secret room, picked up two crossbows and the extra radio cloak he had prepared. Inside that cloak was a small, a small bomb. He had tested the idea with a second set of radios. The receiving pack had died instantly. Down another set of stairs into a supply corridor. The sounds of battle were lost behind him. 
His own tines clatter was the loudest noise. Around him loomed bins of gunpowder, food supplies, fresh timber. The fuses and set charges were only fifty yards further on, and steel slowed to a walk, curled his paws, so the metal on them made no noise, listening, looking in every direction. Somehow he knew the other would be here, the Flinzer fragment. Flenzer had haunted him from the beginning of his existence, had haunted even after Flenzer had mostly died. But not until this clear treason had still uh, been able to free his hate. Most likely the master thought to escape with the children, but there was a chance that Flenzer schemed to win everything. There was a chance that he had returned. Steele knew his own death would come soon, and yet there might still be triumph if, by his own jaws and claws, he could kill the master. Please, please be here, dear master. Be here, thinking he can trick me one more time. A wish granted. He heard faint mind sounds, close. Heads rose from behind the bins above him. Two of the fragments showed themselves in the corridor ahead. Student. Master. Steele smiled. All five of the other were here. The fragment had smuggled himself all back, but gone were the radio cloaks. The members stood naked, their pelts covered with oozing sores. The radio bomb would be useless. Perhaps it didn't matter. Steele had seen corpses that looked healthier than these. Out of sight, he raised his bows. I have come to kill you. The death's heads shrugged. You have come to try. Jaws on claws. Steele would have no trouble killing the other, but the fragment had positioned three of himself above, by cargo bins that looked strangely off balance. A straightforward rush could be fatal, but if he could get good bow shots, Steele eased forward to just short of where the cargo bins would fall. Do, do, ugh, do you really expect to live, Fragment? I am not your only enemy. He waved a, no, a nose back up at the corridor. There are thousands out there who hunger for your death. The other bobbed its heads in a ghastly smile. New blood oozed from the wounds that were opened. Dear Steele, you never seem to understand. You have made it possible for me to survive, don't you see? I have saved the children. Even now I am preventing you from harming the starship. In the end we will win... This will win me a conditional surrender. I will be weak for a few years, but I will survive. The old flenzer glittered through the pain and the wounds, the old opportunism. But you are a fragment. Three-fifths of you is. The little school teacher. Flenzer lowered his heads and blinked shyly. She was stronger than I expected. For a while while she ruled this pack, or for a while she ruled this pack, but bit by bit I forced my way back. In the end, even without the others. I am whole. Flenzer whole once more. Steel edged back, almost in retreat. Yet there was something strange here. Yes, the Flenzer was at peace with himself, self-satisfied. But now that Steel could see the pack altogether, he saw something in its body language that... Insight came then. And with it, the flash of intensest pride. For once in my life, I understand better than the Master. Whole, you say? Think. We both know how souls do battle within, the little rationalizations, the great unknowings. You think you've killed the other, but whence comes your recent confidence? What you're doing is exactly what Tyrethect would do now. All the thought is yours now, but the foundation is her soul, and whatever you think, it's the little school teacher who won. The fragment hesitated, understanding. Its inattention lasted only a fraction of a second, but Steel was ready. He leaped into the open, loosing his arrows, lunging across the open space for the other's throats. Chapter 40 Any time before now, the climb through the walls would have been fun. Even though it was pitch dark, Amdi was in front and behind him, and his noses gave him a good feel for the way. Any time before now, there would have been the thrill of discovery, of giggling at Amdi's strung-out mental state. But now Amdi's confusion was simply scary. He kept bumping into Jeffrey's heels. I'm going as fast as I can. The fabric of Jeffrey's pants' knees was already torn apart on the rough stone. He hustled faster, the stabbing beat of rock on knees, barely penetrating his consciousness. He bumped into the puppy ahead of him. The puppy had stopped, seemed to be twisting sideways. There's a fork. I say we... What should I say, Jeffrey? Jeffrey rolled back, knocking his head on top of the wormhole. For most of a year... It had been Andy's confidence, his cheeky cleverness, that kept him going. Now, suddenly he was aware of the tons of rock that were pressing in from all directions. If the tunnel narrowed just a few centimeters, they would be stuck here forever. Jeffrey, I think, which side seems to be going up? Just a second. 
The lead member ran off a little ways down one fork. Don't go too far, Jeffrey shouted. Don't worry, I... he'll know how to get back. Then he heard the patter of return, and the lead member was touching its nose to his cheek. The one on the right goes up. They hadn't gone more than fifteen meters before Amdi started hearing things. People chasing us? asked Jeffrey. No. I mean, I'm not sure. Stop. Listen. Hear that? Gluppy. Syrupy. Oil. No more stopping. Jeffrey moved faster than ever up the tunnel. His head bumped into the ceiling and he stumbled to his elbows, recovered without thinking and raced on. A trickle of blood dripped down his cheek. Even he could hear the oil now. The sides of the tunnel closed down on his shoulders. Ahead of him, Amdi said, Dead end, or we're at an exit. Scritching sounds. I can't move it. The puppy turned around and wiggled back between Jeffrey's legs. Push at the top, Jeffrey. It's, if it's like the one I found in the dome, it opens at the top. The darn tunnel got narrow right before the door. Jeffrey hunched his shoulders and squeezed forward. He pushed at the top of the door. It moved, maybe a centimeter. He crawled forward a little further, squished so tightly between the walls that he couldn't even take a deep breath. Now he pushed as hard as he could. The stone turned all the way and light spilled into his face. It wasn't full daylight. They were still hidden from the outside behind angles of stone. But it was the happiest sight Jeffrey had ever seen. Half a meter more and he would be out. Only now he was jammed. He twisted toward a f forward a fraction, and things only seemed to get worse. Behind him, Amdi was piling up. Jeffrey, my rear paws are in the oil. It's filled the tunnel all up behind us. Panic. For a Jeff second, Jeffrey couldn't think of anything. So close, so close. He could see color now, the bloody smears on his hands. Back up. I'll take off my jacket and try again. Backing up was itself almost impossible, so thoroughly wedged had he become. Finally, he'd done it. He turned on his side, shrugged out of the jacket. Jeffrey, two of me under oil. Can't breathe. The puppies jammed up on around him, their pelts slick with oil. Slick. Just second. Jeffrey wiped the fur, smeared his shoulders with the oil. He extended his arms straight past his head and used his heels to push back onto the narrowness. Then the stone closed in on his shoulders. Behind him, what was left of Amdi was making whistling noises. Jam, push, push. A centimeter, another. And then he was out to his armpits, and it was easy. He dropped it to the ground, or he dropped to the ground and reached back to grab the nearest part of Amdi. The pup wriggled out, wriggled out of his hands. It blubbered something not tinnish and not human. Jeffrey could see the dark shadows of several members pulling at something out of sight. A second later, a cold, wet blob of fur rolled out of the darkness into his arms. A second more, and out came another. Jeffrey lowered the two to the ground and wiped goo away from their muzzles. One rolled onto its legs and began to shake itself. The other started choking and coughing. Meanwhile, the rest of Andy, Amdi dropped out of the hole. All eight were covered with some amount of oil. They straggled dunk drunkenly into a heap, licking each other's timpana. Their buzzing and croaking made no sense. Jeffrey turned from his friend and walked toward the light. They were hidden by uh, a turn in the stone, fortunately. From around the corner, he could hear the marshalling calls of Steele's troopers. He crept to the edge and peered around. For an instant, he thought he and Amdi were back inside the castle yard. There were so many troopers. But then he saw the unbounded sweep of hillside and the smoke rising out of the valley. What's next? He glanced back at Amdi, who was still frantically grooming his timpana. The chords and hums were sounding more rational now, and all of Amdi was moving. He turned back to the hillside. For an instant, he almost felt like rushing out to the troops. They had been his protectors for so long. One of Amdi bumped against his legs and looked out for himself. Wow, there's a regular lake of oil between us and Mr. Steele's soldiers. I... The booming sound was loud, but not like a gunpowder blast. It lasted almost a second, and then it became a background roar. Two more of Amdi stretched necks around the corner. The lake had become a roaring sea of flame. Blue Shell had maneuvered the boat between within two hundred meters of the castle wall, opposite the point where the packs had bunched up. Now the lander floated just a man's height off the moss. Just our being here is driving the packs away, said Pilgrim. Fam glanced over his shoulder. Woodcarver's troops had regained the field and were racing toward the castle walls. Another sixty seconds, max, and they could be in contact with Steele's packs. There was... <laughs> God damn it, did they have to use this word, man? 
there was a loud brap from Blue Shell's voter. And Fam looked forward. By the fleet, he said softly. Packs on the ramparts had fired some kind of flamethrowers into the pools of oil below the castle walls. Blue Shell flew in a little closer. Long pools of oil lay parallel to the walls. The enemy's packs on the outside were all but cut off from their castle now. Except for one thirty-meter wide gap, the section they had been guarding was high fire. The boat bobbed a little higher, tilting and uh, sliding in the fire-driven whirl of air. In most places, the oil lapped the so sloped base of the walls. Those walls were more intricate than the castles of Canberra. In many places, it looked like they were little mazes or caves built into the base. Looks damn stupid in a defensive structure. Jeffrey screamed Joanna, and pointed toward the middle of the unburning section. Fam had a glimpse of something withdrawing behind the stonework. I saw him too. Blue Shell tilted the boat over and slid downwards towards the wall. Joanna's hand closed on Fam's arm, pushing and shaking. He could barely hear her voice over the pilgrims shouting. Please, 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 she was saying. For a moment, it looked like they would make it. Steele's troops were well back from the mint, though there were ponds of oil below them. They were not yet alight. Even the air seemed quieter than before. For all that, Blue Shell managed to lose control. A gentle tipping went uncorrected, and the boat slid sideways into the ground. It was a slow collision, but Fam heard one of the landing pods cracking. Blue Shell played with the controls and the other side of the craft settled to earth. The beamer was stuck muzzle first into the earth. Fam's gaze snapped up at the scrode rider. He'd known it would come to this. Ravna, what happened? Can you get up? Blue Shell dithered with the controls a moment longer, then gave a rider a shrug. Yes, but it will take too long. He was undoing his restraints, unclamping his scrode from the deck. The hatch in front of him slid open, and the noise of battle and fire came loud. What in the hell do you think you're doing, Blue Shell? The rider's fronds angled attention at Fam. To rescue the boy. This will all be a fire in a moment. And this boat could fry if we leave it here. You're not going anywhere, Blue Shell. He leaned forward far enough to grab the other one by his lower fronds. Joanna was looking wildly from one to the other in un uncomprehending panic. No, please! And Ravna was shouting at him too. Fam tensed, all this tension on the rider. Blue Shell rocks toward him in the cramped space and pushed his fronds close to Fam's face, the voter voice frayed into nonlinearity. And what will you do if I disobey? You need me, or the whole boat is useless. I go, Sir Fam. I prove I am not the thrall of some power. Can you prove as much? He paused, and for a moment, the rider and human stared at each other from centimeters apart. But Fam did not grab him. Bra- <laughs> Brap. Blue Shell's fronds withdrew. He rolled back onto the lip of the hatch. The scrode's third axle reached the ground, and he descended into a controlled teeter. Still Fam had not moved. I am not some power's program. Fam? The girl was looking up at him and tugging at his sleeve. Nguyen shook the nightmare away and saw again. The pilgrim pack was already out of the boat. Sorry, that's my upstairs neighbor again. Short swords were held in the mouths of the four adults. Steel claws gleamed on their four paws. Okay. He flipped open a panel, withdrew the pistol he'd hidden there. Since Blue Shell had crashed the damn boat, there was no choice but to make the best of it. The realization was a cool breath of freedom. He pulled free of the crash restraints and clambered down. Pilgrim stood all around him. The two with puppies were unlimbering some kind of shields. Even with all his mouths full, the critter's voice was as clear as ever. Maybe we can find a way closer in, between the flames. There were no more arrows from the ramparts. The air above the fire was t just too hot for the archers. Fam and Joanna followed Pilgrim as he skirted pools of black goo. Stay as far from the oil as we can. The packs of Mr. Steel were rounding the flames. Fam couldn't tell if they were charging the lander or simply fleeing the friendlies that chased them. And maybe it didn't matter. He dropped to one knee and sprayed the oncoming packs with his handgun. It was nothing like the beamer, especially at this range. But it was not to be ignored. The front dogs tumbled. Others bounded over them. They reached the far edge of the oil. Only a few ventured into the goo. They knew what it would become, what it could become. Others shifted out of Fam's sight behind the landing boat. Was there a dry approach? Fam ran along the edge of the oil. There had to be a gap in the moat, or surely the fire would have spread. 
Ahead of him, the flames towered twenty meters into the air, the heat a physical battering on his skin. Above the top of the glow, tarry smoke swept back over the field, turning the sunlight into reddish murk. Can't see a thing, came Ravna's voice in his ear, despairing. There's still a chance, Rav. If he could hold them off long enough for Woodcarver's troops. Steel's packs had found a safe path inwards and were coming closer. Something sighed past him. An arrow. He dropped to the ground and sprayed the enemy packs at full rate. If they had known how fast he was getting to empty, they might have kept coming. But after a few seconds of ripping carnage, the advance halted. The enemy sweep broke apart and the dog things were running away, taking their chances with Woodcarver's packs. Fam turned and looked back at the castle. Joanna and Pilgrim stood ten meters nearer the walls. She was pulling against the pack's grasp. Fam followed her gaze. There was the scrowed rider. Blue Shell had paid no attention to the packs that ran around the edge of the fire. Shut up. <laughs> he rolled steadily inwards, oily tracks marking his progress. The rider had drawn in all his externals and pushed, pulled his cargo scarf close to his central stalk. He was driving blind through the superheated air, deeper and deeper into the narrowing gap between the flames. He was less than fifteen meters from the walls. Abruptly two fronds extended out from his trunk into the heat. There. Though the heat shimmer, Fam could see the kid, walking uncertainly out from the cover of stone. Small shapes sat on the boy's shoulders and walked beside him. Fam ran up the slope. He could move faster over this terrain than any rider. Maybe there was time. A single burst of flame arched down from the castle, into the pond of oil between him and the rider at the wall. What had been a narrow channel of safety was gone, and the flame spread unbroken before him. There's still lots of clear space, Amdi said. He reached a few meters out from their hiding place to reconnoiter around the corners. The flyer is down. Some strange thing is coming our way. Blue shell or green stock? There were lots of Steel's packs out there, too, but not close, probably because of the flyer. That was a weird one, with none of the symmetry of Stromer aircraft. It looked all tilted over, almost as if it had just crashed. A tall human raced across their field of view, firing at Steel's troops. Jeffrey looked further out, and his hand tightened almost unconsciously on the nearest puppy. Coming toward them was a wheeled vehicle, like something out of the Neoran historical. The sides were painted with jagged stripes. A thick pole grew up from the top. The two children stepped a little ways out from their protection. The spacer saw them. It slewed about, spraying oil and moss from under its wheels. Too frail, something has reached out from its bluish trunk. Its voice was squeak squeaky Sam Norsk. Quickly, Sir Geoffrey, we have little time. Behind the creature, beyond the pool pond of oil, Geoffrey could see Joanna. And then the pond exploded, the fire on both sides sprouting across all escape routes. Still, the spacer was waving its tendrils, urging them to get onto the flat of its hull. Geoffrey grasped at the few handholds available. The puppies jumped after him, clinging to his shirt and pants. Up close, Geoffrey could see that the stalk was a person. The skin was smudged and dry, but it was soft and it moved. Two of Amdi were still on the ground, uh, ranging out on either side of the cart for a better view of the fire. Wah! shrieked Amdi by its ear, by his ear. Even so close, he could scarcely be heard over the thunder of the fire. We can never get through that, Geoffrey. Our only chance is to stay here. The spacer's voice came from the little plate at the base of its stalk. No, if you stay here, you will die. The fire is spreading. Geoffrey had huddled as much as the, uh, as much behind the writer's stalk as possible, and still he could feel the heat. Much more, and the oil in Amdi's fur would catch fire. The writer's tendrils lifted the colored cloth that lay on its hole. Pull this over you. It wagged a tendril at the rest of Amdi. All of you. The two on the ground were crouched behind the free creature's front wheels. Too hot, too hot, came Amdi's voice. But the two jumped up and buried themselves under the per peculiar uh, tarpaulin. Cover yourself all the way. Geoffrey felt the writer pulling the cover over him. The cart was already rolling back toward the flames. Pain burned through every gap in the tarp. The boy reached frantically, first with one hand and then the other, trying to get the cloth over his legs. Their course was a wild, bouncing ride, and Geoffrey could barely keep hold. Around him he felt Amdi straining with his free jaws to keep the uh, tarpaulin in place. 
The sound of fire was a roaring beast, and the tarp itself was searing hot against his skin. Every new jolt bounced him up from the hole, threatening to break his grip. For a time, panic obliterated thought. It was not till much later that he remembered the tiny sounds that came from the voter plate and understood what those sounds must mean. Fam ran towards the new flames. Agony. He raised his arms across his face and felt the skin on his hands blistering. He backed away. This way, this way, the pilgrim's voice came from behind him, guiding him out. He ran back, stumbling. The pack was in a shallow gully. It had shifted its shields around to face the new stretch of fire. Two of the pack to move it out of his way, and he dived behind them. Both Joanna and the pack were slapping at his head. Your hair is on fire, the girl shouted. In seconds they had the fire out. The pilgrim looked a bit singed, too. Its shoulder pouches were tucked safely shut. For the first time, no inquisitive puppy eyes peeked out. I still can't see anything, fam. It was Ravenna from high above. What's going on? Quick glance behind him. We're okay, he gasped. Woodcarver's packs are tearing up steels, but blue shell. He peered between in the shields. It was like looking into a kiln. Right by the castle wall, there might be a breathing space. A slim hope, but something is moving in there. Pilgrim had tucked one head briefly around the shield. He withdrew it now, licking his nose from both sides. Fam looked again through the crack. The fire had internal shadows, places of not so bright that wavered, moved. I see it too. He felt Joanna stick her head close to his, peering frantically. It's Blue Shell, Rav, by the fleet. This last said too softly to carry over the fire sound. There was no sign of Jeffrey Olson dot, but Blue Shell is rolling through the middle of the fire, Rav. The scrode wheeled out of the deeper oil, slowly, steadily making its way. And now, Fam could see fire within fire, Blue Shell's trunk flaring in rivulets of flame. His fronds were no longer gathered on into himself. They extended, writhing in their, with their own fire. He's still coming, diving straight out. The scrode cleared the wall of fire, rolled with jerky abandon down the slope. Blue Shell didn't turn toward them, but just before he reached the landing boat, all six wheels grated to a fast stop. Fam stood and raced back toward the scrode rider. Pilgrim was already unlimbering, his shields and turning to follow him. Joanna Olson dot stood for a second, sad and slight and alone, and her gaze stuck hopelessly on the fire and smoke on the castle side. One of, uh, one of the pilgrim grabbed her sleeve, drawing her back from the fire. Fam was at the rider now. He stared silently for a second. Blue Shell's dead, Rav. No way you could doubt it if you could see. The fronds were burnt away, leaving stubs along the stock. The stock itself had burst. Ravna's voice in his ear was shuddery. He drove through that even while he was burning? Can't be. He must have been dead after the first few meters. This must all have been on autopilot. Fam tried to forget the agonized reaching of Franz he had seen back in the fire. He blanked out for a moment, staring at the fire-split flesh. The scrode itself radiated heat. Pilgrim sniffed around it, shying away abruptly when a noise came, nose came too close. Abruptly, he reached out a steel-tined paw and pulled hard on the scarf that covered the hole. Joanna screamed and rushed forward. The forms beneath the scarf were unmoving, but unburned. She grabbed her brother by the shoulders, pulling him to the ground. Fam knelt beside her. Is the kid breathing? He was distantly aware of Ravna shouting in his ear, and Pilgrim plucking tiny dog things off the metal. Seconds later, the boy started coughing. His arms windmilled against his sister. Amdi, Amdi. His eyes opened, widened. Sis. And then again, Amdi. I don't know, said Pilgrim, standing close to the seven. No, eight, grease-covered forms. There are some mind sounds, but not coherent. He nosed at three of the puppies, doing something that might have been rescue breathing. After a moment, the little boy began crying, a sound lost in the fire sounds. He crawled across to the puppies, his face right next to one of Pilgrim's. Joanna was right behind him, holding his shoulders, looking first at the Pilgrim, and then at the still creatures. Fam came to his knees and looked back at the castle. The fire was a little lower now. He stared a long time at the blackened stump that had been Blue Shell, wondering and remembering, wondering if all the suspicion had been for naught, wondering what mix of courage and autopilot had been behind the rescue. Remembering all the months he had spent with Blue Shell, the liking, and then the hate. Oh, Blue Shell, my friend. The fire slowly ebbed. 
Fan paced the edge of the receding heat. He felt the god shatter coming finally back upon him. For once he welcomed it, welcomed the drive and the mania, the blunting of a irre irrelevant feeling. He looked at Pilgrim and Joanna and Geoffrey and the recovering puppy pack. It was all a meaningless diversion. No, not quite meaningless. It had an effect of slowing down progress on what was deadly important. He glanced upwards. There were gaps in the city clouds, places where he could see the reddish haze of high-level ash and occasional splotches, splotches of blue. The castle's ramparts appeared abandoned, and the battle around the walls had died. What news? he said impatiently at the sky. Ravna, I can't see much around you, fam. Large numbers of tines are retreating no northwards. Looks like a fast, coordinated retreat. Nothing like the fight to the last that we were seeing before. There are no fires within the castle, or evidence of remaining packs, either. Decision. Fam turned back towards the others. He struggled to turn sharp commands into reasonable-sounding requests. Pilgrim, Pilgrim, I need Woodcarver's help. We have to get inside the castle. Pilgrim didn't need any special persuasion, though he was full of questions. You're going to fly over the walls? he asked as he bounded toward him. Fam was already jogging toward the boat. He boosted Pilgrim aboard, then clambered up. No, he wasn't going to try to fly the damn thing. No, just use the loudspeaker to get your boss to find a way in. Seconds later, pack talk was echoing across the hillside. Just minutes more. Just minutes more and I will be facing the countermeasure. And though he had no conscious notion what might come of that, he felt the god shatter bu bubbling up for one final takeover, one final effort to do Old One's will. Where is the blighter fleet, Rav? Her answer came back immediately. She had watched the battle below, and the hammer coming down from above. Forty-eight light years out, mumbled a conversation off mic. They've speeded up a little. They'll be in system in four or six hours. I'm sorry, fam. Crypto. Zero. As received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path. Trisquiline. SJK Units. Apparently from Sandor Arbitration Intelligence. Not the usual originator, but verified by intermediate sites. Originator may be a branch office or a backup site. Subject. Our final message. Distribution. Threat of the Blight. War Tracker's Interest Group. Where are they now? Extinctions Log. Date. 72.78 days since the fall of Sandra Kai. Key phrases. Vast new attack. The fall of Sandor Arbitration. Text of message. As best we can tell, all our High Beyond sites have been absorbed by the Blight. If you can, please ignore all messages from those sites. Until four hours ago, our organization comprised twenty civilizations at the top. What is left of us doesn't know what to say or what to do. Things are so slow and murky and dull now. We're not meant to live this low. We intend to disband after this mailing. For those who can continue, we want to tell what happened. The new attack was an abrupt thing. Our last recollections from above are of the Blight suddenly reaching in all directions, sacrificing all its immediate security to acquire as much processing power as possible. We don't know if we had simply underestimated its power, or if the Blight itself is somehow now desperate, and taking desperate risks. Up to 3,000 seconds ago, we were under heavy assault along our organization's internal networks. That has ceased. Temporarily? Or is this the limit of the attack? We don't know, but if you hear from us again, you will know that the Blight has us. Farewell. Crypto. Zero. As received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path. Optima. Acaleron. Trisquiline. SJK Units. From Society for Rational Investigation. Probably a single system in the middle beyond. 7,500 light years anti-spinward of Sandra Kai. Subject. The big picture. Key phrases. The blight. Nature's beauty. Unprecedented opportunities. Summary. Life goes on. Distribution. Threat of the blight. Society for rational network management. War tracker's interest. Group. <laughs> Date. 72.80 days since the fall of Sandra Kai. Text of message. It's always amusing to see people who think themselves the center of the universe. Take the recent spread of the Blight. References follow for readers not on those threads and news groups. The Blight is an unprecedented change in the limited portion of the top of the beyond, far away from most of my readers. I'm sure it's the ultimate catastrophe for many, and I certainly feel sympathy for such, 
but a little humor too, that these, some, these people somehow think their disaster is the end of everything. Life goes on, folks. At the same time, it's clear that many readers are not paying proper attention to these events, certainly not seeing what is truly significant about them. In the last year, we have witnessed the apparent murders of several powers and the establishment of a new ecosystem in a portion of the high beyond. Through, though far away, these events are without precedent. Often before, I have called this the net of a million lies. Well, people, we now have an opportunity to view things while the truth is still manifest. With luck, we may solve some fundamental mysteries about the zones and the powers. I urge readers to watch events below the blight from as many angles as possible. In particular, we should take advantage of the remaining relay at Debley Down to co coordinate observations on both sides of the blight-affected region. This will be expensive and tedious, since only middle and low beyond sites are available in the affected region, but it will be well worth it. General topics to follow. The nature of the blight net communications. The creature is part of power, is part power and part high beyond, and infinitely interesting. The nature of the recent great surge in the low beyond is beneath the blight, or beneath the blight. This is another event without clear precedent. Now is the time to study it. The nature of the blighter fleet now closing on an off-net off site in the low beyond. This fleet has been of great interest to war trackers over the last weeks, but mainly for asinine reasons. Who cares about Sandra Kai and the Aprahant hegemony? Local politics is for locals. The real question should be obvious to all but the brain damaged. Why has the Blight made this great effort to go so far out its natural depth? If there are any ships still in the vicinity of the Blight's fleet, I urge them to keep war trackers posted. Failing that, local civilizations should be reimbursed for forwarding ultrawave traces. This is all very expensive, but worth it. The observations of the Eon, and the expense will not continue long. The Blight's fleet should arrive at the target star momentarily. Will it stop and retrieve, or will we see how a power destroys the systems which oppose it? Either way, we are blessed with opportunity. Chapter 41 Ravda walked across the field toward the waiting packs. The thick smoke had been blown away, but its smell was still heavy in the air. The hillside was burned over desolation. From above, Steele's castle had looked like the center of a great black nipple, hectares of nat natural and pack-made destruction capping the hill. The soldiers silently made way for her. Made way for her. More than one cast was an uneasy glance at the starship grounded behind her. She walked slowly past them towards the one who waited. Eerie the way they sat, like picnickers, but all uneasy about each other's presence. This must be the equivalent of a close staff conference for them. Ravna walked toward the pack at the center, the one sitting on silken mats. Intricate wooden uh, filigree hung around the necks of the adults, but some of those looked sick, old, and there were two puppies sitting out in front of it. They stepped precisely forward as Ravna crossed the last stretch of open ground. Er, you're the woodcarver? she asked. A woman's voice, incredibly human, came from one of the larger members. Yes, Ravna, I'm woodcarver, but it's Peregrine you want. He's up in the castle with the children. Oh. We have a wagon. We can take you inwards right away. One of them pointed at a vehicle drawing, drawn up the hillside. But you could have landed much closer, could you not? Ravna shook her head. No, not anymore. This was the best landing that she and Greenstock could make. Their heads cocked at her, all a coordinated gesture. I thought you were in a terrible hurry. Peregrine says there is a fleet of spacers coming hot on your tail. For an instant, Ravna didn't say anything. So Fam had told them of the blight but she was glad he had. She shook her head, trying to clear it of the numbness. Yes, we are in a great hurry. The data set on her wrist was linked to the OOB. Its tiny display showed the steady approach of the Blight's fleet. All of the heads twisted, a gesture that Ravna couldn't interpret. And you despair. I fear I understand. How can you? And if you can, how can you forgive us? But all that Ravna said aloud was, I'm sorry. The queen mounted her wagon, and they rolled across the hillside toward the castle walls. Ravna looked back once. Down slope, the OOB lay like a great dying moth. Its topside drive spines arched a hundred meters into the air. They glistened a wet, metallic green. Their landing had not been quite a crash. Even now, Agrav canceled some of the craft's weight, but the 
Drive spines on the ground side were crumpled. Beyond the ship, the hillside fell steeply away to the water and the islands. The westering sun cast hazy shadows across the islands and on the castle beyond the straits, a fantasy scene of castles and starships. The display on her wrist serenely counted down the seconds. Steel put gunpowder bombs all around the dome. Woodcover swept a couple of noses, pointing upwards. Ravna followed her gesture. The arches were more like a princess cathedral than military architecture, pink marble challenging the sky. And if it all came down, it would surely wreck the spacecraft parked beneath. Woodcarver said that fam was in there now. They rolled indoors through dark, cool rooms. Ravna glimpsed row after row of cold sleep boxes. How many might still be revivable? Will we ever find out? The shadows were deep. You're sure that Steele's troops are gone? Woodcarver hesitated, her head staring in different directions. So far, pack expressions were impossible for Ravna to read. Reasonably sure, anybody still in the castle would need to find, need to be behind lots of stone, or my search parties would have found them. More important, we have what's left of steel. The queen seemed to read Ravna's questioning expression perfectly. You didn't know? Apparently Lord Steel came down here to blow all the bombs. It would have been suicide, but that pack was always a crazy one. Someone stopped him. There was blood all over. Two of him are dead. We found the rest wandering around, a whimpering mess. Whoever did steal in is also behind the rapid retreat. That someone is doing his best to avoid any confrontation. He won't be back soon, though I feel I'll have to face dear Flenzer eventually. Under the circumstances, Ravna figured that was one problem that would never materialize. Her data set showed 45 hours till the Blight's arrival. Jeffrey and Joanna were by their starship, under the main dome. They sat on the steps of the landing ramp, holding hands. When the wide doors opened and Woodcarver's wagon drove through, the girls stood and waved. Then they saw Ravna. The boy walked first quickly, and then more slowly across the wide floor. Jeffrey Olsendot? Ravna called softly. He had a tentative, dignified posture that seemed much too old for an eight-year-old. Poor Jeffrey had lost much, and lived with so little for, to for so long. She stepped down from the wagon and walked toward him. The boy advanced out of the shadows. He was surrounded by a near mob of small-sized pack members. One of them hung on his shoulder. Others tumbled around his feet without ever seeming to get in his way. Still others followed his path both in front and behind. Jeffrey stopped well back from her. Ravna? She nodded. Could you step a little closer? The queen's mind sound is too close. The voice was still the boy's, but his lips hadn't moved. She walked the few meters that still separated them. Puppies and the boy advanced hesitantly. Up close she could see the rips in his clothing and what looked like wound dressings on his shoulders and elbows and knees. His face looked recently washed, but his hair was a sticky mess. He looked up at her solemnly, then raised his arms to hug her. Thank you for coming. His voice was muffled against her, but he wasn't crying. Yes, thank you. Thank poor Mr. Blue Shell. His voice again, sad but unmuffled, coming from the pack of puppies all around them. Joanna Olsen Dot had advanced to stand just behind them. Only fourteen, is she? Ravna reached a hand toward her. From what I hear, you were a rescue force all by yourself. Woodcarver's voice came from the wagon. Joanna was that. She changed our world. Ravna gestured up the ship's ramp at the glow of the interior lighting. Fam's up there? The girl started to nod, was preempted by the pack of puppies. Yes, he is. He and the pilgrim are up there. The pups disentangled themselves and started up the steps, one remaining behind to tug Ravna toward the ramp. She started after them, with Geoffrey close behind her. Who is this pack? She said abruptly to, Jeff abruptly to Geoffrey, pointing to the puppies. The boy stopped in surprise. Amdi, of course. I'm sorry, Geoffrey's voice came from the puppies. I've talked to you so much, I forget you don't know. There was a chorus of tones and chords that ended in a human giggle. She looked down at the bobbing heads, and she was certain the little devil was quite aware of his misrepresentations. Suddenly, a mystery was solved. Pleased to meet you, she said, angered and charmed at the same time. Now. Right, there are much more important things now. The pack continued to hop up the stairs. Amdi seemed to alternate between shy sadness and manic activity. I don't know what they're up to. They kicked us out as soon as we showed them around. Ravna followed the pack, Jeffrey close behind. It didn't sound like anything was going on. The interior of the dome was like a tomb, echoing with the talk of a few packs who guarded it. 
But here, halfway up the steps, even those sounds were muted, and there was nothing coming through the hatch at the top. Fan? He's up there. It was Joanna, at the base of the stairs. She and Woodcarver were looking up at them. She hesitated. I'm not sure if he's okay. After the battle, he... he seems strange. Woodcarver's head weaved around, as if she were trying to get a good look at them through the glare of the hatch lights. The acoustics in this ship's of, ship of yours are awful. How can humans stand it? Amdi. Ah, it's not so bad. Jeffrey and I spent lots of time up here. I got used to it. Two of his heads were pushing at the hatch. I don't know why Fam and Pilgrim kicked us out. We could have easily stayed in the other room and been real quiet. Ravna stepped carefully between the pack's lead puppies and pounded on the whole metal. It wasn't hard latched. Now she could hear the ship's ventilation. Fan, what progress? There was a rustling sound and the click of claws. The hatch slid partway back. Bright, flickering light spilled down the ramp. A single doggy head appeared. Ravna could see white all around its eyes. Did that mean anything? Hi, it said. Uh, look, things are a bit tense just now. Fam, I don't think Fam should be bothered. Ravna slipped her hand past the gap. I'm not here to bother him, but I am coming in. How long we've fought for this moment. How many billions have died along the way. And now some talking dog tells me things are a bit tense. The pilgrims looked down at her hand. Okay. He slid the hatch far enough open to let her through. The pups were quick around their heels, but they recoiled before the pilgrim's glance. Ravna didn't notice. The ship was scarcely more than a freight container, a cargo hold. The cargo this time, the cold sleep boxes, had been removed, leaving a mostly level floor, dotted with hundreds of fittings. All this she scarcely noticed. It was the light, uh, the thing that held her. It grew out from the walls and gathered almost too bright to bear at the center of the hold. Its shape changed again and again, the colors shifting from red to violet to green. Fam sat cross-legged by the apparition within it. Half his hair was burned away. His hands and arms were shivering, and he mumbled in some language she didn't recognize. God shatter. Two times it had been the companion to disaster. A dying power's madness, and now it was the only hope. Oh, Fam. Ravna took a step toward him, felt jaws close on her sleeve. Please, he mustn't be disturbed. The one that was holding her arm was a big dog, battle-scarred. The rest of the pack, pilgrim, all faced inwards on Fan. The savage stared at her, somehow saw the anger rising in her face. Then the pack said, Look, ma'am, your Fan's in some sort of fuge state. All the normal personality traded for computation. Huh? This pilgrim had the jargon, but probably not much else. Fan must have been talking to him. She made a shushing gesture. Yes, yes, I understand. She stared into the light. The changing shape, so hard to look at, was something like the graphics you can generate on most displays, the silly cross-sections of high-dimensional froths. It glowed in the purest monochrome, but shifted through the colors. Much of the light uh, must be coherent. Interference speckles crawled on every solid surface. In places, the interference banded up, stripes of dark and light that slid across the hole as the color changed. She walked slowly closer, staring at Fam and the countermeasure. For what else could it be? The scum in the walls, now grown out to meet God Shatter. This was not simply data, a message to be relayed. This was a transcendent machine. Revna had read of such things, devices made in the transcend, but for what? Uh, but for use at the bottom of the beyond. There would be nothing sentient about it, nothing that violated the constraints of the lower zones, yet it would make the best possible use of nature here to do whatever its builder had desired. Its builder? The Blight? An enemy of the Blight? She stepped closer. The thing was deep in Fam's chest, but there was no blood, no torn flesh. She might have thought it was all trick holography, except that she could see him shudder at its writhing. The fractal arms were feathered by long teeth, twisting at him. She gasped and almost called his name, but Fam wasn't resisting. He seemed deeper into God Shatter than ever before, and more at peace. The hope and fear came suddenly out of hiding, hope that maybe, even now, God Shatter could do something about the blight, and fear that Fan would die in the process. The artifact's twisting evolution slowed. The light hung on the pale edge of blue. Fan's eyes opened, his head turned toward her. The writer's myth is real, Ravna. His voice was distant. She heard the whisper of a laugh. 
The writers should know, I guess. They learned the last time. These are There are things that don't like the blight. Things my old one only guessed at. Powers beyond powers? Ravna sank to the floor. The display on her wrist glowed up at her. Uh, uh, less than forty-five hours left. Pham saw her downward glance. I know. Nothing has slowed the fleet. It's a pitiful thing so far down here. But more, more than powerful enough to destroy this world, this solar system. And that's what the Blight wants now. The Blight knows I can destroy it, just as it was destroyed before. Ravna was vaguely aware that Pilgrim had crawled in close all the, uh, crawled in close on all sides. Every face was fixed on the blue froth, and the human enmeshed within. How, fam? Ravna whispered. Silence. Then, all the zone turbulence. That was the countermeasure trying to act, but without coordination. Now I'm guiding it. I've begun. The reverse surge. It's drawing on local energy sources. Can't you feel it? Reverse surge? What was Fan talking about? She glanced again at her wrist and gasped. Enemy speed had jumped to twenty light years per hour, as fast as might be expected in the middle beyond. What had been uh, almost two days of grace was barely two hours, and now the display said twenty-five light years per hour. Thirty. Someone was pounding on the hatch. Scrupilo was delinquent. He should be supervising the move up the hillside. He knew that, and he really felt quite guilty. But he preserved in his dereliction. Like an addict chewing crema leaves, some things are too delicious to give up. Scrupilo dawdled behind, carrying data set carefully between him so that its floppy pink ears would not drag on the ground. In fact, guarding data set was certainly more important than hassling his troopers. In any case, he was close to give uh, advice. Close enough to give advice, and his lieutenants were more clever than he at everyday work. During the last few hours, the coastal winds had not taken the smoke clouds inland, and the air was clean and salty. On this part of the hill, not everything was burned. There were even some flowers and fluffy seed pods. Bobtailed birds sailed up the rising air from the sea valley, their cries a happy music, as if promising that the world would soon be as before. Scrupilo knew it could not be. He turned all his heads to look down the hillside at Ravna, Ravna Bergensdot's starship. He estimated the surviving drive spines as 100 meters long. The hole itself was more than 120. He hunkered down around Data Set and popped open its cushioned Oliphant face. Data Set knew lots about spacecraft. Actually, the ship was not a human design, but the overall shape was fairly ordinary. He knew that from his previous readings. Twenty to thirty thousand tons, equipped with anti-gravity floats and faster-than-light drive. All very ordinary for the beyond, but to see it here, through the eyes of his very own members. Scrupilo couldn't keep his gaze from the thing. Three of him worked with data set, while the other two stared at the iridescent green hole. The troopers and gun carts around him faded to insignificance. For all its mass, the ship seemed to rest gently on the hillside. How long will it be before we can build such? Centuries, without outside help, the histories in data set claimed. What I wouldn't give for a day around aboard her. Yet this ship was being chased by something mightier. Scrupilo shivered in the summer sun. He had often heard a hill pilgrim story of the first landing, and he had seen the human's beam weapon. He had read much in data set about planet wrecker bombs and the other weapons of the beyond. While he worked on woodcarver's cannon, the best weapons he could bring to be, he had dreamed and wondered. Until he saw the starship floating above, he had never quite felt the reality in his innermost hearts. Now he did. So a fleet of killers lay close to Ravna Bergen's dot. The hours of the world might be few indeed. He tabbed quickly through data set search paths, looking for articles about space piloting. If there be only hours, at least learn what there is time to learn. So Scrupilo was lost in the sound and vision of data set. He had three windows open, each on a different aspect of the piloting experience. Loud shouts from the hillside. He looked up with one head, more irritated than anything else. It wasn't a battle alarm they were calling, just a general unease. Strange, the afternoon air seemed pleasantly cool. Two of him looked high, but there was no haze. Scrupilo, look, look. His gunners were dancing in panic. They were pointing at the sky, at the sun. He folded the pink covers over Dataset's face, at the same time looking sunward with shaded view. The sun was still high in the south, dazzling bright. Yet the air was cool, and the birds were making cooing sounds of low sun nesting. And suddenly he realized he was looking straight at the sun's disk. 
had been for five seconds, without pain or even watering of his eyes, and there was still no haze that he could see, an inner chill spread across his mind. The sunlight was fading, he could see black dots on its disk, sunspots, he had seen them often enough with Scriber's telescopes. But that had been through heavy filters. Something stood between him and the sun, something that sucked away its light and warmth. The pack on the hillside moaned. It was a frightened sound Scrupilo had never heard in battle, the sound of someone confronted by unknowable terror. Blue faded from the sky. The air was suddenly as cold as deep dark night, and the sun's color was gray luminescence, like a faded moon. Less. Scrupilo hunkered bellies to the ground. Some of him was whistling deep in the throat. Weapons, weapons, but Dataset never spoke of this. The stars were the brightest light on the hillside. Fam, fam, they'll be here in an hour. What have you done? A miracle, but of ill? Fam knew and swayed in countermeasures bright embrace. His voice was almost normal, the god chatter receding. What have I done? Not much, and more than any power. Even old one only guessed, Ravna. The thing the Stromers brought here is the writer myth. We, I... It just moved the zone boundary back. A local change, but intense. We're in the equivalent of the high beyond now, maybe even the low transcend locally. That's why the blighter fleet can move so fast. But Pilgrim was back from the hatch. He interrupted Ravna's incoherent panic with a matter of fact. The sun just went out. His heads bobbed in an expression she couldn't fathom. Fam answered, that's temporary. Something has to power this maneuver. W why, Fam? Even if the Blight was sure to win, why help it? The man's face went to blank, Fam Nguyen almost disappearing behind the other programs at work in his mind. Then, I'm focusing, countermeasure. I see now, countermeasure, what it is. It was designed by something beyond the powers. Maybe there are cloud people, maybe this is signaling them, or maybe that's uh, what it's just done is like an insect bite, something that will cause much greater reaction. The bottom of the beyond has just receded, like the waterline before a tsunami. The countermeasure glared red-orange, and its arcs and barbs embracing Fam more tightly than before. And now that we've bootstrapped to a decent zone, things can really happen. Oh, the ghost of Old One is amused. Seeing beyond the powers was almost worth dying for. The fleet stats flowed across Ravna's wrist. The blight was coming on even faster than before. Five minutes, Fam, even though they were still thirty light-years out. Laughter. Oh, the Blight knows, too. I see this is what it feared all along. This is what killed it those eons ago. I'm racing for- or er, it's racing forward now, but it's too late. The glow brightened. The mask of light that was Fam's face seemed to relax. Something very far away has heard me, Rav. It's coming. What? What's coming? The surge. So big, it makes what hit us before seem like a gentle wave. This is the one nobody believes because no one's left to record it. The bottom will be blown out beyond the feet. Fleet. Sudden understanding. Sudden wild hope. And they'll be trapped out there, won't they? So Kajet Svenzendat had not fought in vain, and Fam's advice had not been nonsense. Now there wasn't a single ram scoop in the blighter fleet. Yes, they're thirty light years out. We killed all the speed capable ones. There'll be a thousand years getting here. The artifact abruptly contracted, and Fan moaned. Not much time. We're at maximum recession. When the surge comes, it will. Again, a sound of pain. I can see it. By the powers, Ravna, it will sweep high and last long. How high, Fan? Ravna said softly. She thought of all the civilizations above them. There were the butterflies and the treacherous types who supported the pogrom at Sandra Kai and there were trillions who lived in peace and made their own way toward the heights. A thousand light-years? Ten thousand? I'm not sure. The ghosts in countermeasure, Arnie and Sijana, thought it might rise so high that it would punch into the transcend, insist the, bright, the blight right where it sits. That must be what happened before. Arnie and Sijana? The countermeasure's writhing had slowed. Its light flickered bright and then out. Bright and then out. She heard Fam's uh, breath gasp with every darkness. Countermeasure, a savior that was going to kill a million civilizations, and was killing the man who had triggered it. Almost unthinking, she dodged past the thing, reaching for Fam, but razors on razors blocked her, raking her arms. Fam was looking up at her. He was trying to say something more. Then the light went out for a final time. 
From the darkness all around came a hissing sound and a growing, bitter smell that Ravenna would never forget. For Pham Nguyen, there was no pain. The last minutes of his life were beyond any description that might be rendered in the slowness, or even in the beyond. So try metaphor and simile. It was like, it was like. Pham stood with Old One on a vast and empty beach. Ravna and Tynes were cr tiny creatures at their feet. Planets and stars were the grains of sand, and the sea had drawn briefly back, letting the brightness of thought reach here, where before there had been darkness. The transcendence would be brief. At the horizon, the drawn-back sea was building, a dark wall higher than any mountain, rushing back upon them. He looked up at the enormity of it. Fam and God Shatter and Countermeasure would not survive that submergence, not even separately. They had triggered catastrophe beyond mind, a vast section of the galaxy plunged into slowness, as deep as the old Earth itself, and as permanent. Arn and Sijana and Stromers and Old One were avenged, and Countermeasure was complete. And as for Fam Nguyen, a tool made, and used, and now to be discarded. A man who never was. The surge was upon him then, plunging depths. Down from the transcendent light, outside, the Tyne's world sun would be shining bright once more. But inside Fam's mind everything was closing down, senses returning to what eyes can see and ears can hear. He felt countermeasure slow towards non-existence, its task done without ever a conscious thought. Old One's ghost hung on for a little longer, huddling and retreating as thought's potential ebbed. But it let Pham's awareness be. For once it did not push him aside. For once it was gentle, brushing at the surface of Pham's mind, as a human might pet a loyal dog. More a brave wolf you are, Pham Nguyen. There were only seconds left before they were fully in the depths, where the merged bodies of countermeasure and Pham Nguyen would die forever, and all thought cease. Memories shifted. The ghost of Old One stepped aside, revealing certainties it had hidden all along. Yes, I built you from several bodies in the junkyard by relay. But there is only one mind and one set of memories that I could revive. A strong, brave wolf. So strong I could never control you without first casting you into doubt. Somewhere barriers slipped aside, the final failing of Old One's control. Or his final gift. It did not matter which now. For whatever the ghost said, the truth was obvious to Pham Nguyen, and he could not be denied. Canberra, Cindy, the centuries of voyaging with Cheng Ho, the final flight of the wild goose, it was all real. He looked up at Ravna, she had done so much, she had put up with so much, and even disbelieving, she had loved. It's okay, it's okay. He tried to reach out to her, to tell her, oh, Ravna, I am real. Then the full weight of the depths was upon him, and he knew no more. There was more pounding on the door. She heard Pilgrim watch, walk to the hatch. A crack of light shone in. Ravna heard Jeffrey's piping voice. The sun is back. The sun is back. Hey, why is it so dark in here? Pilgrim. The artifact. The thing Pham was helping. Its light went out. Geez, you mean you left off the main lights? The hatch slid all the way open, and the boy's head, along with several puppies, was silhouetted against the torchlight beyond. He scrambled over the lip of the hatch. The girl was right behind him. The control is right over here, see? And soft white light shone on the curving walls. All was ordinary and human, except... Jeffrey stood very still, his eyes wide, and his hand over his mouth. He turned to hold on to his sister. What is it? What is it? His voice said from the opened hatch. Now Ravna wished she could not see. She dropped back to her knees. Fam? She said softly, knowing there would be no answer. What was left of Fam Nguyen lay amid the countermeasure... The artifact didn't glow any more. Its torturous boundaries were blunted and dark. More than anything, it looked like rotted wood, but wood that embraced and impaled the man who lay with it. There was no blood and no charring. Where the artifact had pierced Pham, there was ashy stain, and the flesh and the thing seemed to merge. Pilgrim was close around her, his noses almost touching the still form. The bitter smell still hung in the air. It was the smell of death, but not the simple riding of flesh. What had died here was flesh, and something else. She glanced at her wrist. The display had simplified to a few alphanumeric lines. No ultra drives could be detected. OOB status showed problems with attitude control. They were deep in the slow zone, out of reach of all help, out of reach of the Blight's fleet. She looked into Pham's face. You did it, Pham. You really did it, 
she said the word softly to herself. The arches and loops of countermeasure were a fragile, brittle thing now. The body of Pham Nguyen was part of that. How could they break those arches without breaking? Pilgrim and Joanna gently urged Ravna out of the cargo hold. She didn't remember much of the next few minutes, of them bringing out the body. Blue Shell and Pham, both gone beyond all retrieval. They left her after a while. There was no lack of compassion, but disaster and strangeness and emergency were in too abundant a supply. There were the wounded. There was the possibility of counterattack. There was great confusion and a desperate need for order. It made scarcely any impression on her. She was at the end of her long, desperate run, at the end of all of her energy. Ravna must have sat by the ramp for much of the afternoon, so deep in loss as to not think, scarcely aware of the sea song that Greenstock shared with her through the data set. Eventually she realized she was not alone. Besides Greenstock's comfort, some time earlier, the little boy had returned. He sat beside her, and around them all the puppies, all silent. Epilogues Peace had come to what had once been Flenser's domain. At least there was no sign of belligerent forces. Whoever had pulled them back had done it very cleverly. As the days passed, local pe peasantry showed themselves. Where the people weren't simply dazed, they seemed glad to be rid of the old regime. Life picked up in the farmlands, peasants doing their best to recover from the worst fire season of recent memory, compounded by the most fighting the region had ever known. The queen had sent messengers south to report on the victory, but she seemed in no rush to return to her city. Her troops helped with some of the farm work, and did their best not to be a burden on the locals. But they also scouted through the castle on Starship Hill, and the huge old castle on Hidden Island. Down there were all the horrors that had been whispered about over the years. But still there was no sign of the forces that had escaped. The locals were eager with their own stories, and most were ominously credible. That before Flenser had undertaken his attempt upon the Republic, he had cat created redoubts further north. There had been reserves there, though some had thought that Steele had long since used them. Peasants from the northern valley had seen the Flenserist troops retreating. Some said they even seen Flenser himself, or at least a pack wearing the colors of a lord. Even the locals did not believe all the stories, the ones about Flenser being here and there, singletons separated by kilometers, coordinating the pullout. Ravna and the Queen had reason to believe the story, but not the foolhardiness to check it out. Woodcarver's expeditionary force was not a large one, and the forests and valleys stretched on for more than one hundred kilometers, to where the ice fangs curved west to meet the sea. That territory was unknown to Woodcarver. If Flenser had been preparing it for decades, as what as was that pack's normal method of operation, there would be deadly surprises, even for a large army hunting past er, hunting just a few dozens of partisans. Let Flenser be, and hope that his redoubts had been gutted by Lord Steele. Woodcarver worried that this would be the great peril of the next century. But things were resolved much sooner, much sooner than that. It was Flenser who sought them out, and not with the counterattack. About twenty days after the battle, at the end of a day when the sun dipped just behind the northern hills, there was a sound of signal horns. Ravna and Joanna were wakened, and shortly found themselves on the castle's parapet, peering into something like a sunset, all orange and gold silhouetting the hills beyond the northern fjord. Woodcarver's aides were gazing from many eyes at the ridge line. A few had telescopes. Ravna shared her bionics with Joanna. Someone's up there. Stark against the sky glow, a pack carried a long banner with separate poles for each member. Woodcarver was using two telescopes, probably more effective than Ravna's gear, considering the pack's eye separation. Yes, I see it. That's a truce flag, by the way, and I think I know who's carrying it. She yammered something at Peregrine. It's been a long time since I've talked to that one. Joanna was still looking through the binoculars. Finally, she said, he made steel, didn't he? Yes, dear. The girl lowered the binox. I think I'll pass up meeting him. Her voice was distant. They met on the hillside north of the castle just eight hours later. Woodcarver's troops had spent the intervening time scouting the valley. It was only partly a matter of protecting against treachery from the other side. One very special pack of the enemy would be coming, and there would be plenty of locals who would like that one dead. Woodcarver walked to where the hill fell off in super steepness towards forest. Ravna and Pilgrim followed behind her at a tinish, uh, tinishly close ten meters. 
Woodcarver wasn't saying much about this meeting, but Pilgrim had turned out to be a very talkative sort. This is just the way I came originally, a year ago when the first ship landed. You can see how some of the trees were burned by the torch. Good thing it wasn't as dry as it, uh, it wasn't as dry that summer as this. The forest was dense, but they were looking down over the treetops. Even in the dryness, there was a sweet, resinous smell in the air. To their left was a tiny waterfall and a path that led to the valley floor, the path their truth visitor had agreed to take. Farmland, Peregrine called the valley bottom. It was undisciplined chaos to Ravna's eyes. The tines grew dif different crops together in the same fields, and she saw no fences, not even to hold back livestock. Here and there, wooden lodges with steep roofs and outward curving walls, what you might expect in a region with snowy winters. Quite a mob down there, said Pilgrim. It didn't look crowded to her. Little clumps, each a pack, each well separated from the others. They clustered around the lodge buildings. More were scattered across the fields. Woodcarver packs were stationed along the little road they crossed the valley. She felt Pil Pilgrim tense next to her. A head extended past her waist, pointing. That must be him, all alone as promised, and part of him looking through a telescope. Now that's a surprise. A single pack trekked slowly down the road, past Woodcarver's guards. It was pulling a small cart, containing one of its own members, apparently. A cripple? The peasants in the fields drifted towards the edge of the field, paralleling the lone pack's course. She heard the gobble of tinish talk. When they wanted to be loud, they could be very, very loud. The troopers moved to chase back any local who got too close to the road. I thought they were grateful to us. This was the closest thing to violence she had seen since the Battle of Starship Hill. They are. Most of those are shouting death to Flenzer. Flenzer, Skinner, the pack who had rescued Jeffrey Olsen Dot. They can hate one pack so much? Love and hate and fear altogether. More than a century they've been under his knife, and now he is here, half crippled and without his troops. Yet they are still afraid. There are enough cotters down there to overwhelm our guard, but they're not pushing hard. This was Flenzer's domain, and he treated it like a good farmer might treat his yard. Worse, he treated the people in the land like it was some grand experiment. From reading Dataset, I see he is a monster ahead of his time. There are some out there who might still kill for the master, and no one is sure who they are. He paused a second, just watching. And you know the greatest reason for fear? That he would come here alone, so far from any help we can conceive. So, Ravna shifted Fam's pistol forward on her belt. It was bulky, blatant thing. And she was glad to have it. She glanced westward towards Hidden Island. OOB was safely grounded against the battlements of the castle there. Unless Greenstock could do some basic reprogramming, it would not fly again. And Greenstock was not optimistic, but she and Ravna had mounted the beam gun in one of its cargo bays, and that remote was dead simple. Flenzer might have his surprises, but so did Ravna. The five some disappeared beneath the steepness. It will be a while yet, said Pilgrim. One of his pups stood on his shoulders and leaned against Ravna's arm. She grinned, her private information feed. She picked it up and placed it on her shoulder. The rest of Peregrine sat at his rumps on the ground and watched expectantly. Ravna looked at the others of the Queen's party. Woodcarver had posted crossbow packs to her right and left. Flenzer would sit directly before her and a little downslope. Ravna thought she could see nervousness in Woodcarver. The members kept licking their lips, the narrow pink tongue slipping in and out with snake-like quickness. The Queen had arranged herself, if for a group portrait the taller members behind, and the two little ones sitting erect in front. Most of her gaze seemed focused on the break in the verge, where the path from below reached the terrace they sat upon. Finally she heard the scritching of claws on stone. One head appeared over the drop-off, and then more. Flenzer walked out onto the moss, two of his members pulling the wheeled cart. The one in the cart sat erect, its hindquarters covered by a blanket. Except for its white-tipped ears, it seemed unremarkable. The pack's heads peered in every direction. One stayed disconcertingly focused on Ravna as the pack proceeded up the slope toward the queen. Skinner, Flenzer, was the one that had worn the radio cloaks. None were worn now. Though, glass, though gaps in the jackets, or no, sorry, through gaps in the jackets, Ravna could see scabby plotches where the fur had been rubbed away. Mangy fellow, isn't he? Came the little voice in Ravna's ear. But cool, too. Catch his insolent look. 
The queen hadn't moved. She seemed frozen, every member staring at the oncoming pack. Some of her noses were trembling. Four of Flenzer tipped the cart forward, helping the white-tipped one slide to the ground. Now Ravna could see that under the blanket, its hindquarters were unnaturally twisted and still. The five settled themselves rumps together, their necks arched up and out, almost like the limbs of a sim single creature. The pack gobbled something that sounded to Ravna like strangling songbirds. Pilgrim's translation came immediately from the puppy on Ravna's shoulder. The pup spoke in a new voice, a traditional villain voice from children's stories, a dry and sardonic voice. Greetings, parent. It has been many years. Woodcarver said nothing for a moment, then she goggled, gobbled something back, and Pilgrim translated, You recognize me? One of Flenzer's heads jabbed out toward Woodcarver. Not the members, of course, but your soul is obvious. Again, silence from the queen. Peregrine, annotating. My poor woodcarver, I never thought she would be this flummoxed. Apparently she spoke loud, addressing Flenzer and Sam Norsk. Well, you are not so obvious to me, O oh former traveling companion. I remember you as Tyrathect, the timid teacher from the Long Lakes. Several of the heads turned towards Peregrine and Ravna. The creature replied in pretty good Sam Norsk, but with a childish voice. Greetings, Peregrine, and greetings, Ravna. Bergen's dot? Yes. Flenzer Tyrathect I am. The heads angled downwards, eyes blinking slowly. Sly bugger, Peregrine muttered. Is Amdi Jeffrey safe? The Flenser suddenly asked. What? said Ravna, not recognizing the name at first. Then, yes, they are fine. Good. Now all the heads turned back to the queen, and the creature continued in pack talk. Like a dutiful creation, I have come to make peace with my parent, dear woodcarver. Does he really talk like that? Ravna hissed at the puppy on her shoulder. Hey, would I exaggerate? Woodcarver gobbled back, and Pilgrim picked up the translation, now in Queen's human voice. Peace. I doubt it, Flenzer. More likely you want breathing space to build again, or try to, to try to kill us all again. I wish to build again, that is true, but I have changed. The timid teacher has made me a little... softer. Something you could never do, parent. What? Pilgrim managed to inject a tone of an injured surprise into the word. Woodcarver, have you never thought on it? You are the most brilliant pack to live in the part of the, this part of the world, perhaps the most brilliant of all time, and the packs you made, they are mostly brilliant too. But have you not wondered on the most successful of them? You created two brilliantly. You ignored inbreeding and things that I can't translate easily. And you got me, with all the quirks that have pained you so over the last century. Uh, I have thought on that mistake, and done better since. Yes, as with Vendacious. Oh, look at my queen's faces. He really hurt her there. Never mind, never mind. Vendacious very well may have been a uh, different sort of terror, of error. The point is, you made me. Before, I thought that, I thought that your greatest act of, de of genius. Now, I'm not so sure. I want to make amends, live in peace. One of the heads jabbed at Ravna, another at the OOB down by Hidden Island. And there are other things in the universe to point your genius at. I hear the arrogance of old. Why should I trust you now? I helped to save the children. I saved the ship. And you were always the world's greatest opportunist. Flenzer's flanking heads shifted back. That's kind of a dismissing shrug. You have the advantage, parent, but some of my power is left in the north. Make peace, or you will have more decades of maneuvering and war. Woodcarver's response was a piercing shriek, and that's a sign of irritation, in case you didn't guess. Impudence! I can kill you here and now, and have a century of certain peace. I've bet that you won't harm me. You gave me safe, safe patches, passage, separately and in the whole. And one of the strongest things in your soul is your hate for lies. The back members of Woodcarver's pack hunkered down, and the little ones on the front took several quick steps towards the Flenzer. It's been many days, or decades, since we last met, Flenzer. If you can change, might not I? For an instant, every one of Flenzer's members was frozen. Then part of him came slowly to its feet, and slowly, slowly edged towards Woodcarver. The crossbow packs on either side of the meeting ground raised their weapons, tracking him. Flenzer stopped six or seven meters from Woodcarver. His heads weaved from side to side, all attention on the queen. Finally, a wondering voice, almost abashed. Yes, you might. 
Woodcarver, after all the centuries, you've given up yourself? These new ones are... Not all mine. Quite right. For some reason, Pilgrim was chuckling in Ravna's ear. Oh well. The flenzer backed to its previous position. I still want peace. Woodcarver looked surprised. You sound changed, too. How many of you really are of Flenzer? A long pause. Two. Very well. Depending on the terms, there will be peace. Maps were brought out. Woodcarver demanded the location of Flenzer's main troops. She wanted them disarmed, with two or three of her packs assigned to each unit, reporting by the heliograph. Flenzer would give up the radio cloaks and submit to observation. Hidden Island and Starship Hill would be ceded to Woodcarver. The two sketched new borders and wrangled on the oversight the Queen would have, would have in his remaining lands. The sun reached its noon point in the southern sky. In the fields below, the peasants had long since given up their angry vigil. The only tensely watchful people left were the Queen's crossbow packs. Finally, Flenzer stepped back from his end of the maps. Yes, yes, your folk can watch all of my work. No more ghastly experiments. I will be a gentle gatherer of knowledge. Is this sarcasm? Like yourself. Woodcarver's heads bobbed in rippling synchrony. Perhaps so, with the two legs on my side, I'm willing to chance it. Flenzer rose again from his seated posture. He turned to help his crippled number back on the cart. Then he paused. Ah, one last thing, dear Woodcarver, a detail. I killed two of Steel when he tried to destroy Jeffrey's starship. Squashed them like bugs, actually. Now we know how Flenzer hurt himself. Do you have the rest of him? Yes. Ravna had seen what was left of Steel. She and Johanna had visited most of the wounded. It was possible to adapt OOB first aid for the Tynes. But in the case of Steel, there had been a bit of vengeful curiosity. That creature had been responsible for so much unnecessary death. What was left of Steel didn't really need medical attention. There were some bloody scratches, self-inflicted, Johanna guessed, and one twisted leg. But the, pa the pack was a pitiable, almost an unnerving thing. It had cowered at the back of its pen, all shivering in terror, heads shifting this way and that. Every so often the creature's jaws would snap open and shut, or, or one member would make an aborted run at the fence. A pack of three was not of human intelligence, but this one could talk. When it saw Ravna and Joanna, its eyes went wide, the whites showing all around, and it rattled barely intelligible Sam Norsk at them. The speech was a nightmare mix of threats and pleas that they, not cut, not cut. Poor Joanna started crying then. She had spent most of a year hating the pack these were from, yet. They seemed to be victims too. It's bad to be three, and no one will ever let them be more. Well, continued Flenzer, I would like custody of what remains. I, never. That one was almost as smart as you, even if crazy enough to defeat. You're not going to build him back. Flenzer came together, all eyes staring at the queen. His voice was soft. Please, Woodcarver, this is a small matter, but I will throw over everything, he jabbed at the maps, rather than be denied in it. Oh, oh. The crossbow packs were suddenly at the ready. Woodcarver came partly around the maps, close enough to Flenzer that the mine noise must collide. She brought all her heads together in a concerted glare. If it is so unimportant, why risk everything for it? Flenzer bumped around for an instant, his members actually staring at one another. It was a gesture Ravda had not seen till now. That is my affair. I mean, Steel was my greatest creation. In a way, I am proud of him, but I am also responsible for him. Don't you feel the same about Vendacious? I've got my plans for Vendacious. The response was grudging. In fact, Vendacious is still whole. I fear the Queen made too many promises to do much with him now. I want to make up to steal the harm I made him. You understand. I understand. I've seen steel and I understand your methods. The knives, the fear, the pain. You're not going to get another chance at it. It sounded to Ravna like faint music, something from far beyond the valley, an alien blending of chords. But it was Flenzer answering back. Pilgrim's translating voice held no hint of sarcasm. No knives, no cutting. I keep my name, because it is for others to rename me when they finally accept that. In their way, Tyrethect won. Give me this chance, Woodcarver. I'm begging. The two packs stared at each other for more than ten seconds. Ravna looked from one to the other, trying to divine their expressions. No one said anything. There was not even Pilgrim's voice in her ear to speculate on what this 
whether this was a lie or the bearing of a new soul. It was Woodcarver who decided, very well, you may have him. Peregrine Rickrack Scar was flying, a pilgrim with legends that went back almost a thousand years, and not one of them could come near to this. He would have burst into song except that it would pain his passengers. They were already unhappy enough with his rough piloting, even though they thought it was simply his inexperience. Peregrine stepped across clouds, flew among and through them, danced with an occasional thunderstorm. How many hours of his life had he stared up at the clouds, gauging at their depths, and now he was in them, exploring the caves within caves within caves, the cathedrals of light. Between scattered clouds, the great western ocean stretched forever. By the sun and the flyer's instruments, he knew they had re nearly reached the equator, and were already some 8,000 kilometers southwest of Woodcarver's domain. There were islands out here. The OOB's pictures from space said so, and so did the pilgrim's own memories. But it had been long since he ventured here, and he had not expected to see the island kingdoms in the lifetime of his current members. Now suddenly he was going back, flying back. The OOB's landing boat was a wonderful thing, and not nearly as strange as it had seemed in the midst of battle. True, they had not yet figured out how to program it for automatic flight. Perhaps they never would. In the meantime, this little flyer worked with electronics that were barely more than glorified moving parts. The agrav itself required the constant adjustment, and the controls were scattered across the bow periphery, con uh, conveniently placed for the fronds of a scrod rider, or for the members of a pack. With the spacer's help in OOB's documentation, it had taken the pilgrim only a few days to get the hang of the flying the thing. It was all a matter of spreading one's mind across all the various tasks. The learning had been happy hours, a little bit scary, floating nearly out of control, once in a screwball configuration that accelerated endlessly upward. But in the end, the machine was like an extension of jaws and paws. Since they descended from the purpling heights and began playing in the cloud tops, Revna had been looking more and more uncomfortable. After a particularly stomach's lurching bump and drop, she said, Will you be able to land okay? Maybe we should have postponed this till, uh, you can fly better. Oh yes, oh yes, we'll be past this, um, weather front real soon. He dived beneath the clouds and swerved a few tens of kilometers eastwards. The weather was clear here, and it was actually more on the line with their destination. Secretly chastened, he resolved to do no, no more joy riding, on the inbound leg, anyway. His second passenger spoke up then, only the second time in the two-hour flight. I liked it, said Greenstock. Her voter voice charmed Pilgrim, mostly narrow band, but with little frets high up from the square waves. It was it was like riding just beneath the surf, feeling your fronds moving with the sea. Peregrine had tried hard to know the Scrove Rider. The creature was the only non human alien in the world, and harder to know than the two legs. See she, she seemed to dream most of the time, and forgot all but the things that happened again and again to her. It was her primitive scrode that accounted for part of that, Ravna told him. Remembering the run that Greenstock's mate had made through the flames, Pilgrim believed. Out among the stars, there were things even stranger than two legs. It made Pilgrim's imagination ache. Near the horizon he saw a dark ring, and another, beyond. We'll have you in real surf very soon. Ravna, these are the islands? Peregrine looked over the map displays as he took a shot at, on the sun. Yes, indeed though it didn't really matter. The western ocean was over 12,000 kilometers across, and all, all through the tropics it was dotted with atolls and island chains. This group was just a bit more isolated than others. The nearest islander settlement was almost 2,000 kilometers away. They were over the nearest island. The pilgrim took a swing around it, admiring the tropic ferns that clung to the coral. At this tide, their bony roots were exposed. Not any flat land here at all. He flew on to the next, a larger one with a pretty glade just within the ring wall. He floated the boat down in a smooth glide that touched the ground without even the tiniest bump. Ravna Bergensdott looked at him with something like suspicion. Oh, oh, hey, I'm getting better, don't you think? He said weakly. An uninhabited little island, surrounded by endless sea. The original memories were blurred now. It had been his rum member who had been the native of the, of the island kingdoms. Yet he remembered all fit. He, yet what he remembered all fit. The high sun, the intoxicating humidity of the air, the heat soaking through his paws. Paradise. The rum aspect still lived within him, was most joyous of all. The years seemed to melt away. Part of him had come home. 
They helped Greenstock down to the ground. Ravna said her scrode was an inferior imitation. Its new wheels was an ad hoc addition. Still, Pilgrim was impressed. The four balloon tires each had a separate axle. The rider was able to make it almost to the crest of the coral without any help from Ravna or himself. But near the top, where the tropic ferns were thickest and their roots grew across every path, there he and Ravna had to help a bit, lifting and pulling. Then they were on the other side, and they could see the ocean. Now part of Pilgrim ran ahead, partly to find the easiest descent, partly to get close to the water and smell the salt and the rotting floatweed. The tide was nearly out now, and a million little pools, some no more than stony-walled puddles, lay exposed to the sun. Three of them ran from pool to pool, eyeing the creatures that lay within. The strangest things in the world they had seen to him when he first came to the islands. Creatures with shells, slugs of all dimensions and colors, animal plants that would become tropic ferns if they ever got trapped far enough inland. Where would you like to sit? he asked the scrode rider. If we go all the way out to the surf right now, you'll be a meter underwater, at high tide. The rider didn't reply, but all her fronds were angled toward the water now. The wheels on her scrode sl slipped and spun with a strange lack of coordination. Let's take her closer, Ravna said after a moment. They reached a fairly level stretch of coral, pocked with holes and gullies not more than a few centimeters deep. I'll go for a swim. Find a good place, Peregrine said. All of him ran down to where the coral broke the water. Going for a swim was not something you did by parts. <laughs> Fact was, damn few mainland packs could swim and think at the same time. Most mainlanders thought there was a craziness in the water. Now Peregrine knew it was simply the great difference in sound between in sound speed between air and water. Thinking with all the timpana immersed must be a little like using the radio cloaks. It took discipline and practice to do it, and some were never able to learn. But the island folk had always been great swimmers, using it for meditation. Ravna even thought the packs might be descended from whales. Peregrine came to the edge of the coral and looked down. Suddenly the surf did not seem a completely friendly thing. He would soon find out if Rum's spirit and his own memories of swimming were up to the real thing. He pulled off his jackets. All at once. It's best done all at once. He gathered himself and plopped awkwardly into the water. Confusion. Heads out and in. Keep all under. He paddled about, holding all his heads down. Every few seconds, he'd poke a single nose into the air and refresh that member. I can still do it. The six of him slipped through swarms of squidlets, dived separately through arching green fronds. The hiss of the sea was all around, like the mind sound of a vast sleeping pack. After a few minutes, he'd found a nice level spot, sand all about, and shielded from the worst fury of the sea. He paddled back to where the sea crashed against stony coral, and almost broke some legs scrambling out. It was just impossible to exit all at once, and for a few moments it was every member for itself. Hey, over here, he shouted to Greenstock and Ravna. He sat licking at coral cuts as they crossed the right white rock. Found a place, more peaceful than this. He waved at the crash and spray. Greenstock rolled a little closer to the edge, then hesitated. Her fronds turned back and forth along the curving sweep of the shore. Does she need help? Pilgrim started forward, but Ravna just sat down beside the rider and leaned against the wheeled platform. After a moment, Pilgrim joined them. They sat for a time, human looking out to the sea, rider looking he wasn't quite sure where, and the pack looking in most all directions. There was peace here, even with, or because of, the booming surf and the haze of spray. He felt his heart slowing, and just lazed in the sunlight. On every pelt, the drying seawater was leaving a glittery powder of salt. Grooming himself tasted good at first, but, yech, too much dry salt was one of the bad memories. Greenstock's frond settled lightly across him, too fine and narrow to provide much shade, but a light and gentle comfort. They sat for a long while, long enough so that later some of the pilgrims' noses were blistered, and even dark-skinned Ravna was sunburned. The writer was humming now, a sort of song that, after long minutes, came to be speech. It is a good sea, a good edge. It is what I need now, to sit and think at my own pace for a while. And Ravna said, How long? We will miss you. This was not just politeness. Everyone would miss her. Even in her mind adrift, Greenstock was the expert on OOB's surviving automation. Long by your measure, I fear. A few decades. She walked... Or she watched the waves a few minutes more. I'm eager to get down there. Ha <laughs> ha. Almost like a human in that. Ravna, 
You know my memories are muddled now. I had two hundred years with Blue Shell. Sometimes he was petty and a little spineful, but he was a great traitor. We had many wonderful times, and at the end, even you could see his courage. Ravna nodded. We found a terrible secret on this last journey. I think that hurt him as much as the final burning. I am grateful to you for protecting us. Now I want to think, to let the surf and the, uh, the time work with my memories and sort them out. Maybe if this poor imitation scrote is up to it, I'll even make a chronicle of our quest. She touched Peregrine on two of his heads. One thing, Sir Pilgrim, you trust much to give me freedom of your seas, but you should know, Blue Shell and I were pregnant. I have a mist of our common eggs within me. Leave me here, and there will be new riders by this island in few years, in a future years. Please do not take that as betrayal. I want to remember Blue Shell with children, but modestly. Our, our kind has shared ten million worlds, and never been bad neighbors, except in a way that, Ravna can tell you, cannot happen here. In the end, Greenstock was not at all interested in the protected uh, stretch of water that Peregrine had discovered. She wanted, of all the places here, the one where the ocean crashed most ferociously. It took them more than an hour to find the path down to that violent place, and another half hour to get the rider and scrode safely into the water. Peregrine didn't even try to swim here. The coral rock came in close from all sides, slimy green in patches, razor jagged in others. Five minutes in, that meat grinder, five minutes in that meat grinder, and he might be too weak to get out. Strange that there was so much green in the water here. It was all but opaque with sea grasses and swarms of foam midges. Ravna was a little better off. At the water's greatest height, she could still keep feet to ground, at least most of the time. She stood in the foam, bracing herself with feet and an arm, and hoped the scrodling over the lip of rock. Once in, the mechanical crashed firmly to the bottom beside the human. Ravna looked up at Pilgrim, made an okay gesture. Then she huddled down for a moment, holding to the scrode to keep her place. The surf crashed over the two, obscuring all but Greenstock's tallest standing fronds. When the foam, foam moved back, he could see that the lower fronds draped across the human's back, and hear a voter buzzing that wasn't quite intelligible against all the other noise. The human stood and slogged through the waist-deep water through the rocks Peregrine occupied. Peregrine grabbed onto himself, reached it down to give Gravna some, Ravna some paws. She scrambled up the slime green and coral white. He followed the limping two legs toward the crest of tropical ferns. They stopped under the shade, and she sat down, leaned back onto the mat of a fern trunk. Cut and bruised, she looked almost as hurt as Joanna ever had. You okay? Yeah, she ran her hands back through disheveled hair. Then she looked at him and laughed. We both look like casualties. Um, yes. Sometime soon he needed a fresh water bath. He looked around and out. From the crest of the atoll uh, ring, they knew they had, or, or they had a view of Greenstock's niche. Ravna was looking down there, too, minor injuries forgotten. How can she like that spot? Peregrine said wonderingly. Imagine being smashed and smashed and smashed. There was a smile on Ravna's face, but she kept her two eyes on the surf. There are strange things in the universe, Pilgrim. I'm glad there are some that you have not read about yet. Where the surf meets the shore, lots of neat things can happen there. You saw all the life that floated in that madness. Just as plants love the sun, there are creatures that can use energy differences down at that edge. There they have the sun and the surge and the richness of the suspension. Still, we shouldn't keep watch. A, we should keep watch a while longer. Between each insurge of the waves, they could see, still see Greenstock's fronds. He already knew that those limbs weren't strong, but he was beginning to realize that they must be very tough. She'll be okay, though that cheap scrode may not last long. Poor Greenstock may end up without any automation at all. She and her children, the lowest of all riders. Ravna turned to look at the pack. There was still that smile on her face, wondering, yet pleased. You know the secret Greenstock spoke of? Woodcarver told me that what you told her. I'm glad, surprised she was willing to let Greenstock come here. Medieval minds, sorry, most any minds, would want to kill before even taking the faintest risk with something like this. Then why did you tell the Queen? It's your world. I was tired of playing God with the secret, and Greenstock agreed. Even if the queen had refused, Greenstock could have used a cold box on the OOB, and likely slept forever. But Woodcarver didn't refuse. Somehow she understood what I was saying. It's the true scrodes that can be perverted. But Greenstock no longer has one of those. In a decade, this island's shore will be populated with hundreds of young riders. 
but they should they would never colonize beyond this archipelago without permission of the locals. The risk is vanishingly small, but I was still surpri surprised Woodcarver took it. Peregrine settled down around Ravna, only one pair of eyes still watching the rider's fronds down in the foam. Best to give some explanation. He cocked a head at Ravna. Oh, we are medieval Ravna, even if changing fast now. We admired Blueshell's courage in the fire. Such deserves reward, and medieval types are used to courting treachery. So what if the risk is of cosmic size? To us, here, it is no more deadly for that. We poor primitives live with such all the time. Ha! Her smile spread at his flippant tone. Peregrine chuckled, heads bobbing. His explanation was the truth, but not all the truth, or even the most important part. He remembered back to the day before, when he and Woodcarver had decided what to do with Greenstock's request. Woodcarver had been afraid at first, statecraftly cautious before an evil secret billions of years old. Even leaving su uh, such a being in cold sleep was a risk. The statecraftly, the medieval, thing to do would be to grant the request, leave the rider ashore on this distant island, and then sneak back a day or two later and kill it. Peregrine had settled down by his queen, closer than any but mates and rev uh, relations could ever do without losing their train of thought. You showed more honor to Vendatius, he had said. Scriber's murderers still walked the earth, complete, scarcely punished at all. Woodcarver snapped at empty air. Peregrine, Peregrine knew that sparing Vendatius hurt her too. Yes, and these scrode riders have showed us nothing but courage and honesty. I will not harm Greenstock. Yet I am afraid. With her, there is a risk that goes beyond the stars. Peregrine laughed. It might be pilgrim madness, but... And that's to be expected, my queen. Great risks for great gains. I like being around the humans. I like touching another creature and still being able to think at the same time. He darted forward to nuzzle the nearest of Woodcarver, and then retreated to a more rational distance. Even without their starship and their data sets, they would make our world over. Have you noticed how easy it is for us to learn what they know? Even now, Ravna can't seem to accept our fluency. Even now, she doesn't understand how thoroughly we have studied data set. And their ship is easy, my queen. I don't mean I understand the physics behind it. Few even among starfolk do. But the equipment is easy to learn, even with the failures it has suffered. I suspect Ravna will never be able to fly the Agrav boat as well as I. Hmm. But you can reach all the controls at once. That's only part of it. I think we Tynes are more flexibly minded than the poor two legs. Can you imagine what it will be like when we have more radio cloaks? When we can make our own flying machines? Woodcarver smiled, a little sadly now. Pilgrim, you dream. This is the slow zone. The Agrav will wear out in a few years. Whatever we make will be far short of what you play with now. So, look at human history. It took less than two centuries for Neorgia to regain spaceflight after their Dark Age, and we have better records than their archaeologists. We and the humans are a wonderful team. They have freed us to be everything we can be. A century till their own spaceships, perhaps another century to start building sub-lightspeed starships. And someday they would get out of the slow zone. I wonder if packs can be bigger than eight up in the transcend. The younger parts of Woodcarver were up, pacing around the rest. The queen was intrigued. So you think, like Steel seemed to, that we are some kind of special race, something with ha a happy destiny in the beyond? Interesting, except for one thing. These humans are all we know from out there. How do they compare with the other races there? Dataset can't fully answer that. Ah, and there, Woodcarver, is why Greenstock is so important. We do need experience of more than one other race. Apparently, the writers are among the most common throughout the beyond. We need them to talk to. We need to discover if they are as much fun, as useful as the two legs. Even if the risk was ten times what it seems, I would still want to grant this writer her wish. Yes, if we are to be all we can be, we need to know more. We need to take a few risks. She stopped her pacing, all her eyes turned toward, per toward Peregrine in a gesture of surprise. Abruptly, she laughed. What? Something we've thought before, dear Peregrine, but now I see how true it may be. You've been, you're being a little bit clever in scheming here, a good statesman and planner for the future. But still for a pilgrimy goal. To be sure. And I, now I don't care so completely about the planning and the safety. We will visit the stars some day. Her puppies waggled a joyous salute. I've a little of a pilgrim of me now, too. She went down on all her bellies and crept across the floor toward him. Consciousness slowly dissolved into a, a haze of loving lust. The last thing Peregrine remembered her saying was, 
How wonderful the luck that I had grown old and had to be new, and that you were just the change we need. Peregrine's attention drifted back to the present and Ravna. The human was still grinning at him. She reached a hand across to brush one of his heads. Medieval minds indeed. They sat in the fern shade for another couple of hours and watched the tide come in. The sun fell through mid-afternoon. Even then it was as high in the sky as any noontime sun would be at woodcarvers. In some ways, the quality of the light and the motion of the sun were the strangest things about the scene. The sun was so high, and came down so straight, with none of the long sliding glide of afternoon in the Arctic. He had almost forgotten what it was like in the land of short twilight. Now the surf was thirty yards inland of where they had put the rider. The crescent moon was, flowing, was following the sun toward the horizon. The water wouldn't rise any further. Ravna stood, shaded her eyes against the lowering sun. Time for us to go, I think. You think she'll be safe? Ravna nodded. This was long enough for Greenstock to notice any poisons, and most predators. Besides, she's armed. Human and Tynes picked their way uh, to the crest of the atoll, past the tallest of the ferns. Peregrine kept a pair of eyes on the sea behind them. The surf was well past Greenstock now. Her location was still swept by deep waves, but it was beyond the spoon and spray. Her last sight, uh, his last sight of her was in the trough behind a crasher. The smoothness of the sea was broken for an instant by two of her tallest fronds, the tips gently swaying. Summer took gentle leave of the land around Hidden Island. There was some rain, and no more brush fires. There would even be a harvest, war and drought notwithstanding. Each day around the sun hid deeper uh, behind the northern hills, a time of twilight that broadened with the weeks till true night held at midnight. And there were stars. It was something of an accident that so many things came together on the last night of summer. Ravna took the kids out sky-gazing on the fields by Starship Castle. No urban haze here, nor even near-space industry. Nothing to fog the view of heaven, except a subtle pinkness in the north that might have been a vagrant twilight or aurora. The four of them settled on the frosty moss and looked around. Ravna took a deep breath. There was no hint of ash left in the air, just a clean chill, a promise of winter. The snow will be as deep as your shoulders, Ravna, said Geoffrey, enthusiastic about the possibility. You'll love it. The pale blotch that was his face seemed to be looking back and forth across the sky. It can be bad, said Joanna Olson Dot. She hadn't objected to coming up here tonight, but Ravna knew she would rather have stayed down on Hidden Island to worry about the doings of tomorrow. Geoffrey picked up on her unease. No, that was Andy talking now. They would never cure these two of pretending to be each other. Don't worry, Joanna. We'll help you. For a moment, no one said anything. Ravna looked down the hill. It was too dark to see the 600-meter drop, too dark to see where the fjord and islands lay down below. But the torchlight on the ramparts of Hidden Island marked its location. Down there in Steele's old inner court, where Woodcarver now ruled, were all the, sub sur ugh, were all the working cold boxes from the ship. 151 children slept there, the last survivors of the Stromer's flight. Joanna claimed that most could be revived, with the best chance of success if it were done soon. The Queen had been enthusiastic about the idea. Large sections of the castle had been set aside, refurbished for human needs. Hidden Island was well sheltered, if not from winter snow, at least from the worst winds. If they could be revived, the children would have no trouble living there. Ravna had come to love Geoffrey and Joanna and M.D. But could she handle 150 more? Woodcarver seemed to have no misgivings. She had plans for a school where Tynes would learn of humans and the children would learn of this world. Watching Geoffrey and M.D., uh, Ravna was beginning to see what might become of this. Those two were closer than any children she had ever known, and in some, more competent. And that was not just the puppy's math genius. They were competent in other ways. Humans in packs fit, and old woodcarver was clever enough to take advantage of it. Ravna liked the queen, and liked Pilgrim even more, but in the end, the packs would be the great beneficiaries. Woodcarver clearly understood the disabilities of her pack race. Tynish records went back at least 10,000 years. For all their recorded history, they had been trapped in cultures not much less advanced than now. A race of sharp intelligence, yet they had a single overwhelming disadvantage. They could not cooperate at close range without losing that intelligence. 
Their civilizations were made of isolated minds, forced introverts who could never progress beyond certain limits. The eagerness of Pilgrim and Scrupillo and the others for human contact was evidence of this. In the long run, we can move the Tynes out of this cul-de-sac. Amdi and Geoffrey were giggling about something, the pack sending runners out almost to the limits of consciousness. These last weeks, Ravna had come to learn that uh, pell-mell activity was the norm for Amdi, that his initial slowness had been part of his hurt over steel. How perverse, or how wonderful, that a monster like steel could be the object of such love. Geoffrey shouted, You watch in all directions. Let me know where to look. Silence. Then Geoffrey's voice again. There. What are you doing? Joanna asked with sisterly belligerence. Watching for meteors, one of the two said. Yes, I watch in all directions and jab Geoffrey. There. Where to look when one comes by. Ravna didn't see anything, but the boy had twisted around abruptly at his friend's signal. Neat, neat, came Geoffrey's voice. That was about forty kilometers up. Speed. The two's voice murmured unintelligibly for a second. Even with the pack's wide vision, how could they know how high it was? Ravna sat back in the hollow formed by the hummocky grout moss. It was a good parka the locals had made for her. She barely felt the chill in the ground. Overhead, the stars. Time to think. Get some peace before all things that would begin tomorrow. Then mother to 150 kids. And I thought I was a librarian. Back home, she had loved the night sky. At one glance, she could see the other stars of Chandra Kai, sometimes the other worlds. The places of her home had been in her sky. For a moment, the evening chill seemed uh, part of a winter that would never go away. Lynn and her folks at Sandra Kai. Her whole life till three years ago. It was all gone now. Don't think on it. Somewhere out there was what was left of the Anyara fleet and what was left of her people. Kjet Svensdat, Tyrol, and Glimfrel. She had only known them for a few hours, but they were of Sandra Kai, and they had saved more than they would ever know. They would still live. SJK Commercial Security had some ram scoops in its fleet. They could find a world, not here, but nearer the battle site. Ravna tilted her head back, wondering at the sky. Where? Maybe not even above the horizon now. From here the galactic disk was a glow that climbed across the sky almost at right angles to the ecliptic. There was no sense of its true shape, or their exact position in it. The greater picture was lost to nearby splendors, the bright knots of open clusters, frozen jewels against the fainter light. But down near the southern horizon, far from the galactic way, there were two splotchy clouds of light. The Magellanics! Suddenly the geometry clicked, and the universe above was not completely unknown. A Niara fleet would be. Uh, I wonder if we can see Stromley Realm from here, said Joanna. For more than a year now, she had to had to play the adult. Come tomorrow, that role would be forever. But her voice was just now wistful, childlike. Ravna opened her mouth, about to say how unlikely that must be. Maybe we can. Maybe we can. It was Amdi. The pack had pulled itself together, snuggled compassionably among the humans. The warmth was welcome. See, I've been reading data set about where things are, and trying to figure out how it matches what we see. A pair of noses were silhouetted against the sky for an instant like a human waving his hands exuberantly at the heavens. The brightest things we see are just kind of local dazzle. They aren't good guideposts. He pointed at a couple of open clusters, claimed they matched stuff he'd found in the data set. Amdi had also noticed the uh, Magellanic galaxies, and figured out far more than Ravna. So anyway, Stromley well was... was, you got it, kid. In the high beyond, but near the galactic disk... So see that big square of, sco of stars? Nose is jabbed. We call that the Great Square. Anyway, just left of the upper corner you go 6,000 light years, and you'd be at Stromley Realm. Geoffrey came to his knees and stared silently for a second. But so far away, is there anything to see? Not the Stromley stars, but just 40 light years from Strom, there's a blue-white giant. Yeah, whispered Joanna. Storeless. It's so bright you can see the shadows at night. Well, that's the fourth brightest star up from the corner, see? They almost make a straight line. I can see it now, so I know you can. Joanna and Geoffrey were silent for a long time, just staring up at that patch of sky. Ravna's lips compressed in anger. These were good kids. They had been through hell, and their parents had fought to prevent that hell. They had escaped the blight with the means of its destruction. But how many million races had lived in the beyond? 
had probed the transcend and made bargains with devils. How many more had destroyed themselves there? Ah, but that had not been enough for Stromly Realm. They had gone to the transcend and wakened something that could take over a galaxy. Do you think anybody's left there? said Geoffrey. Do you think we're all that's left? His sister put an arm around him. Maybe, maybe not Stromly Realm, but the rest of the universe. Look, it's still there. Weak laughter. Daddy and Mom, Ravna and Fan. They stopped the blight. She waved a hand against the sky. They saved most all of it. Yes, said Ravna. We're saved and safe, Geoffrey, to begin again. And as far as it went, that comfort was probably true. The ship's zone probes were still working. Of course, a single measure point of a, is of no use for pre precise zonography. But they could still tell that they were deep in the new volume of the slowness, the volume created by Fam's revenge. And, much more significant, the OOB detected no variation in zonal intensity. Gone was the continuous trembling of the months before. This new status had the feeling of mountain roots, to be moved only by the passage of the ages. Fifty, de ugh, fifty degrees along the galactic river was another unremarkable space of sky. She didn't point it out to the kids, but what was of interest there was much nearer, just under thirty light years out, the blighter fleet. Flies trapped in amber. At normal jump rates for the low beyond, they had been just hours away when Fam created the Great Surge. And now, if they had been bottom luggers, ships with ram scoops, they could close the gap in less than fifty years. But Aniara fleet had made their sacrifice. They had followed Fam's god-shattered advice, and though they didn't know it, they had broken the blight. There wasn't a single slow zone capable vessel in the approaching fleet. Perhaps they had some in-system capability, a few thousand clicks per second, but no more. Not down here, where new construction was not a matter of waving a magic wand. The Blight's extermination force would sweep past Tyne's world in uh, a few thousand years. Time enough. Ravna leaned back against one of Amdi's shoulders. He nestled comfortably around her neck. The puppies had grown these last two months. Apparently Steel had kept them on some sort of stunting drugs. Her gaze lost itself in the darkened glow. Far upon far that were all the zones above her. And where are the boundaries now? How awesome was Fam's revenge? Maybe she should call it Old One's revenge. No, it was far more even than that. Old One was just a recent victim of the Blight. Even Old One was no more than midwife to this revenge. The first cause must be as old as the original Blight, and more powerful than the powers. But whatever caused it, the Surge had done more than revenge. Ravna had studied the ship's measurement of zone intensity. It could only be an estimate, but she knew they were trapped between 1,000 and 30,000 light-years deep in the new slowness. Powers only knew how far the Surge had pushed the slowness, and maybe even some of the powers were destroyed by it. This was like some vision of planetary Armageddon, the type of thing that primitive civilizations nightmared about, but blown up to a galactic scale. A huge hunk of the Milky Way galaxy had been gobbled up by the slowness, all in a single afternoon. Not just the blighter fleet were flies trapped in amber. Why, the whole vault of heaven, excepting the Magellanics faint and far away, might now be a tomb of slowness. Many must still be alive out there, but how many millions of starships have been trapped between the stars? How many automated systems had failed, killing the civilizations that depended on them? Heaven was truly silent now. In some ways the revenge was a worse thing than the blight itself. And what of the blight? Not the fleet that chased the OOB, but the blight itself. That was a creature of the top and transcend. At a very far remove, it covered much of the sky that they could see this night. Could Fam's revenge really have toppled it? If there was a point to all the sacrifice, then sur surely so. A surge, <laughs> a surge so great that it pushed the slowness up thousands of light years, through the low and mid beyond, past the great civilizations at the top and into the transcend. No wonder it was so eager to stop us. A power immersed in the slowness would be a power no more would likely be a living thing no more, if, 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 if Fam Surge could climb so high. And that is something I will never know. Crypto, zero, as received by Language Path, Optima, from Society for Rational Investigation, Subject, Ping, Key Phrases, Help Me, Summary, Has There Been a Network Partition, or What? Distribution, Threat of the Blight, Society for Rational Network Management, War Tracker's Interest Group. Date, 0 0.412 MSEC since loss of contacts. Text message, I have still not recovered contact with any network site known to be spinward of me.
Apparently, I am right at the edge of a catastrophe. If you receive this ping, please respond. Am I in danger? For your information, I have no trouble reaching sites that are anti-spinward. I understand an effort is being made to hop messages the long way around the galaxy. At least that would give us an idea of how big the loss is. Nothing has come back as of yet. Not surprising, I guess, considering the great number of hops and the expense. In the meantime, I am sending out pings such as this. I am expending enormous resources to do this, let me tell you. But it is that important. I have beamed, beamed direct at all the hub sites that are in range of the spin word of me. No replies. More ominous. I have tried to transmit over the top, that is, by using the known sites in the transcend that are above the catastrophe. Most such would not normally respond, powers being what they are, but I received no replies. A silence like the depths is here. It appears that a portion of the transcend itself has been engulfed. Again, if you receive this message, please respond. The end. All right, now that I'm done reading the book, I think we can get into this wad now, guys. Let's check it out. Uh, and consider Fleabass by... Uh, all right. Well, uh, shit, let me go ahead and find that book.